He went to the back wall and thumped it, as if it might be thin enough to break through. Yet he knew that the partisans would have the inn surrounded. He swore. Are you going to die naked? Her voice was bitter. How the hell did that bastard find me? Sharp cursed himself. He should have known. He should have guessed that by breaking into the convent he would stir the whole countryside against him. And instead he'd been so eager to share this bed that he'd not given the danger a single thought. He dressed swiftly, dressing as if for battle. Yet he knew that it was over. This mad escapade in the hills would end in blood on a muddy street with his death. He should have been hanged these four weeks ago, and instead he would die now. At least he thought it would be with a sword in his hand. I'll go and talk to them. For Christ's sake, why? To get a promise for your safety. She shook her head. You are a fool. You really believe there's decency in the world, don't you? I can try. He pulled up the trapdoor. The room beneath was empty. He turned to look at her one more time and thought how splendid she was. How lovely, even in anger. You want my rifle? To shoot myself? Yes. The Holy Grail isn't that bloody precious. She looked at his face and shook her head. I'm sorry, Richard. I keep forgetting that you think it is. What are you going to do? Fight them, of course. She laughed, though there was fear in the laugh. God help you in peacetime. Richard? He fingered the sword hilt and hesitated. He knew he should not say it. But in ten minutes he would be dead, butchered by the slaughter man or his men. He would take some of them with him. He would give them cause to remember fighting against a lone rifleman. Helene? She looked at him with exasperation. Don't say it, Richard. I love you. I knew you'd say it. She was putting the diamond earrings into her lobes. But then you are a fool. She smiled sadly. Go and fight for me, fool. He went down the ladder, drew the great sword, and opened the door to the street, where his enemies had gathered for his death. Chapter 14 Angel had woken before dawn. He had slept in the stable, wrapped by warm straw and his thick cloak. He had shivered as he yawned, wriggled from his bed, and went into the yard. He splashed water on his face and looked up at the dark roof, beneath which Sharp slept with the golden woman. Angel had polished the saddles the night before. He'd brushed the horses and made everything ready for this morning. Not just ready, but gleamingly ready. He had done it for a woman more beautiful than his dreams had dared imagine. And now, in yet more homage to her, he saddled Carbine and folded a blanket over the saddle in an effort to give La Marquesa a more comfortable seat. He knew she was French and he hated the French, but no woman so lovely as she could be evil in Angel's worshipping eyes. He tried out his makeshift attempt at her comfort, riding out of the inn-yard and turning Carbine towards the south. The wind was at his back, bringing a chill to his thin body. The shapes of the townspeople were dark, where they moved in alleys and courtyards. He put a hand on the butt of his rifle that he'd pushed into the saddle's holster. The eastern mountains were edged with light. Angel put his heels back, letting Carbine go into a trot. He reveled in the feel of the big black horse that lifted its hooves high and tossed its mane with impatience. Angel straightened his back, Imagining that he was El Achangel, the most feared partisan in Spain, riding to battle. A woman of great beauty, with golden hair and grey eyes, waited for his return, though she did not believe that any man would return from so suicidal a mission. He pulled the rifle from its holster, then twitched the reins to take Carbine down to the stream, where the women of the town washed their clothes. He would let the horse drink there, and let his daydream run on to the delicious moment when he returned from battle, not too severely wounded. And the golden-haired woman would run from the house, her arms wide. Then Angel saw the horsemen over the stream. He was in the darkness beneath chestnut trees. He checked Carbine and saw the grey shapes in the grey light, and he thumbed back the cock of the rifle, thinking that he should fire a warning shot for Sharp then thought that the sound of the rifle would bring the men galloping over the stream for his blood. 
He pulled the reins, knowing he must ride back to the town and warn Sharp. But as Carbine moved, so the men over the shallow stream saw the movement. One shouted, and Angel saw the water splash white as they drove their horses towards him. They were ahead of him, cutting him off from the town, and the boy, now no longer the feared Archangel, but merely Angel riding for his life, let the black horse have its head. Carbine easily outstripped El Matarife's men, carrying Angel south in the valley, away from the town. Angel discarded the folded blanket, pulled the reins left, and hid himself among pines that grew on a small knoll. He watched from their cover, wondering what he could do to help. And then he saw more horsemen coming from the south, and he knew there was nothing he could do except to wait, watch, and hope. He remembered Major Hogan's urgent warning that his job was to protect Sharp, and he felt failure with all the passion of his sixteen years. He patted Carbine's neck, sheathed the unfired rifle, and shivered. A murmur greeted Sharp, a murmur that rose to a chorus of hate. The horses in their semicircle about the inn's façade came forward, and El Matarife raised his hand and bellowed for silence and stillness. El Matarife looked down on Sharp. Well, Major Vaughan, what happens to the woman? The partisan laughed. There's no worry of yours. Sharp was in the doorway, ready to leap inside at the first sign of an attack. He held his sword low, and now, with his left hand, he brought the rifle into view. If you want to fight me, Matarife, I'm ready. The first bullet will be for you. Now tell me what happens to the woman. The bearded man paused. From somewhere in the town came the smell of a kitchen fire. The street was slick and thick with mud from the night's rain. El Matarife licked his lips. Nothing happens to her. She goes back to the convent. I don't believe you. El Matarife's horse pranced in the mud. The bearded man quieted the beast. She goes back, Englishman, to where she belongs. Our quarrel is not with her, but with a man who dared to frighten nuns. Slowly, his eyes not leaving Sharp, he reached down to his saddle. Sharp knew what was coming, and he did not move. El Matarife produced a looped chain. He held onto one end of it and tossed the rest towards Sharp. The chain lay in the mud. The partisan took from his belt a long knife, and that, too, he threw towards the inn door. Do you dare, Englishman? Or do you only have courage against nuns? Sharp stepped forward. He had small choice. He remembered the speed of this man. He remembered how he had speared the eyes from the French prisoner. But Sharp knew he must accept the challenge. He stooped, picked up the last link of the chain, and a musket sounded to his left. The musket's report was curiously flat in the chill morning. El Matarife stared up the street, then suddenly threw down the chain and shouted at his men. He roweled his spurs back, and Sharp was forgotten in the sudden panic. Hooves galloped. A trumpet was splitting the valley with sudden urgency, and Sharp heard a whoop of glee from the upstairs room of the inn, a shriek of pure joy from La Marquesa, and then more muskets hammered, and he smelt the acrid powder smoke as he ducked into the inn and knelt with his rifle ready. Lancers swept into the street, French lancers. Some had pennants on their blades that were already stained with blood. A riderless horse galloped with them. The partisans were running. They were not ready for the charge, not formed up to meet the shock of the heavy horses. They could only turn and run, but the street was crowded and they could not move as the lancers tore into them. Sharp watched the French riders grimace as they leaned into their long spears, as they ripped the enemy from their horses, as they rode over the dying to strip the long blades free in guts of blood and screams. The blades came up again, aimed for new targets, and the trumpet drove a second squadron into the street, horses' teeth bared, hooves slinging the mud high to stain the uniforms of the riders, and Sharp watched the two cornered partisans raise their muskets, but Frenchmen rode at them, lunged, and a lance pinned one man to the wall of a house with such force that the lancer left the weapon there with the spitted man wriggling and screaming and dying. 
The lancer drew his sabre to pursue the second man who had leaped from his horse and now fell as the sabre was backsliced into his face. Some partisans had escaped as far as the marketplace, but now Sharp heard another trumpet from the plaza's far side, and more lancers came from the north to drive the fleeing partisans into a melee of turning horses, shouts, and fear. The town's folk were running for shelter. The children, brought to watch the partisans, screamed as the lancers rode knee to knee into the panicked mass. Pistols banged, muskets coughed smoke and another squadron cantered at the trumpet's command to take their long blades into the dull press of cloaked partisans. The lance blades, razor sharp, dipped at the officer's order. The horses were urged on, and the level blades were driven into the enemy. The green and pink uniforms were darkened by blood. One lancer came running from the melee, his square-topped hat in one hand, his other hand pressed to a running wound in his scalp. Another of the bright uniforms was in the mud, but for every Frenchman down there were a dozen partisans, and still more lancers thundered on towards the marketplace, and still the trumpet urged them on, and still the long blades were rammed home to scrape on ribs and tear the guts from the panicked horsemen. Sharp thought he could hear El Matarife shouting. He thought he saw the poleaxe raised once in the churning mass of men and screaming horses. And then he saw a fence fall at the far side of the marketplace, and, as if a whirling flood had been released by a broken dam, the partisans fled over the broken wattle of the downed fence, leaving the square to the triumphant, blood-stained cavalry. The marketplace stank of blood. The wounded pulled themselves through the mud, crying out for Jesus, screaming as the lances rode at them, and with surgical precision pushed down with the stained blades. The French laughed as they inflicted pain on their elusive guerrilla enemies. One wounded man was pierced again and again, and still no lancer tried to kill him. A woman crouching over a still body screamed at the French troops until a cavalryman kicked her with his heavy boot and she fell onto her dying man. The trumpets took three squadrons in pursuit. Two stayed to deal with the wounded and prisoners. Sharp had gone to the back door of the inn, thinking to go up into the trees behind the stable yard, but the small yard was full of Frenchmen who were leading the captured horses from their stalls. One saw him, shouted, but Sharp barred the door and turned back. La Marquesa was at the ladder's foot. She stared at the sword in his hand. You want to get away, Richard? Sharp sheathed the sword. There were hands hammering on the barred door, shaking it. My name's Vaughan. She smiled. What? Vaughan. And you slept in the stable, Richard? He saw the intensity in her eyes, the warning there, and he nodded wearily. He slung the rifle on his shoulder, and then a tall man ducked into the front door of the inn. Hélène screamed with delight and ran to his arms. Sharp, a prisoner of the French, could only watch. General Raoul Verigny was six feet and two inches tall. There could not have been an ounce of fat on his body. His uniform was tailored tight as a drumskin. He had a thin, dark face with a small, neatly upturned moustache. He smiled often. He had shouted at the men at the back door to stop their noise, bowed to Sharp, and accepted the gesture of surrender. He had spoken with La Marquesa for two minutes, bowed to Sharp again, and returned the sword. Your bravery measure makes it imperative to return the sword. You have my most wonderful thank you. He bowed a third time. The riffle, Major, I have it my duty to take. He pronounced it riffle. He gave it to an aide-de-camp, who gave it to a lieutenant, who gave it to a sergeant. Now, an hour later, Sharp was an honoured guest at breakfast. About them, the town burned. The inn was spared, so long as it provided shelter. General Varigny was solicitors of Sharp. You must be disheveled, Major Vaughan. Disheveled, sir? To fail in this hope? He smiled, touching the points of his moustache. Indeed, sir. La Marquesa had told Verigny that Sharp had been sent by the British to take her from the convent to Wellington's army, where she would have been questioned. Verigny poured Sharp some coffee. Instead, we take Hélène home, and you, prisoner. Indeed, sir. But it is not to worry to you. Verigny offered Sharp a leg of chicken, pressing him to accept. You will be changed, yes? Exchanged? 
Uh, exchange. I do not practice my English so much. Elaine speaks it so well, but she does not speak it at me. She should do so, yes? He laughed and turned to La Marquesa, pouring her wine. He was, sharp judged, a man of his own age, darkly handsome. Sharp was jealous. The general turned back to Sharp. You speak French, Major? No, sir. You should. It is the very beautifulest tongue in the world. The table was crowded with French officers who grinned with the happiness of men who had won a great victory. It was rare for French cavalry to surprise the partisans, and this morning they had reaped a grim harvest of their enemies. The silver-cloaked man was a prisoner, doubtless screaming beneath a blade as his captors sought answers to their questions. But El Matarife had escaped into the eastern mountains. Verini did not mind. He is ended, yes, his men broken. Besides, I come for Hélène, not him, and you have released her for me. He smiled and toasted sharp. The assembled officers looked curiously at the Englishman. Few had seen a captured British officer before, and none had seen one of the feared riflemen as a prisoner. If they caught his eye, they smiled. They offered him the best food on the table. One poured him wine, another brandy, and they urged him to drink with them. Verini sat close to La Marquesa. She fed him scraps with her fork. They touched each other, laughed privately, and seemed to fill the room with their gaiety. At one point there was a roar of laughter, and the general smiled at Sharp. I tell her she should be marrying me. She says she might become a nun instead, yes? Sharp smiled politely. Verini asked whether Sharp thought La Marquesa would make a good nun, and Sharp said that the nunnery would be a fortunate place. Verini laughed. But what waste, Major, yes? He gestured at her. I ride here to rescue her. I insist they make me come here. I demand it. You think she deserves marriage to me as a return, yes? Sharp smiled, but inside he felt sick. He had been a prisoner before, back in the Indian Wars, and then, too, he had been captured by lancers. He would remember to his last day the face of the Indian leaning towards him, teeth gritted, as he drove the blade into Sharp's waist to pin him to the tree. Now he had been captured again, and he could see small hope of freedom. He listened to the loud laughter of the officers, saw their eyes fastened on La Marquesa, watched her coquettish gestures as she played to her audience. She pouted at him once, raising more laughter, and he hid his despair beneath a wan smile. General Verini had said that Sharp could be exchanged, but Sharp knew it would not happen. Even if the British had a captive French major to exchange, they would not recognize the name Vaughan on the French proposal. Every few weeks the two sides exchanged lists of prisoners, but Wellington's headquarters would query Major Vaughan. The French would presume that the British did not want Vaughan back, and he would be sent to the fortress town of Verdun, where officer prisoners were kept. Nor could Sharp reveal his real name. To do that would be to prompt a dozen questions, each nastier than the last. He must stay Vaughan, and as Vaughan he would go to Verdun, and as Vaughan he would sit out the war rotting behind Verdun's walls, wondering what kind of bleak future peace would bring. Or... He could escape, yet not till Verini had safely escorted him from these mountains with their vengeful partisans. Even as he thought it, Verini turned and smiled at him. Hélène, she tells me you break into the convent, yes? Yes. You are a brave man, Major Vaughan. Verini lifted a glass to him. I owe you my thank you. Sharp shrugged. You can't let me go, sir. Verini laughed, then translated the exchange into French to provoke more friendly laughter from his officers. He shook his head. I cannot let you go, Major Vaughan, but you do not cause yourself to worry, no. You will be changed at Burgos. Sharp smiled. I hope so, sir. You hope? It is certain. But, however, you must give me your parole not to escape before then, yes? Sharp hesitated. By giving his parole, he promised to make no effort to escape. He would keep his sword, he would be free to ride with the lances without guard, and he would be treated with the respect due to his rank. If he did not give it, then he would be able to make an attempt to escape, but he knew that he would be well guarded. He would be disarmed, he would be locked up at night. 
and if there was nowhere to lock him, he could even be tied to his guard. Verini shrugged. Well? I cannot give you my parole, sir. Verini frowned. The table was silent. The general shrugged. You are a brave man, monsieur. I do not want to treat you bad. I cannot accept, sir. But I want to help, yes. Helen say you treat her with honor, so I do the similar for you. You will be changed. Why do you not let me do this? Sharp stood. The whole table watched him. He stepped over the bench. In his head, he could hear Hogan's insistent words that he must not be captured. He cursed himself. He had sought a warm bed last night when he should have insisted in sleeping in the open air, hidden by woods and night mists. La Marquesa watched him. She shook her head, as if to tell him that he must not do what he planned. At least, Sharp thought, she had kept her word. So far, the French did not know that they'd captured Richard Sharp. Verigny smiled. Come, Measure, you will be changed. In answer, Sharp unbuckled his sword belt. The slings jangled harshly. He leaned forward and put the great sword on the table. The dull metal scabbard scraped on the wood as he looked at the general and pronounced his own failure. I am your prisoner, sir. No parole. Beyond the end door, the town burned. A woman screamed. A child sobbed. The lancers searched the houses before torching them, and Richard Sharp was led under guard and locked into a stable. He had failed. Chapter 15 There was nothing in the cell. No blanket, no cot, not even a bucket. The floor was thick with slime. Each breath made Sharp want to gag on the stench that was thicker than musket smoke. There was no window. He knew he was deep inside the rock on which Burgos's castle was built. He had been brought through the outer courtyard, past walls still scorched from the explosions of British howitzer shells fired in last year's siege, through the packed, loaded wagons of treasure that crammed the yard, past the roofless, burned-out buildings, to the massively walled keep. He had been pushed downstairs, down a dank, cold corridor, and into this small, square room with its slimy floor and the incessant drip of water onto stone outside. The only light was a faint glow that came through a small hole carved in the thick door. He shouted that he was a British officer, that he wished to be treated accordingly, but there was no reply. He shouted it in Spanish and English, but his voice faded in the cold, echoing corridor to silence. He touched his temple and winced with the pain. It was swollen where the infantry sergeant had struck him with a musket butt. The blood was drying to a crust. Rats moved in the corridor. The water dripped outside. Once he heard voices far away, and he shouted again, but there was no reply. He had been given no chance to escape on the journey south. The lances had ridden fast, and Sharp was put in the centre of a whole squadron, the men behind him with their lances ready to thrust. At night he'd been locked up, twice in churches, once in a village jail, and guarded by men who stayed wide awake with loaded muskets on their knees. La Marquesa had travelled in a coach that General Verini had confiscated in the town, where he'd found her. Once or twice she would catch Sharp's eye and shrug. At night she sent him wine and food cooked for the Lancer officers. His telescope, his pack, all his belongings except the clothes he wore, had been taken from him. Verigny, who could not understand why Major Vaughan was so stubborn, had promised that the belongings would be returned to him. Verigny had kept the promise. When Sharp was taken up the steep road and into Burgos Castle, his property was given back. He had been handed over to the fortress troops. Verigny's men left him in the courtyard, standing under the guard of two infantrymen as the sun climbed higher. Sharp had stared at the wagons in the yard, Trying to see beneath the roped tarpaulins a clue to confirm La Marquesa's tale that the treasure of the Spanish Empire was here. He waited. Men of the garrison passed him, staring curiously at the prisoner, and still no administrative officer arrived to arrange his future. Once, at one of the high windows in the keep, Sharp saw a man with a telescope. 
The glass seemed to be aimed directly at himself. It had been shortly after he had seen the man with the spyglass that the four infantrymen, led by a sergeant, had run towards him. He had thought they were going past him, had stepped back, but one of the men had bellowed at him, swung a fist, and Sharp had hit back. One punch, two. And then the sergeant had cracked him on the temple with the musket butt, and he had been unceremoniously brought to this cell, where he could pace three steps in each direction, and where there was no light, no stool, no bed, no hope. He was thirsty. His head throbbed. He leaned on the wall for a time, fighting pain, darkness, and despair. The hours passed, but what time it was he did not know. No bells penetrated to this room, hacked in the rock beneath the old castle. He wondered if he'd been recognized, but even if he had, then it made no sense for him to be treated this way. He thought of La Marquesa, imagining her in the arms of her general, her head on his chest, her hair golden against his skin. He tried to remember the night in the inn, but it seemed unreal. All that seemed real was this cell, his hurts, and the thirst. He found a wet patch of wall, and he licked the stone for moisture. The stench in the cell was foul. Night soil had been thrown in here, or left by other prisoners, and each breath he took was fetid. Time passed and passed, measured only by the dripping of water onto stone. They wanted him to despair, to be dragged down by this foul, stinking place. And he fought it by trying to remember the names of every man who had served in his company since the beginning of the war in Spain. And when he'd done that, he tried to call aloud the muster roll of the very first company he had joined in the army. He paced the cell against the cold, back and forth, his boots splashing on the floor. And sometimes, when the smell was too much, he put his mouth against the spy hole in the door and sucked deep breaths. He cursed himself for this capture, for oversleeping in the dawn, for accepting the challenge of a duel. He sensed that the day had passed, that night had come, though the glow at the door did not change. He propped himself in a corner, squatting on his heels with his back to the wall, and tried to sleep. Four nights ago, he'd been in a real bed, between sheets, with La Marquesa warm against him and over him. And he tried to sleep, jerked awake, and listened to the rats outside and the drip of water. He shivered. He sensed that the prisoner put in this cell was supposed to lie down. They wanted the prisoner here to soil his clothes and be stained with feces. He would not oblige them. Three men came for him eventually, two armed with bayonet-tipped muskets, and the third the same great hulk of a sergeant who had first struck sharp. The man was huge. He appeared to have no neck, and his arms bulged the uniform sleeves with muscle. The sergeant shouted at him in French. Then laughed at the smell of the room. Sharp was tired, desperately so, and the thirst had half closed his throat. He stumbled in the sudden light of the flaming torch held by one of his guards, and the sergeant pushed him so he fell, and then hauled him up with a strength that took Sharp's weight easily. They marched him down the corridor, up the stairs, along a second corridor, and up more stairs. There was daylight here, coming through small windows that looked into the keep's central courtyard. And then the sergeant pushed Sharp into a room where a fourth soldier waited. It was a room about twelve feet square. One window, high and barred, let a grey, unhappy light onto the stone of the walls and floor. A single table was in the room, behind it a chair. The guards positioned themselves on either side of him. The sergeant, the only unarmed Frenchman, was one of the two men on Sharp's right. Whenever Sharp tried to lean against the wall, he was shouted at, pulled forward, and then there would be silence again. They waited. The two men immediately closest to Sharp faced him with bayonets. Sharp closed his eyes. He swayed slightly with tiredness. His head throbbed. The door opened. Sharp opened his eyes and understood. Pierre Ducot stepped into the room. For a second, Sharp did not recognize the small, pock-skinned man with the round spectacles, and then the Christmas meeting in the Gateway of God rushed back to him. Major Pierre Ducot, who had been described to Sharp as a dangerous man, a clever man, a man whose hands stank with the slime of politics, was responsible for this treatment, for the filthy cell, 
for what Sharp knew was about to happen. Duco wrinkled his nose, then stepped almost delicately behind the table and sat. A soldier followed him and put Sharp's sword on the table, then his telescope, then some papers. Not a word was said until the soldier had gone. Duco fussily aligned the edges of the papers before looking up at the English officer. You slept well? Sharp ignored the question. I'm an officer of His Britannic Majesty's Army, and I demand the treatment proper to my rank. His voice came out as a dry croak. Duco frowned. You're wasting my time. His voice was deep, as if it belonged to a much huger man. I am an officer in His Britannic... He stopped, because the huge sergeant, on a nod from Duco, had turned and planted one vast fist into Sharp's stomach, doubling him over, driving the wind from him. Duco waited until Sharp was upright again, until his breathing was normal, then smiled. I believe, Mr. Sharp, that you are not an officer. By a court-martial decision, of which I have a record here, he tapped the papers, you were dismissed the army. In brief, you are civilian, though masquerading as a Major Vaughan. Am I right? Sharp said nothing. Duco unhooked the spectacles from his ears, breathed on them, and began to polish their round lenses with a silk handkerchief he took from his sleeve. I believe you are a spy, Mr. Sharp. I am an officer. Do stop being tedious. We have already ascertained that you were cashiered. You wear a uniform to which you are not entitled. Carry a name not your own. And by your own admission to General Verini, you were trying to abduct a woman in the hopes that she could provide information. He carefully hooked the wire spectacle frames onto his ears and smiled unpleasantly at Sharp. It sounds like spying to me. Did Wellington think that by faking your execution you would become invisible? He laughed at his jest. I will admit, Mr. Sharp, that it fooled me. I could hardly credit it when I saw you in our courtyard. He smiled triumphantly, then picked up the top sheet of paper. It seems from what that fool Verigny has told me that you rescued La Marquesa from the convent. Is that true? Sharp said nothing. Duco sighed. I know you did, Mr. Sharp. It was inconvenient of you, to say the least. Why did you go to such lengths to rescue her? I wanted to go to bed with her. Duco leaned back. You're being tiresome, and my time is too valuable to listen to your filth. I ask you again, why did you rescue her? Sharp repeated the answer. Duco looked at the sergeant and nodded. The sergeant turned stolidly, his face expressionless, glanced up and down Sharp, and then brought his right fist hard again at the rifleman's stomach. Sharp moved from the blow, his own hand going for the sergeant's eyes, but a bayonet chopped down on his arm, and the sergeant's left fist crashed into his face, banging his head back on the stone wall. Then the right fist was in his belly, doubling him over, and suddenly the sergeant, as woodenly as he had turned to Sharp, turned away and slammed to attention. Ducot was frowning. He watched Sharp straighten up. Blood was coming from the rifleman's nose. Sharp leaned on the wall, and this time no one stopped him. The Frenchman shook his head. I do dislike violence, Major. It upsets me. It has its uses, I fear, and I think you now understand that. Why did you rescue La Marquesa? Sharp gave the same answer. This time he let himself be hit. He had only one weapon, and he used it. He pretended to be weaker than he was. He fell to the floor, groaning, and the sergeant disdainfully pulled him up by his jacket collar and threw him against the wall. The sergeant smiled in victory as he turned back to Duco. Why did you rescue La Marquesa? I needed a woman. This time Duco did not nod to the sergeant. He seemed to sigh. He took off his spectacles again, frowned, polished them with his handkerchief, then, with a small wince, hooked the wires back on his ears. I believe you, Major. Your appetite would run to women like Elaine, and doubtless you rot her capably. Tell me, did she ask the British for help? Only for a rot. It seems the French don't do it well enough for a... Sharp 
braced himself for the blow, but again Ducot did not give the signal. He sighed again. I should tell you, Mr. Sharp, that Sergeant Lavin is remarkably efficient at exacting words from reluctant talkers. He usually practices his art on the Spanish, but he has long wanted an English man. Ducot's spectacles flashed two circles of grey light. Indeed, he has wanted an Englishman for a long, long time. Sergeant Lavin, hearing his name, turned his squat, hard-eyed head and looked at Sharp with disdain. Ducot stood up and walked round the table, picking up Sharp's telescope as he came. Before you are in no state to appreciate it, Major, I have a score to settle with you. You broke my spectacles. You put me to a deal of trouble. Suddenly, astonishingly, Ducot sounded angry. He seemed to control it, straightening his small body and frowning. You deliberately broke my spectacles! Sharp said nothing. It was true. He had smashed Ducot's glasses in the gateway of God. He had done it after Ducot had insulted Teresa, Sharp's wife. Now Ducot held Sharp's telescope. A very fine instrument, Major. He peered at the brass plate. September 23rd, 1803. We called it Vendemier, second year ten. Ducot, Sharp knew, regretted the abolition of the revolutionary calendar. Sharp pushed himself up from the wall. Take it, Ducot. Your army's stolen everything else in Spain. Take it? Of course not. You think I'm a thief? He looked back at the brass plate. The reward for one of your acts of bravery, no doubt. He pulled the telescope open, revealing the polished inner brass tubes. No, Major Sharp, I'm not going to take it. I'm simply going to pay back the insult you offered me. With gritted teeth and sudden frenzy, Ducot swung the telescope by its eyepiece, slamming it on the stone floor, and then swinging it again and again. A fortune in finely ground glass was being smashed by the small man who went on beating it, bending the tubes, scattering thick glass fragments on the stone floor. He dropped the telescope and stamped on it, splitting the brass tubes apart. Then he kicked at them viciously, skittering them about the floor until nothing left to kick at. He stood panting. He straightened his jacket and looked with a smile of pitiful triumph at the rifleman. You have paid me your personal debt, Mr. Sharp, an eye for an eye, so to speak. Sharp had watched the destruction of his telescope, his valued telescope that had been a gift from Wellington, with mounting anger and frustration. He could do nothing. Sergeant Lavin had watched him, and the bayonets had been in his ribs. He forced his anger down and nodded at the sword. Do it to that, Duco. No, Mr. Sharp. Ducot was behind the table, sitting again. When they ask me how you died, I shall say that I offered you parole, you accepted, and that you then attacked me with the sword I had politely returned to you. My life will be saved by Sergeant Lavin. The Frenchman smiled. But I truly hate violence, Mr. Sharp. Would you believe me if I said I do not wish you dead? No. Ducot shrugged. It's true. You can live. You can walk out of here with your sword. We won't exchange you, of course. You'll spend the rest of the war in France. We might even civilize you. Ducot smiled at his joke and looked down at the papers. So tell me, Mr. Sharp, or even Major Sharp, if it makes you feel better, did Hélène seek British help? Sharp swore at him. Ducot sighed and nodded. Lavin turned, stolid and unstoppable, and this time he punched Sharp's face, cutting his lips open and slashing a bloody line over his forehead with a ring he wore. Sharp fell again, deliberately, and this time boots slammed into his back. He cried out, also deliberately, scrabbled with his hands, and suddenly knew hope. A twisted, bent tube of brass from his telescope was by the wall. He shouted again as a boot landed, grabbed the tube and concealed it in his fist. A hand grasped his collar, hauled him up, turned him and pushed him back to the wall. It was the smallest tube in his hand. 
He could feel the torn, knurled rim that had held the small lens of the eyepiece. The tube was six inches in length, and one end was split and jagged where Ducot had stamped on it. Ducot waited for Sharp's breathing to slow, for the battered, bleeding face to face him again. It may help you to know, Major, that I will ask you a number of questions to which I already have the answers. You will, therefore, suffer pain unnecessarily. Eventually you will understand the futility of that course. You were accused of murdering Hélène's husband. True? You know I was. Ducot smiled. I arranged it, Mr. Sharp. Did you know that? Ducot was pleased by the jerk of Sharp's head, the sudden surprise in the bruised eyes. Ducot liked his victims to know who was responsible for their misfortune. Why did Wellington fake your death? I don't know. Sharp's lips were swelling. He was swallowing blood. He made his breathing ragged. He was charging distances, planning not the first death, but the second. Ducot was enjoying the spectacle of his enemy trampled and broken. It was not the physical beating that gave Ducot pleasure, but Sharp's realization that he had been outmaneuvered. You were sent to rescue Hélène? Sharp's voice came out thickened and slurred by his bleeding lips. I wanted to know why she lied in her letter. The answer checked Ducot, who frowned. The rescue was your own idea? My idea. Sharp spat a gob of blood onto the floor. How did you know where she was? Everyone knew. Half of bloody Spain knew. Ducot accepted that truth. Her fate was supposed to have been a secret. But nothing was secret that happened in Spain. Even Verigny, a gaudy fool, had eventually discovered where his lover was held. None of that worried Ducot. All that worried Ducot was the security of the treaty. So, you rescued her five days ago. Something like that. And General Verigny discovered you the next day? Yes. Did you sleep with her, Mr. Sharp? No. But you said that's why you wanted to rescue her. She wouldn't have me. Sharp shut his eyes and leaned his head on the wall. The last two times he had been attacked, the armed soldiers had not bothered to use their bayonets to stop him retaliating. They could see he was beaten and defenseless. They were wrong, but he must wait for his moment, and he was planning it carefully. He had fallen to his right the last time, and the man there had stepped back and away to give Lavin room. He must be made to do it again. Did you sleep with her? No. Did she tell you why she was in the convent? She wanted a rest. Ducot shook his head. You are a stubborn fool, Mr. Sharp. And you're a filthy little bastard. Mr. Sharp. Ducot leaned back in his chair. Tell me what explanation she offered to you. She must have offered you some reason for her rest. Sharp shook his head as though he was having difficulty with his senses. She said she had a dream about you. She was ordered to marry you by the Emperor, and she saw you naked, and it was the most horrid thing she'd ever... Sergeant! The first blow landed on Sharp's skull, a glancing blow, but then there was a pile-driving thump in his belly, and the air rushed out of him. He forced himself to the right, was helped by a blow to his head, and then he was on the ground. Stop! A boot thudded at his kidneys. He pulled the brass tube out of his sleeve, turned it, and gripped it with his right hand. He would have one chance only, just one. No! He shouted it desperately, as if he was a child begging to be spared a beating, and then yelped as a boot hammered on his thigh. Ducot spoke a word in French. The blows stopped. The sergeant leaned down to haul Sharp up by his collar. The other three men were standing back, weapons lowered, grins on their faces. Levin pulled Sharp up and never saw the hand that struck up with the jagged brass tube. Sharp bellowed in anger. The war shut. They thought him weak and beaten, but he had one fight in him, and they would learn what a rifleman was in a fight. The tube, jagged brass edges splayed at its end, struck Lavar's groin, and Sharp twisted it, pushed and gouged as the sergeant let go of him and screamed a horrid high scream and dropped his hands to the blood and pain. But already Sharp had let the tube go, was rising to the sergeant's right, was moving with all his speed and filling the room with his battle shout. The sergeant's body blocked two men. 
The third raised his musket, but the muzzle was seized, pulled, and the heel of Sharp's right hand struck the man's moustache, breaking bone, snapping the head back. Then Sharp dropped his bleeding hand to the musket's lock, turned the gun, and pulled the trigger. The two remaining men had dared not fire for fear of their own comrades. Seconds only had passed since the sergeant had stooped to pick up the broken English officer. Now a musket belched smoke and noise. One man fell, the musket ball in his lungs, and Sharp hammered back with the brass butt at the man whose musket he had taken and who still grappled with him. The butt hit the man's head, but he dragged Sharp down, close to the bleeding, sobbing sergeant, and the room echoed to a second musket shot, hammering louder than thunder in the room, drowning even the agony of Sergeant Levin. Sharp twisted, heaved, flailed with the musket at the man who had fired as he fell. He still shouted, knowing that men are frightened by noise, by savagery, and he wrenched his right foot free from the man who held it, rose snarling from the bloody floor, and lunged with his captured bayonet in short professional strokes at the last of his enemies still standing. Ducot, his mouth open, was standing terrified at the door. He had no weapon. The bayonets clashed. Sharp pushed his opponents aside, lunged again, then broke to his right, to the table, seized the sword, and his voice was triumphant as he swung it, the scabbard scraping free and flying across the room, and he sliced down with the blade, shouting in savage victory, and cut into the last man's neck, dragging the blade back against bone and blood. He saw the man begin to fall, then finished him off with a lunge that was dragged downwards by the dying man. In seconds, just seconds, he had killed two men and wounded two others. He twisted and jerked the sword free, then turned to the door. Duco! The door was empty. He went to it, the sword bloody in his hand. His face was a mask of blood, his uniform soaked with Lavar's blood. One man against four, and that a rifleman. Sergeant Harper would say that they were fair odds. Duco, you bastard! Duco! He walked into the corridor. Behind him, the sergeant sobbed and wailed and bled into the hands cupped over his groin. Duco, you felt! Monsieur! The voice came from his right. Sharp turned. A group of French officers stood there. They were elegant and clean, staring aghast at the bloody man with the swollen face and the savage voice and the sword that dripped blood. The French officers wore swords, but none was drawn. One man stepped forward, a tall man in green and pink, a man who frowned. Major Vaughan? It was Verigny. His face was screwed up, either because of the smell of blood or the sight of Sharp. Major? My name is Sharp. There was no point in concealment any longer. Major Richard Sharp. He leaned on the wall. The tip of the sword rested on the flagstones and made there a small pool of thick blood. Verini seemed to stand to attention. I came from honor, Major, that you would be treated in accord with honor. Sharp jerked his head towards the door. The bastards tried to kill me. I had no sword then. I fought back. Sergeant Lavin was sobbing in high, pitiful cries from within the square, stone-walled room. Verigny looked through the door. He stepped back and stared in awe at the rifleman who had made the room look like a slaughterhouse. You will be treated good measure. You have need of a doctor? Yes. And water. Food. A bed. Of course. These clothes washed. A bath. Of course. Sharp pulled his right hand from the sword. His palm was a bloody mess. It hurt. He held the sword out with his left hand. I'm your prisoner again, it seems. You will do me the honor to keep the sword, monsieur, till we have discussion on what we do to you. Sharp nodded, then turned back into the room. He retrieved his scabbard and sword belt, but could not fasten them with his wounded hand. He went and stood over the moaning, sobbing Sergeant Lavin, who looked up at him with eyes that seemed to mix pain, with an astonishment that he had been beaten. Sharp looked at the French general. Sir, Major, tell this eunuch he got his wish. Verini was chilled by the rifleman's voice. His wish, monsieur? He wanted an Englishman. He got one. Chapter 16 Sharp was led to one of the buildings in the castle yard that was still in a state of repair, then helped upstairs to a lime-washed room, decently furnished with a bed, table and chairs, and with a view from a barred window into the fortress's biggest courtyard. He could see across to the squat keep, past the castle church, and every spare inch of the courtyard was crowded with the treasure wagons. A doctor came. Sharp's wounds were washed and bandaged. He was bled with lancet and cup, then given food and brandy. 
A great tub was brought to his room, filled by a succession of buckets, and he soaked his body in it. His uniform was taken away, laundered, mended, and returned. He was still a prisoner. Two guards were outside his door, at the head of the stairs which led down into the courtyard. One of the guards, a cheerful young man no older than Angel, shaved him. Sharp could not hold a razor in his bandaged right hand. His sword was propped by the bed. He had cleaned the blade, with difficulty. In the ridges of the wooden handle, that should have been wrapped with leather and bound with wire, there was blood that he did not have the energy to clean. He slept instead, a sleep of bad dreams and intermittent pain. His guards brought him food, good food, and two bottles of red wine. They tried to tell him something, grinning good-naturedly at his incomprehension. He heard the name Verigny and supposed that the general had sent the food. He smiled, nodded to show he understood, and the guards left him with candles and his own thoughts. He paced the floor, thinking only that soon all Spain would think that Wellington had released the murder of a Spanish Marquess. He had failed Wellington, Hogan, and himself. In the morning the doctor came again, unpeeled the bandages, and muttered to himself. He examined Sharp's night soil in the bucket, seemed pleased by it, then bled Sharp's thigh into a small cup. He did not rebandage Sharp's head, only the cut hand that was still painful. His lips were swollen, their insides were coated with congealed blood. Rather that, he thought, than the sergeant's wound. He sat by the window all morning, watching the wagons roll out of the courtyard. Wagon after wagon left, their oxen prodded by drivers with pointed staves. The axle squeals never stopped as the courtyard slowly emptied. The French retreat that had begun in Valladolid had started again, and Sharp knew that the British must be advancing still, and that the French were sending the treasure wagons back on the great road towards France. He wondered if Hélène's six wagons were among the ones that left. He wondered why Ducot had arranged for him to be accused of the Marquess's death, and why Hélène had lied about it. The castle church had been used as an ammunition store. As the wagons made space in the big courtyard, Squads of infantry began carrying shells and canister from the church towards the keep. Sharp, with nothing else to do, watched. After an hour, the shells were no longer being carried into the keep, but instead were being piled in the courtyard. Pile after pile was made, starting by the keep door and working slowly down the courtyard towards him. He wondered if this was a punishment detail, forced to do one of the pointless chores that all armies gave their defaulters, but then, curiously, he saw French engineer officers running white fuses to each of the conical heaps, fuses that led back into the keep. He realized suddenly that the French must be abandoning Burgos, that they were blowing the castle apart rather than delivering such a fortress intact to their enemies. Yet it struck him as odd that they should go to the trouble of piling the shells in the courtyard instead of blowing them in one great mass in the magazine. Then... Hearing footsteps on the stairs, he turned from the window and forgot the strange piles of ammunition. He made sure the sword was within reach. He was half expecting Ducot to return and finish what he'd begun, but it was a smiling French lancer who opened the door. On the man's arm, incongruously, hung a basket covered with a linen cloth. More such men came, men who arranged food and wine on the table in Sharp's room. None spoke English. They finished their job left. Then Sharp heard her voice on the stairs. It was La Marquesa, looking as if she'd bathed in dew and sipped ambrosia, her eyes bright, her smile welcoming, and her concern about his battered, blood-marked face oddly touching. With her was the tall, dark figure of General Verigny, while behind came another French officer, a plump major called Montbrun, who spoke fluent English and trusted that Major Sharp was not in any great pain. Sharp assured him he was not. Major Montbrun nevertheless hoped that Major Sharp would realize that his treatment at the hands of Sergeant Lavin had not been worthy of the great French army, and that Major Sharp would forgive it and offer Major Montbrun the pleasure of joining him in a small, light luncheon. Major Sharp would. Major Montbrun knew that Major Sharp had the honor of already knowing La Marquesa and the general. Montbrun explained that he was an aide to King Joseph himself. 
Napoleon's brother, who was the puppet king on the crumbling Spanish throne. Montbrun hoped that Major Sharp would not take it amiss if he said that His Majesty King Joseph was flattered that so redoubtable an enemy as Major Sharp should have been captured. Sharp did not reply. La Marquesa smiled and brushed the crusted wound on Sharp's head with her fingertips. Ducot is a pig, Montbrun frowned. Major Ducot has explained what happened, my lady. I'm sure we must believe him. What did he say? Sharp asked. Montbrun held a chair for La Marquesa, then for Sharp, then sat himself. Major Ducot explained that Sergeant Levin lost his temper. Most sad, of course. You'll forgive us serving ourselves, Major Sharp. I thought we might be more intimate without orderlies. Of course. And how is Sergeant Levin? Montbrun frowned as though the subject was deeply distasteful. He, of course, faces disciplinary charges. Can I suggest some of this cold soup? It's most tasteful, I'm sure. May I have the honor of assisting you? He could. La Marquesa, dressed in lilac silk with a low, lace-frilled neckline, smiled at him. Sharp agreed with Montbrun that the spring had been wet and that this summer had more rain than most in Spain. He agreed that the soup, a gazpacho, was delicious. Montbrun wondered if there was too much garlic for his taste, but Sharp assured him there could not be too much garlic in anything for his taste, and Montbrun agreed how wise that view was. Verini grinned. His moustache was stained with the soup. I think you demi kills at Migu Lavin, yes? He looked at La Marquesa. Migu? Bugger, darling. Ah, you kill the bugger Lavin, yes? Sharp smiled. He tried to kill me. Verini shrugged. You should kill him. I hate buggers. Montbrun hastened with a courtier's smoothness to recommend the red wine, which, though Spanish, had a certain plangency, he thought, which Major Sharp might find pleasing. Major Sharp, who was thirsty, found it very pleasing. He drank. La Marquesa toasted him with her glass. You should have more champagne, Richard. I shall save it. Why? There's plenty. There was, too. The bottles of wine and champagne stood in ranks at the end of the table. Montbrun poured a separate glass of champagne for Sharp. I hear it's scarce in your country now, Monsieur, because of the war. Sharp, who had never drunk champagne in England and only in Spain when he was with La Marquesa, agreed it was scarce. Indeed, Montbrun poured himself a glass. I was told by an Englishman we took prisoner that you're paying twenty-three shillings a bottle now in London. Twenty-three shillings? Why, that's nearly thirty francs a bottle. La Marquesa looked astonished and wondered how anyone could possibly live with prices like that, and asked why there were not riots in the street by a champagne-starved populace. What did the English drink instead? Beer, my lady. Montbrun helped Sharp to some cold ham and cold chicken. He apologized for such simple fare. The ham had been baked in a glaze of honey and mustard. La Marquesa wanted some English beer and seemed unhappy that there was none immediately available in Burgos Castle. General Verini promised to find some. He grunted as he drew the corks of two more bottles of the red wine. We have to drink it. We cannot take it with this bloody army. Montbrun frowned. Sharp smiled. Bloody army? Verini tossed back a glass of wine and poured himself another. It is not an army, monsieur, not a true army. We are a... Uh, he paused, frowned. Un bordel en boulon. I think you'll find the terrain especially good, Major. Montbrun smiled. You'll allow me to cut you some bread? A what? Sharp asked. A walking brothel, Major. La Marquesa smiled brightly. There do seem to be rather a lot of ladies with us, especially since King Joseph joined us. Uh, allow me, Major. Montbrun put some of the terrine onto Sharp's plate. Uh, more wine? Champagne, perhaps? A uh, wine. When the meal was over, and when the peel of oranges littered the table among grape stalks and the rinds of cheeses, Major Montbrun brought the talk to Sharp's future. He took from the tail pocket of his guilty encrusted jacket a folded sheet of paper. We are most pleased to offer you parole. Montbrun smiled and put the paper in front of Sharp. 
Uh, General Alferigny will count it an honor, Major, if you will let him provide you with all your necessities. A horse, your expenses? Montbrun shrugged, as though the generous offer was a mere nothing. The general has done me enough on art already. Verigny, in addition to providing this room and Sharp's food, had given Sharp a new razor, a change of shirt, new stockings, and even a fine new tinder box, all to replace the articles stolen from Sharp since he fell into Ducot's hands. Sharp opened the paper, not understanding the French words, but seeing his own name, misspelt, on the top line. He looked at Montbrun. Is my name to be submitted for exchange? They must have expected the question. An officer was rarely kept as a prisoner of war if he was captured close to the battle lines. Montbrun frowned. We fear not, Major. May I ask why? You have, Monsieur, a certain notoriety? Montbrun smiled. It would be foolish of us to release so formidable a soldier to wreak further damage on our cause. It was a pretty enough compliment, but not the answer Sharp wanted. If he was not to be exchanged, then he faced a journey to the frontier, where he would be released on his parole to make his unescorted way across France. Verigny, speaking eagerly, explained that it would be his pleasure to provide Sharp with the means to stay only in the best hotels, that he would, indeed, furnish him with introductions, and the Major would be welcome to linger on his journey north to savour the summer delights of France. Take the entirely summer, Major. You can drink. There are women. There are more drink. He demonstrated by finishing his glass. Already, Sharp noted Verigny was slurring his words. There was yet more. Once at Verdun, the great northern fortress where officer prisoners were kept, Montbrun explained that the general would ensure that Sharp had money to take rooms in the town, servants, and membership of all the best clubs organized by the captured British officers. Even, he said, the Literary and Philosophical Association, which was neither literary nor philosophical, but provided the wealthiest British captives with the discreet pleasures a man needed. Sharp thanked him. Montbrun reached into his pouch and produced a quill and ink bottle. He pushed them to Sharp. You will sign, Major. When will I be leaving, Burgos? Sharp had not touched the quill. Tomorrow, Major. The General is with the rear guard. You may travel by horseback, or, if your wounds are troublesome, in the Marquesa's coach. Uh, we will leave, it is expected, at nine o'clock. Sharp looked at Hélène and knew the temptation to yield now to sign the paper and share the journey with her. She smiled. Do, Richard, she shrugged. We are not going to let you go. You do know that. Verigny belched. Montbrun frowned. Sharp smiled. I may have to escape, then. That shocked them. There was a second silence, then Verigny exploded into words, pleading words. If there was no parole, then they would be forced to heap indignities upon a brave man who had suffered enough indignities at the hands of Frenchmen who were a disgrace to their country, their emperor, and their sacred flag. It was unthinkable that he should be marched as a common criminal to prison. Verini would not hear that he must sign. Yet if he signed, he could not attempt an escape. He looked at the paper again. I'll give my decision in the morning. Say at eight o'clock. It was the best they could do. They tried to persuade him, but he would not change his mind. In the morning. Eight o'clock. Two more bottles were opened. Sharp's head was already feeling the effects of the first six, but he let Montbrun pour him more wine. They toasted Hélène. They toasted her chances of recovering her wagons. It seemed, she said, that they had been sent to Vittoria already, but the General Verigny was confident that he would take them back for her. More wine was poured. Major Montbrun, his plump face gleaming with sweat, asked Sharp's permission to toast the Emperor, which, the permission having been graciously given, they duly did. Out of courtesy to their guest, they proposed the health of King George the Third, and then various other kings, including Arthur, Alfred, Charlemagne, Louis the First to Louis the Fourteenth, inclusive, Caesar Augustus, Old King Cole, the King of the Castle, Nebuchadnezzar, Wilfred the Hairy, and finishing with Tiglath Pileser the Third, whose name they could not by then pronounce, but who had the honour to take the first of the brandy. General Verigny was asleep. He had slept ever since he had proposed the health of Richard the Lionheart. He was a migo.
Montbar had said, then blushed because he had said it. Now, as the sun was setting and casting long shadows on the conical piles of shells in the castle courtyard, Montbrun decided they must leave. You will give us your decision in the morning, Major. His words came out slowly. He tapped the parole. In the morning. Good. I shall leave it with you, if I may. He stood, and his eyes showed alarm at the effects of the wine on his balance. Good gracious. Two lancers were fetched to carry the general downstairs, and one to assist Montbrun. La Marquesa, who gave her hand to Sharp to be kissed, seemed unaffected by the drink. There were still six untouched bottles on the table. She smiled at him. Don't escape, Richard. He smiled. Thank you for coming. Poor, foolish Richard. She touched his cheek and followed the two officers to the stairs. Sharp sat. He listened to the general's feet drag on the stairs, listened to the door open and close, heard the carriage creak, then clatter away. He stared at the parole, at the odd French words, and felt the temptation to share Hélène's coach. The door opened. She smiled. I've told them to come back for me in three hours. She knocked on the door and Sharp heard the boat slide across outside. She stared at him, her head on one side, then she walked to the bed, sat, and lifted one foot to untie the half-boots she wore under her dress. Come to bed, Risha, for Christ's sake, come to bed. He took a champagne bottle with him and she laughed. You see how good it is to be a prisoner of France? He smiled and lifted his bandaged right hand. You'll have to undress me. I intend to, Richard. Come here. He went. He saw the white lace go, the dress fall, and she was naked in the red sunlight. Her hands reached for his jacket, then pulled him down to the bed and to her arms. She smoked a cigar. She lay on her back and blew smoke rings at the ceiling. I practiced those for months. You're very good. At blowing smoke rings, too, she giggled. You're not very drunk, nor are you. He was dribbling champagne into her navel and sipping it. Can you feel the bubbles? Yes. I don't believe you. She said nothing for a few seconds, then, in a suddenly changed voice that made him stop his game to look at her, she told him that Major Duco had made her sign the letter that had provoked the duel. Sharp stared into the grey eyes. I know. Come here. She gestured at the pillow beside her, and when he was there she pulled the sheet over them both and hooked a leg over his. Are you drunk? No. Then listen. She talked. She spoke of a treaty that was being made between the imprisoned Spanish king and the Emperor Napoleon. She spoke of Pierre Ducot's part in the making of the treaty, and she described the terms of the treaty and how, if it was signed, it would force the British from Spain. You understand? Yes, but what has it got to do with that letter? She finished his question for him, then shrugged. I don't know. She threw her cigar onto the floor and put her hand on his waist. I just don't know, except that I think the Inquisitor must be helping Ducot, and I'm guessing that my money is the price of that help. He stared into her lustrous, beautiful face, and he tried to sense whether this was the truth. He could not tell. It made more sense than her last story, but he knew this clever woman was a liar of practiced fluency. Why are you telling me? She did not answer the question. Instead, she asked if he had liked Major Montbrun. Sharp shrug. I suppose so. She propped herself on one elbow, the sheet falling to her waist. It was almost dark, and Sharp lit the candle beside the bed. She leaned over him to light a fresh cigar from its flame, and he reached up with his tongue to touch her breast. Richard, will you be serious? I am. Why do you think Montbrun was here? I don't know. Christ, think, you stupid bugger! She was half leaning over him. Montbrun is one of Joseph's men, and Joseph is king of Spain. He rather likes it. He likes being called Your Majesty. He doesn't want to give up Spain. 
Even if we can give a bit of Spain, he's got the kingdom. But now his brother is planning to pull the throne out from underneath him and give it all back to Ferdinand. You understand? I understand, but why tell me? Because you're going to stop it. She took a shred of tobacco from her lip and wiped it onto his chest. You're going to sign that parole and come with me. Then you're going to escape. Montbrun will help. He knows about it. All that talk of crossing France was for Raoul's benefit. Instead, we want you to escape. Her fingers were stroking his chest. You go to Wellington. I'll give you a letter. Montbrun will sign it. She was staring at his wide eyes. You escape with our help. You go to Wellington, because if he makes a public announcement now, then he can stop the treaty. No one will dare support it yet. Only Ferdinand can make the stupid bastards accept it. But if Arthur gets the Spanish to make an announcement now that it wouldn't be accepted, then it will never get signed. So you stop it. Do you understand? He frowned. Why doesn't Joseph stop the treaty? Because his brother will crucify him. They're all scared of Napoleon. But if you tell Wellington, then no one can blame Joseph. Why don't you just exchange me? She seemed exasperated by his questions. We can't. Ducot won't allow it. He wants to parade you in Paris as proof of Britain's bad faith. Besides, do you think we'd ever exchange someone like you? But you'll let me escape. Because then Ducot loses. Because Joseph keeps a bit of Spain and gives me my wagons back? Her eyes flicked between his, judging him. Montbrun will pay you, too. But didn't you say the treaty would save France? Christ on the true cross. And I'll be poor, and half of Joseph's men will be ruined. We need this summer, Richard, that's all. Besides, it was that bastard Ducot who arranged this, who had me arrested, who almost had you hanged. I want Ducot to be stood against the wall. I want that so badly, Richard, I can feel it in my guts. Next year they can make that goddamn treaty, but not now. Not till Pierre Ducot is dead. And you want your money? I want that house. Lark, pâté, and honey. And you can visit me from England. We'll pay you, Richard, two thousand guineas in gold, or paper, or whatever. Just sign the parole and we do the rest. She watched him as he stood, as he walked naked to sit in the window. Well? If I break my parole, I have no honor. God spits on honor. Three thousand. He turned to her. She was leaning towards him, naked, her face alive with the moment. Her body that was so beautiful was lit and shadowed by the candle. He wondered if she felt anything when he embraced her. You want me to sign away my honor? She threw the cigar at him. For your country, for me. Anyway, it isn't dishonorable. It isn't? Mon promis spelt your name on purpose. It's not your parole. He turned away from her. Beneath him, a carriage was coming into the courtyard between the strange piles of ammunition. She heard it, swore, and began to dress. Can you hook me up? Just about. He fumbled with his bandaged hand at the nape of her neck, then turned her. He looked into her eyes, and she reached up and kissed him. Do it for me, Richard. Finish to go and that bastard inquisitor, and go back to your career. She put his hand on her breast and pressed it. The war will be over in two or three years. Over. Come to me then. Promise me. She was more beautiful than a dream, more lovely than the stars in winter, softer than light. She kissed him, her lips warm. Come to me when it's all over. Come to you. She half smiled. She was heartbreakingly beautiful, and she whispered into his ear, and her cheek was warm on his. I love you, Richard. Do this for me and come to me. There was a knock on the door. She shouted at them to wait and dragged a hand over her hair. Will you come to me? You know I will. She gestured at the parole. Then sign, Richard, for both of us. Sign. She smiled at his nakedness, motioned him to stand behind the door, and then was gone into the night. 
Sharp drank steadily, his mood worsening. He was thinking of honour betrayed, of a woman who had promised herself to fulfil his wildest dream, of a treaty to expel Britain's army from Spain. He had pulled on his overalls and jacket, lit more candles, and still he had not signed the parole. He decided he was too drunk to sign the parole. Since Hélène had left, he had finished two bottles of wine. He went to the table, amazed that he could stand upright, and took two bottles back to the window, reasoning that by carrying two he would save himself another complicated journey across the room when he'd finished the first. The reasoning struck him as extremely clever. He was proud of it. He rested his head on the window bars. Somewhere a woman laughed, a low sound of pure pleasure, and he was jealous. Elaine. He said it aloud. Elaine, Elaine, Elaine. He drank more, not bothering with the glass. If he was to sign the parole, he thought, then he would be with her for a few days. Verini could not be there all the time. They could make love in her carriage, the curtains drawn. He would break his honour. He would break his parole. There would be no honour left to him if he did that. None. Yet he would save Britain from defeat at the price of his honour. He could make Hélène rich for his honour. And by forcing failure onto Ducot, he could disgrace the man, maybe even, as Hélène had said, have him stood against the wall and shot, all at the price of his honour. He thought of Ducot and lifted the bottle against the night. Bastard! He yawned hugely, drank more, and tried to concentrate his vision on a lit window of the keep, but it kept sliding diagonally up to the right. He frowned at it. Perhaps she meant it, he thought. Perhaps she did love him. He sometimes thought she was a treacherous bitch, beautiful as hell. But even treacherous bitches had to love someone, didn't they? He wondered if love was a sign of weakness, and then he thought that it was not, and then he could not remember what he was thinking, and he drank more from the bottle. He wondered if Antonio would like to have a French aristocrat as a stepmother. He drank to the thought. He drank to Lac Pate and honey and white wine. And her body in his arms, and her breath in his throat, and he wished she was still here. And he drank more wine because it might take away the loneliness because she'd gone. Beyond the window to the northwest, it seemed as if there was a glow in the sky. He noticed it, frowned at it, and thought the glow in the sky might like to be toasted. He raised the bottle and drank. He felt sick. He thought he might feel better if he was sick, but he could not be bothered to go to the bucket that was decently hidden behind a wooden screen made from an old packing case. They'd all laughed when Montbrun had used the bucket and had seemed to piss forever. He laughed again now. She loved him. She loved him. She loved him. He closed his eyes. Then he jerked his head up, eyes open, and stared at the great red smear in the sky. He knew what it was. It was the campfires of an army, seen far off, reflected on the clouds that threatened rain. The British were to the north and west, close enough for their fires to be seen on the clouds, close enough to be forcing a further retreat from this French army, this walking brothel. He laughed and drank again. He threw the empty bottle into the courtyard, hearing it smash on the stones and provoke a shout from a sentry. Sharp shouted back, Migo! Migo! He picked up the next bottle. You shouldn't drink it, he told himself, then decided that it was a terrible waste if he did not. He thought he might drink it in bed and stood up. He held on to the wall. It all suddenly seemed clear with the marvellous prescience of the drunk. King Joseph of Montbrun wanted him to escape. Montbrun was a courtier. Montbrun knew more about honour than Sharp, so it would be all right to break his parole. He would escape. He would go to the British army, and he would be rich. And he would marry La Marquesa when the war was done, because even treacherous bitches had to love someone, and he could not bear to think of her loving anyone else. He drank to the thought. Lark, pate, and honey, he thought. And wine, more wine, always more wine. And then he pushed himself off the wall, aimed for the bed, and collapsed just short of it. He managed to save the bottle. 
He sat by the narrow bed where he'd loved her just this day. I love you, he said. He pulled the blankets about his shoulders and drank some more. It was all so easy. Escape and victory. Marriage and riches. Luck was with him. It always had been. He smiled and raised the bottle. He drank more wine just to prove that he could do it, and then, when he was solemnly thinking he ought to work out a detail or two of the decisions he'd made, his head went back onto the bed, the bottle dropped, and he slept the sleep of the drunk. Chapter 17 Morning came like a sad groan. He was still tangled in blankets beside the bed. The dawn light was depressing. He swore and closed his eyes. Someone was using a sledgehammer within the castle. The blows were ringing through his skull. Oh, God! He opened his eyes again. A bottle of wine lay close to him on the floor, the wine trapped by the bottle's neck, dark with sediment. He groaned again. He leaned his head on the bed and stared up at the whitewashed ceiling. The hammering seemed to be coming from the very walls of the room. He could not believe it was possible to feel this ill. His eyes felt as if they were trying to burst from his head. His mouth was fouler than the cell Ducour had first put him in. His stomach was sour and his bowels were water. Oh, God! He heard the bolts on his door shoot back, but did not turn round. Bonjour, monsieur. It was the cheerful young guard. Sharp turned slowly, his neck hurting. Jesus! The guard laughed. No, monsieur, c'est moi! He put the bowl on the table and mimed shaving. Oui, monsieur? Oui. Sharp stood up. He staggered on aching legs and wished he'd stayed on the floor. He held a hand up to the guard. A minute. Wait. He went to the wooden screen, held it and vomited. Jesus! Monsieur? All right. All right, what time is it? Monsieur? Sharp tried to remember the word. He snapped the fingers of his left hand. Le. Ah, c'est six sur, monsieur. Six? The soldier held up six fingers. Sharp nodded, then spat through the window. The young guard seemed happy to shave the English officer. He did it skillfully, chatting incomprehensibly and cheerfully as he lathered and scraped and washed and toweled. It occurred to Sharp that he could elbow the boy in the belly, take his musket, shoot the man outside and be in the courtyard within ten seconds. There had to be a damned horse there, and with luck he could be through the gates and away before the guards knew what was happening. On the other hand, he did not feel up to morning mayhem, and it seemed distinctly churlish to attack a cheerful man who was shaving him with such skill. Besides, he needed breakfast. He needed it badly. The boy patted Sharp's face dry and smiled. Bonjour. He backed out of the door with the bowl and towel, came back a moment later for the musket he'd left beside Sharp. He waved farewell and shut the door, not bothering to bolt it. The hammering still echoed in the room. He went to the window and saw, where the sentries paced their monotonous beats on the ramparts, that the guns which had defied Wellington last year were being destroyed. Their trunnions, the great knobs that held the barrels to the carriages, were being sawn through. When the hacksaws were halfway through, a man would give a great blow with a sledgehammer to shear the bronze clean. The blows rang dolorously through the courtyard, to make sure that the guns were far beyond repair, they were being spiked as well, then heaved over the ramparts to fall onto the precipitous rocks below. The noise was shattering. He groaned, Oh, God! Sharp lay on the bed. He would never drink again. Never. On the other hand, of course, the hair of the dog that bit you was the only specific against rabies. Half the British army went to their rest drunk and could only face the next day by drinking the night's dregs. He opened one eye and stared gloomily at an unopened bottle of champagne on the table. He fetched it, frowned at it, then shrugged. He jammed it between his legs and twisted the cork with his left hand. It popped, boomingly. The sheer effort of pulling the cork seemed to have left him weaker than a kitten. The champagne foamed onto his overalls. He tried it. It took the taste of vomit from his mouth. It even tasted good. He drank some more. 
He lay back again, holding the champagne in his left hand, and remembered the parole on the table. He was supposed to sign it. Then his escape would be engineered by those people in the French army who did not want peace with Spain. It all seemed so complicated this morning. He only knew that by signing the paper and then escaping, he was sacrificing all honor. The door opened again, and he lay still as the breakfast, supplied by courtesy of General Perigny, was put onto the table. He knew what it would be: hot chocolate, bread, butter, and cheese. Mercy! At least he thought he was learning some French. An hour later, with the breakfast and half the champagne inside him, he decided he was feeling distinctly better. The day, he thought, even had promise. He looked at the parole. He could not sign it. He told himself because it would be unworthy of him. He would have to escape instead. He would have to go to Wellington with this news, but not by sacrificing his honor. Captain Dalimbor had said that honor was merely a word to hide a man's sins, and La Marquesa had laughed at the word. But Sharp knew what it meant. It meant he could never live with himself if he signed the paper and let Montbrun engineer his escape. Honor was conscience. He walked away from the table, from the temptation of the parole, and carried the champagne to the barred window. He stared down, bottle in hand, at the piles of artillery shells that glistened faintly from the rain that had fallen in the night. An officer was checking the fuses. It would be a hell of a bang, Sharp thought, and he wondered if he would get a view of it from the great road. He could hear women's voices. There were an extraordinary number of women with this army. What was it that Verini had said yesterday? Sharp frowned, then smiled. This army was a walking brothel. He turned from the window and crossed to the table where the parole, splashed with red wine stains, still waited for his signature. He tried to make sense of the French words, but could not. Even so, he knew what it said. He promised not to escape, nor in any way assist the forces of Britain or her allies against the French armies, until he was either exchanged or released from the bond. He told himself he should sign it. Escape was impossible. He should sign it and refuse to accept La Marquesa's offer of escape. He thought of travelling in her coach, the curtains drawn, and he remembered her saying that she loved him. He looked at the quill. Was it dishonour to sign the parole and then carry news of the secret treaty to Wellington? Did his country come before honour? Had Ellen spoken the truth? Would she want him when the war was over, when he was a discarded soldier? She had spoken of three thousand guineas. He shut his eyes, imagining three thousand guineas. A man could live a whole life on three thousand guineas. He picked up the quill. He dipped it in the ink, and then, with quick strokes, scored it again and again through the paragraphs of the parole. He tipped the ink bottle onto the paper, obliterating the words, destroying the parole. He laughed and walked back to the window. Beneath him, from a doorway, a cavalry officer emerged into the dawn light. The man was gorgeously uniformed, his white breeches as skin tight as General Verini's. Sharp wondered if such men greased their legs with oil or butter to achieve so tight a fit. He would not be surprised. Cavalry officers would do anything to look like palace flunkies. The man straightened his pelisse, tilted his hat to a more rakish angle, then blew smoke into the air. He took a cigar from his mouth, inspected the sky to judge the weather, then strolled towards the keep. The weak light was reflected from his gold scabbard furnishings, and from the gold wire that was looped and braided on his blue jacket. He walked slowly, forced to the pace by the tightness of his breeches, but looking languorous and confident. He avoided the puddles that still remained in the courtyard, jealous of the brilliant shine on his spurred boots. Smoke dribbled back from the man's cigar. He stepped over one of the fuses, then tapped ash onto a pile of shells. Sharp watched, disbelieving. The cavalryman walked on, disdaining his surroundings. Another cloud of smoke drifted up from his cigar, and then, with superb unconcern, the man tossed the cigar stub behind him onto the tangle of fuses. He disappeared into the keep. No one seemed to have noticed. The engineer officer who had been examining the fuses had gone. 
The sentries on the walls stared outwards. Two infantrymen who carried a great steaming pot over the yard were busy with their own thoughts. Sharp looked back at the piles of shells. Was it his imagination, or was there a small wisp of smoke coming from where the cigar had landed? It was just his imagination, he decided. He noticed that, despite the wound, he was gripping the bars of the window with his right hand. He uncurled his fingers. Some men walked beneath his window. They laughed loudly. It was not his imagination. The cigar stub was burning through to the powder core of the fuses. Smoke drifted up more thickly. Sharp froze. If he gave the warning, he would stay a prisoner. If he did not, there would be death and chaos, quite possibly his own death. But if he risked that, then the chaos would be on his side. He could use it to escape. He could forget the parole, he would be free, and his honor would be intact. The smoke was thickening now, rising up to drift eastward. An artilleryman crossed the yard from a magazine against the far wall. He passed within ten feet of the smoke, but noticed nothing. He was eating a hunk of bread and staring up at the sky, which threatened rain. There were men on the walls, on the keep's roof, yet none of them saw a thing. Sharp bit his lip. His left hand gripped the champagne. The smoke turned to fire. One moment there was a grey haze, the next there was the hiss of fuses and the sparks were shooting up from the fire that snaked along the white line. The gunner, the bread held to his mouth, stopped. He stared, unbelieving at the fire snakes. One disappeared into a pile of shells, would be eating at the first shell's fuse. And then the gunner shouted, pointed with his loaf and started to run. The shell exploded. It lifted the other shells into the air, fuses spinning, and then a second exploded, a third, and suddenly the courtyard was a maelstrom of fire and shell casing, and men were bellowing at each other to run, and Sharp went back from the window. There were fuses leading into the keep, and he'd just seen through the smoke a streak of bright fire dart into the massive stones. He backed slowly away. There was no safety in leaving the room. The stairway led only to the courtyard where the shells exploded. He had to stay in the room and survive whatever happened. He tipped the cot bed over, sheltering himself behind the straw mattress, and just as he had done so, the hill of Burgos Castle moved. Deep beneath the keep in the cellars and in the mine shafts that had been dug to oppose the British mines of the year before, the powder had been stacked. Barrel after barrel was down there, packed in the rock. And now the fire found it. It blew. It did not shatter outwards. There was more than enough powder to scythe the hilltop bare, to obliterate the walls, church, bastions, guns, and gates. But the rock-bound cellars acted as a giant mortar and hurled the blast upwards into the air until the flame spikes touched and pierced the low cloud. And still it went on, hurling stones and shells high into the air beyond the cloud and following with the rumbling, billowing, dark cloud that was fed by new blasts and pierced through by new flames as more stacks of powder were reached by the fire that destroyed the keep and thundered the sound miles out into the countryside. Sharp huddled against the wall. The bed seemed to thump on him. The air was like a great warm fist that pounded all about him and left only silence where there had been nothing but sound. He was deafened. He could feel shock after shock thudding the stone floor. He guessed that the shells were cracking open in the courtyard. And then there was a bigger blast, a thunder that pierced even his deafness, and he felt fragments spatter on the mattress that shielded him. Silence again. He was breathing dust. The thudding had stopped, but the room seemed to be shifting like the cabin of a ship underway. He stood up, pushing the bed away, and saw the air was filled with white fog. It was not smoke, but powdered lime shaken from the walls and ceiling which now hung suspended in the room and stung his eyes. He spat the dust out of his mouth. The bottle of champagne was still in his hand. He swilled his mouth with it, spat again then drank. The whole world seemed to be moving. The door was open, blown flat by the blast. The table had fallen, and he saw, yet did not understand, that the ink bottle was rolling back and forth on the floorboards like the weight of a pendulum. He went to the window. The room seemed to lurch as a ship lurched when caught by a sudden wind. He had seen Almeida after the explosion, and this reminded him of the Portuguese fortress. There was the same stench of roasted flesh the same fire and dust in the silence. 
The keep was a boiling cauldron of flame and smoke. He could not imagine how so much smoke could be roiled out of stone. There was a ringing in his ears, insistent and annoying. He hit the side of his head with his hand. A man screamed beneath him. His clothes were gone. His body was blackened, and blood showed on his back. The sound made Sharp aware that he could hear. Time to go, he thought. And the realization was so odd that he did not move. A magazine exploded somewhere and spewed a lance of flame into the boiling smoke. The floor shifted again. He heard a rumble to his right, felt the sudden shock of the floor tilting, a movement that made him drop the champagne and grip the window bar for support. A crack had appeared in the wall, a crack that widened as he watched. Jesus, the old houses built against the courtyard wall were slumping down. Go, he thought. Go. He frowned, turned, and slapped his waist to check his sword was in its slings. It was. Walking to the door was like walking the deck of a ship. He feared that even his footsteps might tip the precarious balance of the fragile house, that at any moment he would be felled by the falling masonry and collapsing floors. The building shuddered again. A man shouted outside, then another, and Sharp stepped over the threshold to see the young, cheerful guard lying dead. A shell had come through the landing window and blown him apart. Masonry rumbled. A crack sounded like a whiplash. He jumped recklessly down the rubble and dust-choked stairs. His uniform was thick with the white dust. Instinctively, as he reached the door to the courtyard, he began to beat it off, then stopped. It was as good a disguise as he could hope for. Masonry fell somewhere, provoking shouts, and Sharp knew that soon men would be in the castle who were not dazed, men who would begin the process of rescue and recovery. He hurried into the courtyard and turned left towards the gate, and saw there a knot of men who stared aghast into the glimpse of hell that had been the keep. He turned, he walked away from them, going towards the fire, but keeping the wall close to his right. He passed dead men, wounded men, men who cried, men who were past crying. The flesh smelt thick. He wished he'd kept hold of the champagne to clear the taste of dust and smoke from his mouth. Then a crash, a splintering, growing, hellish noise erupted to his right in the building where he'd been prisoner, and he had a glimpse of the walls falling, of roof beams coming like lances through the breaking stones. And then it was blotted by dust, and he was running, the stones falling. And he felt a massive blow on his leg that twisted him to his side, threw him down, and his mouth, nose, ears, and eyes were thick with the dust and the noise, and he was crawling blindly towards the light. He felt his leg. It seemed whole. He drew it up, pushed, and staggered to his feet. Someone shouted, but Sharp could barely help himself. He felt sick again, choking on dust, limping from the bruise on his leg. He went on. He was going away from the gate where the enemy were gathered, going ever closer to the fire. He could feel the heat, a scorching, terrible, searing heat that made him swerve back to his right, and there, in a tunnel of the wall, he saw daylight. He went down the tunnel, cannoning off the walls, his scabbard scraping the stone. At the far end there was a shattered door, and beneath it steps that led down to a ruined church that clung high on the rock hill of the castle. He sat on the steps. He had not quite gathered that he was free, that he was outside the fortress, that the wide world was spread before him, and that he was breathing warm, clean air. He wiped his eyes that were stinging with dust and stared at the view. The city was spread beneath him along the banks of the river Arlanzon. The spires of the great cathedral dominated the houses, and Sharp, blinking from the dust and smoke, saw that there were holes torn in the roof of the huge building, holes from which smoke came and that there was more smoke in the town, buildings burning, and he guessed that the shells had been blasted up and outwards to fall randomly on the city. He knew he must move. The castle hill fell two hundred steep feet to the houses. He stumbled down, falling twice, sliding one section in a scrabble of soil, loose stone, and pain. When he got up, he saw that the bandage on his right hand was soaked through with fresh, bright blood, Blood was sticky on his face, too. The wounds reopened. His leg felt as if it had been struck by a musket ball. He limped the last few yards to the shelter of an alleyway. A woman watched him from a window. There were shouts and screams in the city. He could hear the fires burning. Jesus! He spoke aloud. He was feeling dazed, his ears ringing. 
He could hardly remember leaving the castle. He leaned on the wall. The woman spat through the window. She would think he was a Frenchman. He walked down the alley that stank of the night soil that was indiscriminately thrown from the bedrooms. He knew he was free now, but he knew little else. He came to the plaza before the magnificent cathedral. He saw civilians running with buckets through the great doors, and he glimpsed, as he went forward, the glow of fires deep in the gloom inside. Then he looked right. A division of French troops had been forming in the plaza before beginning their march northeastwards. They looked now as if they'd been in a battle. Shells had fallen into their ranks, and the dead and wounded were scattered on the cobbles. Some screamed, some wandered, dazed. Others tried to help. Above him, the sky was dark with the smoke. Ashes fluttered in the air and fell soft as snow onto the shattered ranks. He suddenly felt alarm. He had escaped the castle, only to walk like a fool into a city of the enemy. He went back into an alley, leaned on the wall, and tried to make plans. Tried to force the ringing from his ears and sense into his head. A horse, for God's sake, a horse. What was it Hogan had once said to him? For some reason, the strangeness of the words had stuck. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. The Irish major was always saying odd things like that. Sharp supposed they were lines of poetry, but had not liked to ask. He felt sick again. He bent down, his back against the wall, and groaned. He should hide. He decided. He was in no state to steal a horse. There were footsteps to his right. He looked and saw men in the darkness of the alley. They wore no uniforms. They stared at him suspiciously. He straightened up. Inglés. The word was choked by the dust in his throat. The man closest to him carried a wooden mallet. He stepped forward, his face twisted with hatred. Sharp knew they took him for a Frenchman, and he shook his head. Inglés. He could not draw his sword with his bloody bandaged right hand. He tried, but the mallet struck him on the head. There was a rush of feet on the cobbles, hisses of anger and curses, and then dozens of boots and fists thumped into him. The mallet swung again, and he was dragged away, beaten, half insensible. The blood flowing from his opened wounds. They kicked him, dragged him deeper into the alley and into a small, foul courtyard. A man produced a long butcher's blade. Sharp tried to ward it off, felt the edge sear into his left hand. Then the mallet smashed onto his head again, and he knew nothing more. The French left Burgos that day, marching northeast and leaving the city with its great spire of smoke that drifted up as a mark of their retreat. It began to rain as they left, a steady rain that helped extinguish the fires in the city. It seemed the kind of rain that might last forever. The French would have liked to have held Burgos and to have forced Wellington to try once more to take the high fortress on its hill. But Wellington had marched his army to the north, into the hills which common wisdom said were impassable for an enemy. Wellington's army was passing the impassable hills, threatening to come south and cut off the French army in Burgos, cutting its supply lines. And so the French went backwards, back towards the hills about Vitoria, where other French armies would join them, and they could turn and offer battle. The British army saw the smoke rising from the city. They were far away. A few British cavalrymen, their horses smeared with mud, rode into the city and confirmed that the French were gone. They stayed long enough to water their horses and buy wine from an inn. Then the city abandoned by their enemy, its castle ruined, and nothing else in Burgos to hold their interest. They rode away. The war had come, taken its toll, and passed on. Chapter Eighteen. The British army left the pyre of smoke over Burgos far behind them. They marched in four great columns. At times, two columns would come close, joining for a river crossing before they split again and took their separate paths in the hills. Always, the order was speed: speed to get ahead of the enemy, speed to cut the road, speed to turn the French right flank, speed to meet the French before the enemy armies join to outnumber Wellington's men. And fighting against speed were the wagon wheels that broke, the horses that went lame, the sick who fell out on the road, the gun axles that broke, the rain that made the track slippery, the flooding of a stream making a ford become a rapid. 
Yet still they went on, hauling at guns, at wagons, beating the mules on, the infantry driving their weary legs to climb one more hill, cross one more valley, and ever into the teeth of wind and rain in the worst summer of memory. They had left their winter quarters with the promise of a fine, though late, summer, but now that they had reached the northern hills, the weather had broken into a miserable, cold enemy. Yet old soldiers had never seen an army march as well. The men marched as though the winds brought the smell of victory, and they pushed through difficulties that, in normal times, would have turned men back or caused hours of delay. If a ford was high, the cavalry drove their horses in to make a breakwater, and passed the infantry down the sheltered side, urging them on, telling them the frogs were waiting for the slaughter, telling them there was one more march and then the victory. They had been scenting that victory for days. Many had expected to fight at Burgos, but the plume of smoke which marked the French retreat had driven the army on another stage. It was rumoured the French would guard the crossings of the Ebro, the last great river line before the Pyrenees, but the French were nowhere to be seen when, on a cold, chill day, the columns crossed the river unopposed and heard at last the orders given for the swing south and east, the swoop down to the enemy. The columns closed up. A Spanish column stayed to the north, fending off any approach by the French troops on the Biscay shore. But the other columns merged about a single road so they could concentrate swiftly for battle. The infantry, as ever, had the worst of it. The road had to be left for the baggage, the guns, the cavalry, and so the infantry marched on the hills either side, the slopes thick with men and mules, the air noisy with their marching songs. That they had the energy to sing was astonishing, that they sang so well was more so, that they wanted to fight was obvious. Rumours had gone through the army that the enemy guarded a convoy of gold, that each man would be rich if he did his duty. And perhaps that rumour, more than pride, drove them on. They joked that the froggies were on the run now, that Johnny Frenchman would not stand till he was past Paris, that this army would march on and on and on till every man Jack in it had a Parisian girl on his elbow and a bag of gold in his hand, and the general, who would sometimes just sit on his horse and watch them pass, would feel his soul full of pride and love for these ranks that he led that marched in such spirits to a battle that would have some of them broken like bloody rag dolls on a Spanish field. Three nights after the Burgos explosion, Major Michael Hogan sat in the uncomfortable stable that was his billet. He was lucky, he knew, to have even this place to sleep. A lantern hung over his head, its light showing the map that was spread on a makeshift table made from an overturned buyer. A man sat opposite him, the man was a Jew named Rodriguez. He was a corn dealer who travelled with the army, unpopular with the quartermasters who dealt with him, suspected by them because of his rapacity to be sympathetic with the French. Why not, they said. Everyone knew the Spanish church hated the Jews. Surely, they reasoned, Rodriguez would have a better life if the French ruled in Spain. Hogan knew better. Rodriguez drove a harsh bargain, but so did every other corn factor who travelled with the army, Jewish or not. Yet this corn merchant, this despised man, had a genius of a memory and ears that seemed to hear the quietest whispers from far away. He talked now of one such whisper, and Hogan listened. A man broke into a convent, Rodriguez smiled slyly. That must have surprised the sisters. What kind of a man? Some say English, some say American, others say French. He was rescued from the partisans by the French. And you say? Rodriguez smiled. He was a thin man who wore his hair, summer and winter, beneath a fur hat. I say he was your man. He took the woman. He held up a hand to stop Hogan interrupting. But the news is not good, Major. Go on. He went to Burgos with the woman, but he was killed there. Killed? Rodriguez saw the look on Hogan's face and suspected rightly that the unnamed Englishman had been a friend of the Major's. There are a dozen stories, I tell you what I think. The corn merchant fidgeted with the coiled whip he always carried. It was not much of a weapon, but enough to deter the children who tried to steal from his carts. 
They say he was in the castle and that he killed a man. Then they say that he was treated with respect. Rodriguez shrugged. I don't know. What I do know is that he was still in the castle when it blew up. He died with the others. They found his body. Who can tell? It was difficult to tell what was a body in that place. Hogan said nothing for a while. He was wondering if it was true, but he had learned to trust Rodriguez, and so he feared that it must be so. He had heard that the explosion in the castle had been an accident that had taken the lives of scores of Frenchmen. But was it possible, he found himself wondering, that Sharp had engineered it? He could believe that. And the woman? La Puta Dorada? Rodriguez smiled. She went with the French army, escorted by lancers. Hogan thought of Wellington's fear that Sharp would break into the convent. It appeared he had done just that. What do people say about the convent? The Jew laughed. They say it must be the French, after only man rescued a French woman and went off with the French cavalry. So it was over, Hogan thought. All over, Sharp had failed. But it had been a better death than hanging, he reflected. So... What happens now, Major? No, we march. Either the French try to stop us or they don't. They will. Hogan nodded. In which case there'll be a battle. Which you'll win. Rodriguez smiled. And if you do, Major, what then? We'll pursue them to the frontier. And then? Hogan smiled. Rodriguez never asked for payment for information, at least not payment in gold. The Irishman tapped his map. A new supply port, there. Rodriguez smiled. The information was worth a small fortune. He would have men at that port, and warehouses ready before his competitors even knew that the British supplies no longer were being dragged up the long roads from Lisbon. Thank you, Major. He stood. Hogan saw Rodriguez to the door, safely past the sentries, and he leaned on the doorpost and watched the rain seethe in the light of the campfires. Sharp? Dead? He had thought that before, and been wrong. He stared into the eastern darkness, thinking of ghosts, knowing Sharp to be dead, yet not believing it. And in the morning, when the rain still fell, and the wind felt more like winter in Ireland than summer in Spain... The army marched on. They marched willingly, going towards the battle that would end the march, marching towards the city of Golden Spires. Vittoria. You eat? Sharp nodded. The girl spooned soup into his mouth, a thick, warm, tasty soup. What is it? Horse. Now sit up. The doctor's coming. I'm all right. You're not. You're lucky to be alive. Eat. His uniform hung against the wall, the uniform that had saved his life. Dozens of lone Frenchmen had been beaten to death in Burgos after the explosion, but Sharp, just as the knife was about to cut his uniform away, had been recognized as an English officer. The men had not been certain. They had argued, some saying that the man's overalls and boots were French, but other men were sure that the dark green jacket was British. The buttons, with their black crowns, decided the day. No Frenchman had crowns on his buttons, and so they let Sharp live. The girl laughed at him. Eat! Well, I'm trying. Both hands were bandaged. He was bruised all over. His head was bandaged. What day is it? Tuesday. What date? How do I know? Eat! This, he knew, was the house of the carpenter, who had hit him so effectively with a mallet. The man was eager to make amends, had given Sharp this room, had even sharpened the sword on a stone and propped it beside Sharp's bed. The girl was a housemaid, black-haired and plump, with a bright smile and a teasing manner. One of her eyes was blind, a white blankness where there should have been a pupil. Eat! The doctor came, a gloomy man in a long, stained black coat. He bled Sharp's thigh. He had raised his eyebrows on his first visit, scarcely believing the scars on Sharp's body. 
Beyond the doctor, through the window, Sharp could see the smoke still hazing the grey clouds above the castle. Rain was soft on the window. It seemed to have been raining ever since he had woken in this room. The doctor wiped the small cart and pulled the sheet down. Another two days, Major Vaughan. I want to go now. The man shook his head. You're weak, Major. You lost much blood. The bruises... He shrugged. Two days of Pedro's food and you'll be better. I need a horse. The French took them all. The doctor threw the cup full of blood into the fireplace and wiped the bowl on the skirts of his coat. There may be a mule for sale tomorrow at the market. There must be a horse there feeding me horse meat soup. That horse died in the explosion. The doctor spat on his lancet and wiped it on his cuff. I will come tomorrow if God wills it. He turned to go, but Sharp called him back. Senor! Sharp grimaced as he tried to sit up on the bolster. Did you ask about the Inquisitor, Doctor? I did, Senor. So? The Doctor shrugged. His house is at Vitoria. There was a time when the family had land throughout Spain, but now... He shrugged and hefted his small bag. Vittoria, that is all our priest knew. You will forgive me, Major. When he was alone, Sharp sat on the edge of the bed. He felt dizzy. He wondered how hard the blow on his head had been. It throbbed still, and the lump was like a hen's egg. He swore quietly. The rain fell. He pulled on the linen shirt that he'd worn ever since Elaine had given it to him at Salamanca. There was fresh blood on the collar. He put on the French overalls that he'd taken from her brother. The rip in the bib had been made by sharp sword. The tear had been mended, but he could still see how he had twisted the great blade when Larue fell. His head hurt as he leaned down and tugged on the big French cavalry boots. He felt better with the boots on. He stood and stamped his feet into comfort. His legs were stiff. There was a vast black bruise on his left thigh. The jacket felt good. He buttoned it from the crotch to his chin, forcing his bandaged hands to do the fiddly work. The fingers of his left hand were not wrapped, and with them he picked up the sword. It jangled as he buckled the snake clasp. He had no shako. He had nothing now but the clothes he wore and the sword that hung at his side. He had no cloak, no razor, no tinderbox. No telescope. He had a secret that could win the war for France that he must take to Wellington. What are you doing? Consuela, the maid, stood in the doorway. I'm going. You can't. You're weak as a kid and go on to bed. He shook his head stubbornly. I'm going. They tried to stop him. A gaggle of women at the foot of the stairs shouting at him and fluttering like the nuns in the convent. He thanked them, pushed gently past them, and went into the yard of the house. The yard was filled with wood shavings. The rain was cold on his face. You mustn't go. I have to go. He had no horse, so he would walk. It was hard at first, his bruised muscles refusing to make the stride easy. He crossed the great plaza, still smeared with the marks of the exploding French shells, past the cathedral that had been saved from the flames, and the townspeople watched him silently. He looked an odd figure, a soldier with a slashed head, black eyes, walking stiffly like a man going to his death. He had not been shaved this day, and he thought for a moment of stopping at one of the barbers who waited for trade by their chairs in the street. Then remembered he had no money. He crossed the Alençon, seeing the water pitted by the rain, and already the water was cold where it had soaked through his uniform. Senor, senor! He turned. Consuela, the half-blind maid, was running after him. He stopped. She pushed a package wrapped in oil paper into his hands. If you must go, Major, take this. What is it? Cold chicken, cheese. She smiled. Go with God. He kissed her on the cheek. Thank you, Consuela. He walked eastwards on the great road, following the French army that had long gone. Walking to a war. He stopped that afternoon in an orchard. He ate half of the chicken and wrapped the rest of the food in the paper. Then, every muscle aching, he went to the stream that ran through the thick orchard grass. He knelt at its edge. He used the fingers of his left hand to undo the bandage on his right. 
It came stickily away, the last tug hurting like fire and ripping the crust from the wound. He hissed with the sudden pain and thrust his hand into the water. He flexed his fingers. He watched the blood dilute and go, wispy red, downstream. He spread his fingers wide, let the water flow into the cut, then took off the bandage that covered the wound made by the knife. The cut was on the ball of his left hand. It, too, bled into the water. He left his hands in the stream until they were numb. He unwrapped the bandage from his head and dipped his skull into the water, holding his breath to let the stream flow about his hair. He drank. He took his head out, flicked the wet hair back with a jerk, and saw the horsemen. He stayed still. He was on all fours. The horsemen were on the great road, hunched beneath their cloaks against the rain. They were partisans, and they rode to battle. Sharp could see corks stuck in their musket muzzles, see the rags wrapped about the locks, see the sabres protruding from the wet cloaks. He could have called out, he could have shouted for help and asked for a horse, but he did not. The men were fifty yards away, visible through the twisting trunks of the stunted apple trees, and Sharp had seen their leader. He had seen the black beard that grew up to the high cheekbones, the small eyes, the broad blade of the polax on the man's shoulder. It was El Matarife. Sharp stayed rock still as they passed, then settled back on his haunches. El Matarife was following the French, hoping to be present when the armies met, and El Matarife was now between Sharp and his goal. He stayed by the stream, and the rain fell on him as he thought what to do. He could only press on, he decided, and when he'd waited long enough for the partisans to be well out of sight, he stood, groaned with pain, and went back to the muddy road. He walked. He seemed alone on the road. The fields either side still showed the damage caused by the trampling French army. Sharp walked on the crushed crops, because they gave firmer footing than the slick, muddy road. He went through small villages, always checking first that no horsemen lingered at a wine house. By dusk, he was in a wide land, no houses or horsemen in sight, with the road stretching damp before him towards the darkening east. The rain blocked his view of the hills that he knew should be on the horizon. He was looking for shelter, hoping for a farm or, at the least, a bush to keep the worst of the rain from him. There was nothing. He walked on, trying to force his pace to the fast rifleman's march, persuading himself that by ignoring the pain it would go away. His feet squelched in his boots, and rain trickled into his eyes. He heard a horse, and turned to see a single horseman a hundred yards behind him. He cursed himself for not looking before, though there would have been nowhere to hide in this bare land, even with ten minutes more warning. It was possible he knew that the man was simply a farmer on his way home, but the horse was bigger and stronger than a farmer's mount. Sharp suspected it was one of El Matarife's men, left behind for some reason on the road. Sharp gripped his sword handle. His right hand was still stiff because of the gouging of the brass telescope tube. He saw the horseman spur into a trot, then the man waved, and suddenly Sharp was laughing and stumbling back down the road. Angel! Angel! The boy was laughing. He jumped from Carbine's back and put his arms round Sharp. Major! He was slapping Sharp's back. You're here! Where did you come from? Your face! Angel took off his cloak and insisted on putting it round Sharp's shoulders. How the hell did you find me? Sharp took the proffered flask of wine and tipped it to his lips. It felt good. Angel had done no more than follow orders. Major Hogan had told him not to leave Sharp, and so, when the lancers took Sharp south, Angel had followed. He had hidden himself outside Burgos, watched the great road to see if Sharp was taken eastwards. The boy had seen the explosion. Afterwards, when the last of the French had left the city and he had seen no prisoners with them, he had tried to get news of Sharp. They said you were dead. Who did? The people who worked for the French. There was one English prisoner in the castle, but the building he was in collapsed. Sharp grinned. I got out first, so I looked in the ruins. Angel shrugged. Nothing. Then El Matarife came, so I eat again. What did he want? There was a rumor that the French left their wounded in the hospital. It wasn't true. Angel nodded up the road. He went on. I saw him.
The boy grinned. So now what? We find Wellington. Sharp looked at Carbine and suddenly knew that everything would be all right. He laughed aloud, his tiredness forgotten. We're going to win the bloody war, Angel. You and I, just you and I. He patted the patient, strong horse. Carbine would take him to Wellington. He would vindicate himself, and he laughed at the thought. Do everything that Helen wanted him to do, but with his honor intact. We're going to win the goddamn war. The army tried to sleep. Some men succeeded. Others listened to the rain on canvas, to the owls calling in the valleys, and from the hills the howling of wolves that made the horses nervous. Children cried and were soothed by their mothers. An hour after midnight, the rain stopped, and slow and ragged, the sky cleared. Stars showed for the first time in weeks. The wind was still cold, shivering the pickets who stared into the shadows and thought of the morning. The bugles called the army awake when the stars were still bright. The breakfast was cold. The tents were collapsed and folded. Men muttered and shivered and thanked God it was not raining. Sufficient unto this day was the evil that awaited them. Captain Dalembor, stumbling through the mud and long grass with a mug of tea in his hand, shouted into the darkness for his company. Sergeant Harper's voice answered. The captain stood shivering by the small fire. Thank God it's not raining. Hey, Harper looked pleased. The colonel says it's true. Might as well get it over with. The huge sergeant was rolling up his blanket. The South Essex had marched without tents. Captain Dalembor, who had never fought in a real battle, was nervous. They reckon they're waiting over the hills, but not far away, eh? Harper laughed. So there'd be a fight, yes? So they say. With all the trimming, sir, it'll be a grand day for it if it doesn't rain. I'm sure we'll acquit ourselves nobly, sergeant. We always do, sir. Harper was strapping the blanket to his back. Farrell, the roar of Harper's voice made Dalembor jump. Sarge, a plaintive voice sounded from the darkness. Get up, you Protestant bastard! We've got a battle to fight. Some men laughed. Some men groaned. Harper grinned reassuringly at Captain Dalembor. The lads will be all right, sir. Don't you fret. Captain Dalembor quite understandably was fretting whether he would be all right. He smiled. I've finished the tea, Sergeant. You're a grand man, sir. So you are. I thank you. Harper tilted the mug and swallowed what was left in great gulps. Will you be a betting man, sir? I am. I have a feeling we'll be seeing an old friend today. The sergeant said it comfortably, his voice utterly confident. Captain Dalembor, who had come to trust Sergeant Harper, sighed. He knew that the Irishman had never accepted Sharp's death, and the captain feared what would happen when it dawned on Harper that the major was truly dead. There were stories that before he met Sharp, Harper had been the wildest man in the army, and Dalembor feared he would become so again. The officer chose his words carefully. This was the first time that Harper had spoken of Sharp to him since the hanging, and Dalembor did not want to be too savage in breaking the Irishman's hopes. What if you don't see him, Sergeant? I've been thinking about it, sir. So I have, sir. Harper thumped his shako into shape with a fist. Isabella was rolling her own blanket beside him. Harper smiled. There is no way he knows he would hang him. Not after Sharp saved his life, sir. And there is no way the frogs can kill him, so he has to be alive. He'll be back, sir. And if we're in a fight, that's where he'll be. A pound says I'm right. Dalembor grinned. You haven't got a pound. I will tonight, though. Farrell, you heathen bastard, get up! Harper looked back to his officer. A pound? You need your money, Harps. You're getting married. Christ, don't talk about it. Harper sounded gloomy. I'll still lay the pound, sir. I accept. In the valley, a trumpet sounded. In the darkness, thousands of men prepared themselves. Behind them was an epic march through the hills, and beyond the next hill was Vittoria. They marched before dawn. The columns splitting again, but all going eastwards, going towards the enemy. The columns twisted through the misted valleys, going towards Vittoria. Going towards the treasure of an empire, and going to battle.
Chapter 19 The rain at last had stopped, and the dawn of Monday, June the 21st, 1813, brought a dazzling, blinding sun that lanced over the Pamplona Valley, over the spires of Vittoria, and into the eyes of the few British horsemen who had climbed the hills to the west of the city. They could see nothing of the French beneath them. The wide valley in which Vittoria stood was shrouded in mist, a mist that was thickened by the smoke of myriad campfires. The watching horsemen appeared to be alone in a wild, dazzling landscape. The sky was brilliantly clear, the valleys were hidden by mist, and the east was filled with the searing glory of the rising sun. Yet to north and south the British horsemen could see the successive ridges of the hills etched in startling clarity against a pale sky. After the days of rain and low cloud it seemed almost indecent to be fighting on such a day as this. Yet fight they must, for, by the will of Marshal Jourdain and General Wellington, 140,000 men had come to this misted plain, from which, like a strange island in a white sea, the spires of Victoria's cathedral jutted golden in the sun. From the west, in the valleys that were mysterious with shredding mist and shadow, the British army marched. They were cold from the night, and few men spoke or sang as they marched waiting for the sun and the smell of powder to warm their spirits. In every company the sibilant hiss of stone on steel could be heard. The sharpening stones were handed round, and the men honed their bayonets as they marched, and prayed they would not need to use them. They had marched across the roof of Spain, coming from Portugal to this place, where, like a knife put to her throat, they threatened the great road that was France's lifeline in Spain. The men knew, because their officers had told them, that a battle was imminent. Some, who had stood in the battle line before, tried not to think of what was to come, while others, who had never before seen an enemy army, wondered if they would live to remember the sight. Some, remembering the long, hard marches in the high, inhospitable hills, feared defeat, for if this army was broken today and forced to retreat, they would face days of being hunted in the high valleys by the long-bladed French horsemen. Wellington, this day, commanded Spanish, Portuguese, and British troops. With him, too, was the King's German Legion. They marched towards the Valley of Vittoria, and with them went their women and children, who would wait at the field's edge while their men fought. With the army, too, were sutlers and merchants, salesmen of patent medicines, friars and priests. There were whores, beggars, horse thieves, and politicians, and like a lumbering, ponderous beast, the whole great mass curled and heaved itself towards the valley, towards Vittoria, and towards a fight. The French were confident this day. Their enemies had an edge in numbers, it was true, but numbers were not all in warfare. The French had picked their battlefield, chosen where to stand and they defended their chosen place with the greatest concentration of artillery that had ever been assembled in Spain. To the north of their position was the river Zadora, and to the south the heights of Puebla, and the constriction of river and highland would force the British to a frontal attack in the valley that would bring them into the face of the great guns that, in this morning of drifting mist, looked like fearsome monsters in wait for their victims. The guns that gave the French such confidence were placed on a low north-to-south ridge called the Arineth Hill. The French high command, knowing that soldiers above all humankind are superstitious, had spread the story of the Arineth Hill, and the story on this dawn of waiting added to the French confidence. The hill was a place of ill luck for the English. Centuries before this dawn, on a day of searing heat, three hundred English knights, marauding for plunder, had been surrounded by a Spanish army on the Arineth Hill. The English had not dared take off their armour, for then they would have been meat for the Spanish crossbows, and so they fought the day long, roasting like pigs, their tongues swelling with thirst, their eyes blinded with sweat, and time after time the Spanish came up the hill to be thrust down with the long, heavy swords, or beaten back with the maces and clubs. The stolid clay of the hill was slick with blood and loud with the screams of horses and men. The English refused to surrender. They fought till the last man was choking in his own blood, and the last banner was trampled in the gore. For the English, then, this hill was a place of ill luck, and the French knew it. 
There was even more cause for the French to hope, for the war's tide was at last turning in France's favour again. The Empire had reeled from the defeat in Russia, had waited in trepidation for news that the Russians and the Prussians were marching into northern France, but just two days since had come the glorious news. The Emperor had won his campaign. The bells had been rung in Vittoria, bells that carried the message to all the troops bivouacking on the plain. The news followed the clamour, news of two battles at Bautzen and Lutzen, battles that had repelled both the northern enemies who had now signed a truce. Soon, the news promised, Bonaparte would come south. Only the British were left in the field, and Bonaparte would come down and drive them in ragged defeat from Spain, and the tricolour would rule again from the Straits of Gibraltar to the edge of the steppes. The waiting French were confident. The river here was rich in bridges, some going back to the Romans who had built their own city on this plain. Yet none of the bridges had been destroyed. Let the British cross them, the French reasoned, and that way the gunners would know where to fire, and the redcoats would walk into the killing ground, and the blasting, tearing canister would make each bridge into a blood-soaked arch of masonry to drip red into the Zadora. Yet, if the French engineers had not blown the bridges, they had not been idle. They had worked for two days on a strange contraption on Victoria's western wall, it was built high on the rampart, so it looked over the suburbs and orchards, towards the great plain where the army waited for battle. The engineers had built tiers of seats, so that the women who followed the French army could watch this French victory in comfort. To those seats the women came, and there, too, came the sellers of lemonade, pastries, and fruit. The French were confident enough to order Victoria's largest, best hotel to prepare a victory feast for this evening. Even now, as the mist lifted and the British came towards the guns, the cooks were at work. The French were confident enough to send troops away from the battlefield. Just that morning, a whole division marched north on the great road, back towards France. And with the division went a convoy of heavy wagons loaded with the treasures of the Escorial, Spain's royal palace. What was left in Vittoria was worth far more, but the French needed to make a start, and they were sure that they could beat off Wellington's attack and escort the rest of the plunder safely to the border. And, as if to make up for the paintings, tapestries, and furniture that had gone north, a smaller convoy had come south, bringing five million golden francs to give the army its arrears of pay. The wagons of coin were put into the baggage park. The coins would be paid after the battle. A hundred and forty thousand men had come to one place for the purpose of battle. The sun burned the valley's mist away, and those British horsemen who had climbed the western hill saw, beneath them, the might of France drawn up in its battle lines. They saw the guns. They saw the ranks of men waiting beneath their splendid banners and glinting eagles. As yet no cannon or musket smoke drifted to hide the glory that was an army in array. The river beneath its bridges sparkled silver in the dawn. The fields, where they had not been trampled by the soldiers, were bright with poppies and cornflowers. A kingdom was at stake, and a battle to be fought. The French headquarters, strangely empty now that the generals were on the plain, were high on the hill that rose to Victoria's cathedral. On the topmost floor of the headquarters building, in a large plain room that looked west towards the battlefield, a lone man worked at papers spread on a huge table. Pierre Ducot had worked all night, yet the sleeplessness had not lessened his efficiency. He sorted papers, some going into a great leather travelling chest, others into a sack for burning. Though he had told no one, Pierre Ducot planned for defeat. He had considered going north with the convoy that had left before dawn, but there were rumours that the British had sent part of their army to cut the road, and there would be more safety, Ducot decided, in staying with the army. Better, he thought, to face defeat with the main army than with the single division that had gone towards San Sebastian. He was not certain why he was sure of defeat. It was, perhaps, that he admired Wellington. The English general had a mind of fine calculation that appealed to Ducot, who did not believe that the vain, glorious marshals of France had the measure of the Englishman. The Emperor, now he was different. He would out-calculate and out-fight any man. But the Emperor was not yet in Spain, nor was it certain that he would come. 
The Emperor had won a great victory in the North, and his enemies had signed a truce. Yet if Wellington won today, then the victory could encourage the other enemies of France to fight again. And if... And Ducot loved the ifs of the future that he explored so ruthlessly. The Northern War recommenced. Then the treaty would be needed. He had the treaty now. Last night a messenger from the Inquisitor had delivered letters to Ducot, letters that he now kept in a haversack attached to his belt. They were letters from eminent men of Spain, from soldiers and churchmen, politicians and aristocrats, lawyers and merchants, and the letters all spoke of the desirability of peace with France. For the good of trade, for the good of the church, for the good of Spain's empire, and above all for the glory of Spain, the letters encouraged Ferdinand VII to accept a peace treaty. The Inquisitor, Ducot granted, had performed a wonderful piece of work, and now Ducot knew the Inquisitor was coming to ask a favour. He heard the footsteps on his stairs, waited for the knock on his door, shouted in answer, and leaned back in his chair. The skirts of the Inquisitor's cassock bore two white smears of dust where he had knelt in his morning prayer. His dark face was heavy as though he too had spent a sleepless night. He glanced out of the window to where the army waited for battle and sat opposite Ducot. You received the letters? I received the letters. The Inquisitor waited as though seeking approval for his work. When it did not come, he gestured abruptly. Your soldiers are confident. I imagine the British are too, Ducot said dryly. In truth, he had been astonished by the surge of morale in the French army. The news of the Emperor's victories had filled them with a the desire to do in Spain what Napoleon had done in the north. Victory for you today, the Inquisitor said, would make the treaty unnecessary. For the moment, Ducot said, but I would not be so certain of our victory, father. He stood and walked towards the window. On a table beside it, in a small bowl, he kept breadcrumbs that he now put on the ledge for the birds. It has been my misfortune to spend much of my life with soldiers. They are boastful creatures, noisy, crude, and unthinking. They believe in victory, Father, because they cannot bear the thought of defeat. He turned from the window and stared at the priest. I do not think your work will prove to be wasted, but unrewarded. Your reward, Ducot said as he walked back to his table, is Spain's glory and the survival of the Inquisition. I congratulate you. You also, I believe, have the Marquesa's wagons safely locked in your courtyard. He said the last words with heavy mockery. The money, Father Acha spoke uncomfortably, is not legally ours. True, but it is not my fault if you cannot keep a woman locked in a nunnery. The Inquisitor said nothing for a few seconds. From the window ledge came the small, scratching sounds of beaks and claws. From much further away, made tiny by the distance, came the thin call of a trumpet. The Inquisitor brushed at the dust on his cassock. If there is to be peace between our two countries, then there will also have to be diplomatic relations. True? I have hopes that in those relations I might be of further use to you. Ducot said nothing. He had expected the Inquisitor to offer him a threat, that unless the Marchesa was arrested, he would betray the proposed treaty's existence to the enemy. Indeed, Ducot had been prepared for that threat, and would have met it with the death of this priest. Instead, though, the Inquisitor was offering a bargain of a different kind. Go on. Ducot said. There will be a new beginning in Spain. The Inquisitor seemed to be gaining in confidence as he spoke. There will be a need for new men, new advisers, new leadership. With wealth behind me, Major, I can rise to that challenge. But not if the wealth is tainted. Not if a woman is challenging me in the courts or spreading rumors in the chanceries of Europe. If you let me rise as I intend to rise, Major, then in the years to come you will find France as a friend in the Spanish court. Ducot liked the suggestion. He liked such an excursion into the far future, the promise that, in a new Europe, the Inquisitor would be his informant and ally. He shrugged. I cannot have her arrested. 
I don't ask you to. From far away came a sound like thorns burning. The Inquisitor looked out of the window, but Duco dismissed the musketry. They're clearing their barrels, nothing more. He stroked his finger down a quill. You want to kill her? No. The sharpness of the reply made Duco look up. No. She will have made her own will. If she dies, then her inheritors become my enemy. No. The Inquisitor frowned. She must go to a convent. She must learn the humility of religion. Duco smiled thinly. You failed once? Not again. Perhaps not. Duco sounded dubious, but he reflected that Richard Sharp was dead and could not repeat his impudent rescue of the woman. Sharp's death had pleased Duco. He had been given nightmares by his memory of the fight in Burgos Castle, of the battered, beaten, bleeding rifleman suddenly roaring his challenge and turning the room into a shambles. Yet Sharp had died in the explosion, and that fact gave Duco some small happiness. Duco looked at the priest. Yet it is not the duty of the Emperor's forces to put women into convents? I don't ask that. Then what do you ask? Just this. The Inquisitor leaned forward and put on the table a piece of paper. That you sign a pass allowing those men into the city today. The paper was a list of names. It was headed by the name of the slaughterman, El Matarife, and Duco knew that the others would be members of his band. There were thirty names. What do you expect of them? The Inquisitor shrugged. Both victory and defeat will bring chaos to the city. Within chaos there is opportunity. A slight hope, I would have thought. God is with us. Ah! Duco smiled. It was a pity he was not with your brother in the mountains. He took a clean piece of paper, uncapped his ink, and wrote swiftly. Will you want these men to carry weapons in God's service? Yes. Duco wrote that the bearers of this paper were servants of the Diocese of Vittoria and were to be allowed with their weapons into the city. When it was written, he stamped it with the seal of King Joseph, then pushed it across the table. I have your word that these men will not bear arms against our forces? You have my word, unless your forces defend her. And you will ask nothing more of me in this matter? Nothing more. Then I wish you well, father. Duco watched the man go, and when he was alone again, he walked to the window, stepping gently so as not to frighten the sparrows on the window ledge, and he could see, far on the plain, the waiting French army. He frowned. It was not right, he thought, that the fate of nations and the affairs of a great empire should be left to the boastful, childish bravery of soldiers. Victory this day would mean the treaty might not be needed, and all this fine work wasted. Yet Duco did not believe in a French victory today. He almost, and he acknowledged it only to himself, wished for a French defeat. For then, in the chaos of a shattered kingdom, he would produce the treaty as a diplomatic triumph and save France. He would show the soldiers, the foolish, vain, brave soldiers, that their power was as nothing to the subtle mind of a clever, calculating man. He turned from the window. He had no more duties to do, nothing now to engage him except to wait for the lottery of the day. So, on this day of sunshine and battle, Duco slept. The Marquess of Wellington, Generalissimo of the Allied Army in Spain, looked at his watch. It showed twelve minutes past eight. We shall dine at the usual hour this night, gentlemen. His aides smiled, not sure if he was joking. They had come with him to the lower slopes of the western hills and could see, two miles to the east, the dark line of the French guns. The general looked to his right where the great road came from a defile, and he watched on the river's far bank a column of infantry begin climbing the slopes of the Puebla Heights. The column was led by Spanish troops, who would this day have the honor of first engaging the enemy. He snapped the watch shut. Gentlemen, his tone was distant, almost sour. 
I wish you all joy of the day. The Battle of Vittoria had begun. Chapter 20 The guns, the great French guns, the guns that were the Emperor's love and the weapons most feared by France's enemies, fired. The sound died and the smoke drifted. The French had shot at no target. They had merely warmed the barrels and watched the fall of the round shot in the killing ground. As yet the battle had no pattern. Some Spanish troops clawed their way up the Puebla Heights and fought the French skirmishers on the steep slope. But no infantry and cavalry had appeared on the plain to become meat for the gunners, who now had the range perfectly judged. The smoke from the cannons drifted southwards, dissipating in the small breeze. The ladies, who sat on the tiers of seats built by the French engineers on Victoria's wall, felt faintly disappointed that the sound had stopped. La Marquesa climbed to the topmost tier. She smiled at the wife of a cavalry colonel, knowing that the woman eagerly spread gossip about her. Your husband's piles are better, dear Jeannette, or is he riding to battle in a cart again? She did not wait for an answer, but climbed on upwards, then waited as her maid spread cushions on the bench. She felt in her reticule for some coins and nodded towards one of the pastry sellers. I want some of the lemon pastries. My lady, she sat. She carried a small ivory spyglass. There was little to be seen on the plain. The killing ground was hidden from her beyond the Arinet's hill. On a lower ridge that was closer to the city, she could see troops drawn up in close order. Over their heads floated the great purple and white banner that told her they were King Joseph's household guards. She wondered where General Verigny was. He had left her eagerly, exhilarated at the thought of battle. With victory this day, he assured her, Pierre Ducot would be defeated. Joseph would keep the Spanish throne, and La Marquesa's wagons could be taken from the Inquisitor. Hélène had smiled at her lover. And what if we lose today? Lose? We can't lose. Just days before, she reflected, the French army had expected nothing but retreat and the abandonment of Spain. Suddenly, with the volatility brought by news of Napoleon's victories, the army was replete with confidence. Today, they were sure they would revenge themselves on Wellington. It was also unexpected. At Burgos, she had tried to persuade Richard Sharp to betray his honour in order to defeat Ducot's scheming. She wondered whether Sharp would have signed the parole, then dismissed the thought because he was dead and the question was irrelevant. Instead, King Joseph was fighting for his throne, and victory today would mean an end of bribing Spaniards for favours. France would crush Spain again. The world would watch an empire rear back to greatness. A captain in the green and pink uniform of General Farini's regiment appeared at the bottom of the steps. He had one arm in a sling and one eye bandaged. He limped. He could not fight this day, and he had been ordered to attend on La Marquesa instead. It was typical of General Farini, La Marquesa thought, to make sure that her escort was of an unbelievable ugliness. She raised her fan, caught his eye, and smiled as he joined her. You're looking for me, Captain? Ah, not we all, my dear lady. He bowed over her hand, kissed the gloved fingers, and smiled. Captain Sumier, at your obedient service. He really was extraordinarily ugly, with a face like a grumpy toad. Do sit down, Captain. You must be desolated not to be fighting today. There'll be other days, my lady, but this one is yours. How can a man regret such a thing? So prettily said. A lemon pastry? She sent the maid for more, and ordered wine to be brought from her coach. How did you fetch your wounds, Captain? Falling from the balcony of a lady, her husband objected. No doubt, La Marquesa thought, at his wife's egregious taste. She waved her fan at the battlefield. You must tell me what is happening, Captain. She could see the small clouds of musket smoke on the Puebla Heights. Captain Sommier borrowed her glass stared through it for a few seconds, and delivered himself of the opinion that Wellington was attacking on the heights because he dared not attack on the plain. But if they take the hills, she paused as her maid brought her the fresh pastries and wine, won't they have to come down to the plain? Oh, indeed, my lady, how very true. 
And what happens then? We beat them with the guns. Somia grinned, showing long, yellow teeth. As simple as that? Somia smiled. War is simple. No wonder men like it so much. She smiled. Perhaps Wellington will do something you don't expect. Captain Somia shook his head. He subscribed to the view commonly held in the French army, a view he stated now with manly certainty to reassure this nervous, beautiful, wide-eyed woman. Wellington can't attack. He puts up a reasonable defense, my lady, but he can't attack. You were at Assaye? Assaye? She did not enlighten him. Algaum? He shrugged. She smiled. Salamanca? Somia smiled. These are most excellent pastries, my lady. I'm so glad you like them, and I'm so looking forward to your enlightenment today, Captain. It's so rare to watch a battle with a guide beside one. Somia had been told by his general that the Marchesa was intelligent and well informed. He rather feared that he would be enlightened this day. You're comfortable, my lady? Eminently. She turned from him and trained the glass on the Puebla Heights. She could see nothing of interest. The battle was being fought below the skyline. She hoped, she hoped passionately, for a French victory this day, or else the wealth that she had accumulated so carefully and with such good planning would be lost. She remembered her lover's certainty and took heart that Captain Sommier was also so replete with assurance. It seemed that the French army was sure of their coming triumph. No one had ever beaten Wellington in battle, but neither had Wellington ever fought an army commanded by Marshal Jourdain. She ate her pastry, accepted a glass of wine, and hoped for victory. Her hope that was devoutly shared this day by Don Jose, by the grace of God, the King of Castile, of Aragon, of the two Sicilies, of Jerusalem, of Navarre, of Granada, of Toledo, of Valencia, of Galicia, of Mallorca, of Minorca, of Seville, of Sardinia, of Corsica, of Cordoba, of Murcia, of Santiago, of the Algarves, of Algeciras, of Gibraltar, of the Canary Islands, of the East and West Indies, of the Ocean Islands, Archduke of Austria, Duke of Burgundy, of Brabant and of Milan, Count of Habsburg, Tyrol and Barcelona, Sire of Biscay and of Molina. The titles were ones he had given to himself. His younger brother, who was the Emperor of France, merely called him Joseph Bonaparte, King of Spain and the Indies. If he lost today's battle, he would be King of Nothing. Which was why, as the sun rose higher and the guns waited, Joseph Bonaparte was troubled by the evident success that Wellington's troops were having on the Puebla Heights. He expressed his concern to his military commander, Marshal Jourdain, who merely smiled. Let the British have the heights, sir. Uh, let them? King Joseph, a kindly, anxious man, looked worriedly at his military commander. Jourdain's horse was restless. The marshal calmed it. They want the heights, sir, so they can march safely through the defile beneath. And that's where I want them. If the British came from the defile where the river left the plain, then they would be marching towards his great guns. He smiled at Joseph. If they come from the west, sir, they're beaten. Jourdain hoped to God he was right. He had planned on a British attack from the west, and when the cannons had smeared the killing ground with British dead, he would release the cavalry to become the first of France's marshals to defeat Wellington. He did not care about the heights. No man there could influence the battle on the plain. The British could take every damned hill in Spain, so long as they marched into his guns afterwards. He could almost taste the victory. There was only one place that worried Marshal Jourdain, and that was the flat land north of the river. If Wellington did not attack from the west, but instead tried to outflank the plain by marching about the French right, then Jourdain would have to turn his battle line and recite his guns. He looked anxiously northwards to the land across the river where the wind stirred the crops in long, pale, rippling waves. Two marsh harriers flew above the trout-rich Zadora, gliding out of sight behind the hill that hid the river's bend. He had not fortified that hill. He wondered if Napoleon would have put men there. No, 
No, he must not have doubts. He must behave as if he knew exactly what would happen, as if he was controlling the enemy as well as his own army. He made himself smile. He made himself look confident. He complimented the king on his tailor, and tried not to think of British troops coming from the north. Let them come from the west. Pray God from the west. Sir! Sir! A chorus of voices sounded. Fingers pointed west towards the defile that was still deep shadow. Sir! I see it! Jourdain spurred forwards. From the defile, marching towards the small village that lay before the Arinets Hill, marching on to the great killing ground dominated by the French guns, were British infantry. Their colours were flying. They marched like parade soldiers towards their deaths. We've got him! We've got him! By God! Jourdain slapped his thigh. So Wellington was not being clever. He was coming straight on, and that was what Jourdain wanted. Straight on to death and glory to the Emperor. He spurred his horse forward, waving his plumed hat at the artillerymen. Gunners, wait! The linstocks were lit. In each of the great guns, more than a hundred of them, the priming tubes had pierced the powder bags and waited for the fire. King Joseph rode alongside his marshal. Joseph was terrified of his younger brother's displeasure, and the terror showed on his face. If he lost this battle, he would be a king no more, and to win it he had to see Wellington beaten. Joseph had witnessed the British army fight at Talavera, and he had seen how their infantry had snatched victory from certain defeat. But Marshal Jourdain had seen more. He had fought as a private in the French army that went to help the American revolutionaries. He had seen the British defeated, and he knew he would see it again. He beamed at the king, the emperor's brother. You have a victory, sir. You have a victory. Are you sure? Look. He waved his hand at the empty north, then to the troops that spread out before his guns. You have a victory. It was the last moment that men could look at the field and see what happened. The last moment before the smoke of the guns hid the struggle. Jourdain drew his saber, the steel bright as the sun, and swept it down. The guns began. The defile where the great road entered Vitoria's plain was crowded. Troops waited to be ordered forward. Wounded from the heights of Puebla had been brought to the road. Surgeons, their aprons already gleaming red, tried to work their saws and blades as men crowded the narrow verges waiting to go towards the gunfire that had suddenly started. Men joked about the sound of the French guns. They joked because they feared them. Young drama boys, their voices unbroken, watched the veterans and tried to take comfort from their calmness. Young officers sitting on expensive horses wondered whether glory was worth this nervousness. Staff officers, their horses' flanks already white with sweat, galloped along the columns looking for generals and colonels. The colours, untouched in the defile by any wind, hung heavy on staffs. The first battalions were already on the plain. The first wounded were already dragging themselves back towards the surgeons. Men broke from the ranks to go down to the river and fill their canteens with water. Some had prudently saved their ration of wine or rum. It was better, they said, to go into battle with alcohol inside. An Irish regiment, their red coats faded and patched to show their long service in Spain, knelt to a chaplain of a Spanish regiment who blessed them. Made the sign of the cross above them, while their women prayed anxiously behind. Their colonel, a Scottish Presbyterian, sat in his saddle and read the twenty-third psalm. Some Highland troops were climbing the Puebla heights, going to take over from the Spaniards. The sound of the pipes, wild as madness, came to the defile, mixed with the roar of the French guns. Men asked each other what was happening, and no one knew. They waited, feeling the warmth coming into the day, and they listened to the battle sound and prayed that they would live to hear the sound of victory. They prayed to be spared the surgeons. At the rear of the column, where the women and children waited for the day's lottery of widowhood to be drawn, and where the local villagers stared wide-eyed at the strange, huge tribe that was packed into their valley. Two horsemen reined in. One of the two men, a tall, dark-haired, scarred man, shouted at a group of soldiers' women who sat at the river's edge. Which division is this? A woman who was suckling a baby looked up at the rifleman who had shouted the question. Second. Where's the fifth? Christ knows.
which answer sharp reflected he deserved. He spurred Carbine forward. Lieutenant! Lieutenant! A lieutenant of infantry turned. He saw a tall, sun-tanned man on a horse. The man wore a tattered uniform of the 95th Rifles. At his hip was a sword, which seemed to suggest that the unshaven man was an officer. Sir? The lieutenant sounded tentative. Where's Wellington? I think he's over the river. Fifth Division? On the left, sir, I think. Are you the right? I think so, sir. The lieutenant sounded dubious. Sharp turned his horse. The defile was jammed with men, and he could hear the sound of guns that told him this road led only to the battlefield. He did not care about Wellington. Now was not the time to find the general and speak of the treaty that La Marquesa had betrayed to him in Burgos. He had written down everything that she had told him, and he would make sure that the letter reached Hogan. But now Sharp had caught up with the army on a day of battle. He was a soldier, and vindicating his name could wait until the fighting was done. He looked at Angel, mounted on an ugly horse that they had stolen in Pancorvo. Come on! He led the boy back to the village where a bridge crossed to the western bank. He would find the South Essex, he would come back from the dead, and he would fight. Chapter 21 The French guns fired all morning. Their sound rattled the windows in the city. It was like a thunder that had no ending. The smoke grew like a cloud. The women who sat on the tiers of seats above the city wall grumbled because their view was obscured. They could not see the enemy. They could only see the great cloud that grew and spread and drifted southwards with the breeze. Some of them strolled on the ramparts, flirting with the officers of the town guard. Others, their parasols raised against the sun, dozed on the benches. The gunners fired, aimed, and fired again. They dragged the guns forward after each shot, levered the trails round with hand spikes, and pushed the ammunition into the hot muzzles that steamed from the sponging out. Men were sent to the small streams of the plain for buckets of water to soak the sponges. The roads from the city were loud with the galloping limbers that brought new ammunition to feed the guns that hammered at the killing ground. The French infantry sat on the ridges, slicing sausage and bread, drinking the raw red wine that filled their canteens. The guns were doing their work. Good luck to the guns. The guns bucked, their wheels jarring from the ground with each shot. As each gun thudded down, the gunner ran forward to put his leather-covered thumb over the smoking touch-hole. With the touch-hole covered, it was safe to ram the wet sponge down the barrel and kill the last red sparks before the next powder charge was pushed home. Without the touch-hole blocked, the rush of air forced by the plunging sponge could flare pockets of unexploded powder that had been known to erupt with enough force to blast the sponge back and impale its handle through the body of a gunner. The guns had names embossed on the barrels beneath the proudly wreathed ends. Egalité fired next to Liberté, while Fortune and Défi were being sponged out. The gunners sweated and heaved and grinned, listened to their officers call the aim, and they knew they were filling the western plain with death. They could not see their enemy, the smoke hid all to the west, but each shot lanced a spear of flame into the smoke that would twitch with the canisters passing and then the gunners would reload, would haul the gun back into a true aim, then stand back as the chief gunner rammed his spike through the touch hole into the canvas bag of powder, as the second man pushed the quill of fine powder into the hole made by the spike. The quill carried the fire down to the powder from the linstock held by the chief gunner. Tire! All gunners were deaf, they said. They were the kings of the battlefield, and they never heard the applause. Sometimes, rarely, a battery would pause. The smoke would clear slowly from its front and the officers would peer at their target. The British had been stopped. The red lines were cowering in the crops, hiding behind stone walls or crouching in ditches, filthy with the summer's rain. The gunners knew the British were beaten. No troops in the world would dare advance into the horror of round shot and canister that the guns poured into the killing ground. For the British, it was a nightmare of sound. The round shot rumbled like giant barrels on planks overhead. The canister whistled, the screams of the wounded riding over it all. The musket balls from the broken canister rattled on stone or cracked through corn or thudded into flesh. And always there was the rolling thunder from the white cloud ahead. Sometimes when a gun was short of shot or canister, a shell would be fired instead. 
The shell would land in the broken crops. It would spin, its fuse smoking wildly. Then the casing would crack apart in flame, smoke, and iron fragments to add to the noise of death. The British died in ones and twos. They sheltered where they could, but sheltering men won no battles. Yet these men could not go forward. No man could go into that storm of shot. They crouched. They lay in shallow scoops of land. They cursed their officers. They cursed their general. They cursed the French. They cursed the slow crawling time, and they cursed the lack of help on the plain's edge. They were alone in a storm of death, and they could see no help. The colours were shredded with shot. The lucky ones were in the small village, the first village of the plain, for there the stone walls were a shield. Even so, some round shot smashed the houses flat, carving bloody paths in the packed rooms, and always the air outside the hovels was loud with the sound of death. The attack was stalled. We have him, by God! We have him! Marshal Jourdain, who, like all the French marshals, had begun to think of Wellington as unbeatable, knew that his enemy had underestimated him. Jourdain guessed that Wellington, secure for the first time by having greater numbers than the French, had committed his army to a frontal attack. The guns, the pride of the French army, were shedding the enemy. He looked north. A few English cavalrymen were in sight on the river's far bank, and the sight of them had alarmed some of his officers. Jourdain clapped his hands for attention and raised his voice. Gentlemen, the cavalry is a fent. If they planned to attack from there, they would have done so already. They want us to weaken our left. We shall not. Indeed, he strengthened it. The reserves who guarded the northern river bank were marched south behind the Arinez Hill to reclaim the Puebla Heights. Jourdain planned more for them. When the British broke, and when he unleashed his lances and sabers onto the killing ground, the men from the heights could sweep down to block the defile. The British, broken and blooded, would be trapped. But first, Jourdain knew he must let Wellington send more men onto the plain, more men to be killed and cut off, more corpses and prisoners for the Emperor's glory. Jourdain knew he must wait. In another two hours, perhaps, the heights would be retaken, and the moment would have come when he would destroy Wellington's reputation for ever. The marshal called for food for a little wine. Another two hours, he thought, and he would send the eagles forward to take Spain back for France. He smiled at King Joseph. I trust, sir, you have invited no one to sit on your right this evening. Joseph frowned in puzzlement, not understanding why Jourdain spoke about the victory feast which had been ordered in Vittoria. I hope you will take that place of honor, my dear Marshal. Jourdain laughed. I shall be pursuing the enemy, sir, but you may have the Lord Wellington to entertain. I hear he likes mutton. Joseph understood and laughed. You're that hopeful? Jourdain was that hopeful. He had won. He knew it. And he could taste the victory already. The guns made the silver cutlery quiver on the white linen in Victoria's grandest hotel. The waiters had laid one hundred and fifty places in the dining room. The bottles of wine, standing in thick groups on all the tables, clinked together and sounded like a thousand small bells. Flowers had been cut and were now being put on the high table. That was where King Joseph would sit for this feast of victory ordered by the French. A tricolour was hung from the ceiling. The crystal chandeliers vibrated with the sound of the cannon. The whole great room was filled with clinking, ringing, shaking things. The hotel's owner looked at the room and knew his men had done well. He wrung his hands. He should have dared ask the French to pay for this feast in advance. They had ordered the best Medoc, Burgundy, and Champagne, and the kitchens were preparing five bullocks, two score sheep, two hundred partridges, and a hundred chickens. He groaned. The patriot in him prayed for a British victory. But the businessman feared that the British might not pay for what their enemy had ordered. He listened to the guns, and his purse, more important than his pride, prayed that they would win the day. The Marquis of Wellington, sitting his horse on the lower slopes of the western hills, watched the French gun line flame and smoke and shatter his men in the killing ground. None of Wellington's staff officers spoke to him. The whole sky seemed to vibrate with the great blows of the guns. Staff officers spurred on the slope beneath him. To a casual eye, the western hill and the defile seemed like chaos. Wounded men dragged themselves towards surgeons, while other men waited for battle. To someone who had never seen a battle, there seemed no order in the casual disposition of men. They might have hoped for a plan to help them understand.
There was a plan. Jourdain planned to stop the attack with his guns, and Wellington planned to grip those guns in a fist and squeeze. The English general thought of his plan like a left hand placed palm downwards on the map. The thumb was the attack on the heights. The index finger was the troops who had advanced beneath the heights into the guns' thunder, the troops who had been stopped by the French artillery, the troops who suffered minute by horrid minute. The thumb and index finger were supposed to do no more than pin the enemy's attention, to draw his reserves across to the south and west, and when that was done, the remaining three fingers would curl in from the north. But where were they? The men on the plain were dying because the left-hand columns were late, and Wellington, who hated to see men die unnecessarily, would not even allow himself to be consoled by the fact that the longer he waited, the more his enemy would be convinced that the main attack was coming from the west. He rode a small way up the slope and stared northwards. The land seemed empty. He clicked his fingers. An aide spurred forward. The general turned. Hurry them, my lord. There was no need to explain who should be hurried. There should be three columns coming from the northern hills, columns that would trample the crops over the river, carry the bridges, and fall on the French right. Wellington wondered why in God's name the French had left the bridges intact. His cavalry scouts had reported no signs of powder ready to blow the arches sky high. It made no sense. The general had feared that his northern attacks would have to wade the fords, their bodies drifting downstream in bloodied water. But the French had left the bridges open. Yet the three columns, which, like fingers, would squeeze the life from the French army, had not appeared, and their lateness meant that the French guns were taking a heavy toll on the plain. The fingers of Wellington's right hand drummed on the pommel of his saddle. He waited, while beneath him the guns shivered the warm morning. Dear Captain Sommier, Ma'am, he sounded tired. Eight times La Marquesa had sent him limping down the crowded tiers, either for more wine or more pastries. In my coach there's a parasol. Would you be very gallant and fetch it for me? Entirely my pleasure, ma'am. Is the white parasol not the black? There's nothing else I can fetch you at the same time? Her escort asked, hopefully. Not that I can think of. He edged down the crowded bench, his ugly face reddening because he knew that the other women had observed him running errands like a small boy for La Marquesa. She stared at the battlefield, seeing only the great cloud of cannon smoke. For some reason she found herself thinking about Sharp, wondering whether he would have been as malleable as this Captain Sommier. Somehow she doubted it. Richard had always been ready to frown and growl his displeasure. He had been, she thought, a man of immense pride, a pride made fragile because it had come from the gutter. She had felt regret when she had heard he was dead. She was glad then that she'd lied to him, had told him that she loved him. Richard, she thought, had wanted her to say that, and he had been eager to believe it. She wondered why soldiers, who knew death and horror better than anyone, were so often soggily romantic. Send them to their deaths happy, was what the women of this army said. And why not? She tried to imagine being in bed with Captain Sommier, and the thought made her shudder. She cooled herself with her fan. The sun was tryingly hot. A cavalry officer reined in at the wall's foot. There had been a succession of such officers all morning who had come to show off to the ladies and shout up news from the fighting that was still hidden by the great bank of smoke. The cavalry officer swept off his hat. All was well, he said. The British were beaten. Soon Jourdain would order the line forward. La Marquesa smiled. Victory today would mean Ducot's defeat. A beat of pure malicious pleasure went through her at the thought of that defeat. She looked away from the smoke. She looked at the empty northern fields, bright with poppies and cornflowers, a scene of innocence on this day of guns and smoke. Far off there, at the foot of the northern hills, and too far away to play any part in today's battle, was a small storybook castle. She pulled her ivory spyglass open and stared at the tiny old fortress. And instead she saw troops, troops trampling the crops flat, Troops spilling from the galleys of the hills, troops swarming southwards towards the right of the French line. She stared. 
the troops wore red. She knew what she saw. It was the despised Wellington proving to the French yet again that he could not attack. Beneath her, the cavalry officer caught a thrown handkerchief, wheeled his horse, and galloped back to the battle. Sir, sir! Marshal Jourdain, who a moment before had been thinking that the battle would be won by two o'clock, and had been thinking regretfully that his pursuit would mean he could not attend the victory dinner that night, stared to his right. He could not believe what he saw. The columns were coming towards him, towards the unguarded flank, and the British colours were bright over their heads. He had already taken his reserves from the right to reassault the Puebla Heights. Now Wellington had unleashed the weight of his real attack. For one brief, horrid second, Jourdain admired Wellington for waiting this long, for letting his men suffer under the guns long enough to convince the French that the frontal attack was the real attack. Then the marshal began shouting. The right flanks of the French lines were to turn outwards. There would not be time to stop the British crossing the river, so Jourdain knew he must fight them on the near bank with his guns. King Joseph, who had retired into his carriage to use his silver chamber pot, came hurrying back into the sunshine. What's happening? Jourdain ignored him. He was staring north, watching the most easterly enemy column that was not coming towards him. It was striking for the great road, trying to cut him off from France. He shouted for an aid. What's the village on the river bends up? Gamara Major, sir. Tell them to hold it. Tell them to hold it. Sir. King Joseph, his breeches flap held in his hands, watched in horror as the aide spurred his horse into a gallop. Hold what? Your kingdom, sir. There. Jordan's voice was savage. He was pointing at the river bend and the small village of Gamara Major. You! He pointed to another aide. Tell General Ray I want his men in Camara Mayo. Go! If the river was crossed and the road taken, then a battle, a kingdom, and an army were lost. Tell them to hold it! He shouted after the officer, then turned back to the west. A gun sounded no great thing on this day, except this was a British gun, and it had been brought to face the French, and the round shot landed on the slope of the Arinet Hill, bounced, and came to rest a few yards from Jourdain's horse. It was the first enemy shot to reach the Arinet Hill, and it spoke of things to come. Marshal Jourdain, whose day of triumph was turning sour, tossed his marshal's baton into his carriage. It was a red velvet staff tipped with gold and decorated with gold eagles. It was a bauble fit for a triumph, but now he knew he had to fight against disaster. He had sent his reserves to his left, and now his right was threatened. He shouted for news and wondered what happened beyond the bank of smoke which hid this battle for a kingdom. Richard Sharp, though he did not know it, galloped within two hundred yards of Wellington. He went north, following the river, shouting at the villagers who watched the battle from the track to clear a path. Across the water he could see the smoke pumping from the French gun line. The canister twitched and tore at the trampled crops. He slowed at the river bend, forced to negotiate a village street crowded with battalions who waited to cross the bridges. He shouted at one mounted officer, asking where the fifth was, and the man waved sharp on. The left! A rifle officer, lighting a cigar from the pipe of one of his men, saw Sharp, and his mouth dropped open. The cigar fell to the ground, and Sharp smiled. Morning, Harry. Good luck. He put his heels back, leaving the man stupefied by the sight of a disgraced, hanged, and buried man come back from the dead. Sharp laughed, cleared the village, and put Carbine into a canter that took them due east along the Zadora's northern bank. Ahead of him, the 3rd and 7th divisions were launched at the river. They attacked the double skirmishers in front, the huge formations splitting apart to stream over the unblown bridges and unguarded fords. Angel was awed by the sight. More than 10,000 infantry were moving, a red tide that assaulted the southern French positions. A major galloped towards Sharp. Behind him, a brigade of infantry were standing, their general impatient at their head. Are you staff? No, Sharp reined in. God damn it! The major's sword was drawn. The peer's forgotten us. God damn it! Just go! Go? Why not? Sharp grinned at the man. Where's the fifth? Keep going! The major had turned his horse and now waved his sword towards the river in a signal to his general. The brigade picked up its muskets. Come on, Angel! Sharp feared the battle would be over before he could join it. 
To Sharp's right, as he circled the rear of the now advancing brigade, the British attack reformed on the Zadora's southern bank. Ahead of the attack, spread out in the untrodden wheat that was thick with flowers, the rifles, men of the 95th, went ahead in the skirmish line. They could see the French guns on the Arines Hill, and they knelt, fired, reloaded, and advanced. The bullets flickering out of the smoke cloud and clanging on the black-muzzled barrels of the French guns were the first warning the battery had of their danger. Spikes! The gunners desperately slewed the guns round, the men heaving on the hand spikes, as yet more bullets came from the north. Canister! the officer shouted, and then a bullet span him round. He clapped a hand to his shoulder, and suddenly his men were running because the riflemen were charging up the slope. Load it! It was too late. The riflemen, their weapons tipped with the long sword bayonets, were in the battery. The blades stabbed at the few Frenchmen who tried to swing rammers at the British riflemen. Some gunners crawled under the barrels of their guns, waiting for a prudent moment to surrender. Behind the rifles, spreading in the wheat with their colours overhead, came the lines of red-jacketed men. Back! Back! A French gunner colonel, seeing his northern battery taken, shouted for the limbers and horses. Men hurled ready ammunition into chests, picked up trails. The trace chains were linked on, the horses were whipped, and the French guns went thundering and rocking and bouncing back towards the second line. Ready! Now the French infantry, who had thought the guns had done their task, had to come forward to blunt the British attack. Present! Fire! Over the fields that had been flayed with canister came the sound of musketry, the clash of infantry. The Marquis of Wellington opened his watch case. He had his lodgment on the plain. He had driven the first French line into confusion, but now he knew there would be a pause. Prisoners were being herded back. The wounded were being carried to the surgeons. In the smoke of the battlefield, colonels and generals were looking for landmarks, seeking out units on their flanks, waiting for orders. The attack had worked, but now the attack had to be realigned. The men who had suffered under the French guns must be relieved. New battalions marched onto the plain to link up with the northern attacks. Wellington crossed the river. He spurred forward to take command of the next attack, the one that would drive the French army due east towards Vittoria. And he wondered what was happening to the small finger of his plan's hand. That finger was the 5th Division. It marched to a village called Gamara Mayor, and if it could take that village cross the river and cut the great road, then it would turn French defeat into a rout. There, Wellington knew, the battle would be hardest, and to that place, as the sun rose to its zenith, sharp road. Chapter 22 Lieutenant Colonel Leroy fiddled with his watch. God damn them! No one spoke. To their right, three miles away, the other columns had struck over the river. The battle there was a rolling cloud of musket and cannon smoke. The 5th Division waited. Three battalions, the South Essex one of them, would head the attack on Gamara Mayor. Ahead of Leroy's men was a gentle slope that led down to the village, beyond which was a stone bridge that crossed the river. Beyond the river was the Great Road. If the division could cut the road, then the French army was cut off from France. He snapped open the lid of his watch again. What's keeping the bloody man? Leroy wanted the general of division to order the attack quickly. The French were in Gamara Mayor. This was the only river crossing they had garrisoned, and they had loopholed the houses, barricaded the alleys, and Leroy knew this would be grim work. Three years before, on the Portuguese frontier, he had fought at Puentes do Noro, and he remembered the horrors of fighting in small, tight streets. Christ on his cross! Across the river, where the lane from the bridge rose to the great road, he could see French guns unlimbering. The attack would now be harder. The guns were just high enough to fire over the village, and even if the British took Gamara Mayor, the guns would make the bridge murderous with canister. Sir, Ensign Basketball gestured to the right. A staff officer had ridden to the centre battalion at the attack. A bad goddamn time! Leroy rode forward, his face scarred dreadfully at Badahoth, looking grimmer than ever. Mr. Dallambord, sir, skirmish line out, sir. Then the colonel of the centre battalion waved his hat. The band of that battalion struck into a jauntier tune, and the light companies were going forward. Leroy looked at his watch. It was one o'clock. He closed the watch's lid, thrust it into a pocket, and shouted the orders that would march the South Essex line towards the enemy. 
Leroy was taking them into battle for the first time. The colours had been unsheathed. The silk looked crumpled after its long confinement in the leather tubes, but the ensigns shook the flags out so that the tassels danced and the great emblems spread out above their heads. On the right was the king's colour, a huge union flag that was embroidered with the badge of the South Essex at its centre. The badge showed a chained eagle commemorating Sharp and Harper's capture of the French standard at Talavera. On the left was the regimental colour, a yellow flag that listed the South Essex's battle honours about the badge at its centre, and with the Union flag sewn into its upper corner. Both flags were holed, both scorched, both had been in battle before, and it was to the flags, more than to king or country, that a man gave his love and allegiance. Around the two ensigns who carried the standards were the sergeants, halberd blades shining in the sun. If the French wanted to take the flags, they would have to get past the men with the long, savage, axe-headed spears. The battalion marched with bayonets fixed and muskets loaded. They trampled the wheat flat. Ahead of them, spread out like beaters, was the light company. Sergeant Patrick Harper shouted at them to spread out more. He had waited all morning for an officer to come with black hair and a scar on his left cheek. But there had been no sign of Sharp. Yet Harper refused to give up hope. He stubbornly insisted that Sharp was alive, that he would come today, that Sharp would never let the South Essex fight without being present. If Sharp had to come out of the grave, he would come. Captain Dallenbord listened to the thunder of guns to his right. British guns were on the plain now, firing from the Arineth Hill at the second French line. Dallenborn, who was at his first great battle, thought the sound was more terrible than any he had ever heard. He knew that soon the six French guns across the river would open fire. It seemed to Peter Dallenborn, as he marched ever closer to the silent, barricaded village, that each of the French guns was pointing directly at him. He glanced at Harper, taking comfort from the apparent stolidity of the huge Irishman. Then the guns disappeared in smoke. Lieutenant Colonel Leroy saw a pencil line go up and down in the sky, and knew that a round shot was coming towards him. He kept his horse going straight, held his breath, and watched with relief as the ball thumped into the grass ahead of the battalion, bounced overhead, and rolled behind him. The shots came over the village and plunged onto the meadow that the British battalions crossed. The first volley did no damage, except for the ball that had bounced over Leroy's head. It bounced again, once more, and rolled towards the South Essex bandsman, who waited at the rear for the wounded. A drummer boy, seeing the ball roll slow as a cricket ball that might not make the boundary, ran to check it with his foot. Stop! A sergeant shouted at the boy, but he was too late. The drummer put his foot in the ball's path. It seemed to roll so innocuously, so slowly, and as the boy grinned, it took his foot off in blood and pain. You stupid bastard! The sergeant slapped him and hauled him upright. You stupid goddamn bastard! How many goddamn times have you been told? The other drummer boys watched silently as their comrade was carried, sobbing, back to the surgeons. The drummer's foot, still in the boot that he had polished in honour of the battle, lay in the grass. The guns fired again, and this time a ball plucked through the South Essex's number six company, throwing two men sideways and down, spattering blood onto the wheat and poppies. The line stolidly closed up. The light company had opened fire, the rifles cracked, the French cannon smashed back again, and once again the lines had to close, and once again the meadow behind the attackers was littered with bodies and blood. Leroy lit a cheroot with his tinderbox. The men were doing well. They were not flinching from the artillery. They marched silently and in good order, but still he feared the village. It was too well barricaded, too thickly loopholed, and he knew that the muskets of Gamara Mayor's defenders could do far more damage than the six field guns on the far side of the river. Not a French musket had sounded, yet. They waited for the British to get close. Leroy had begged for permission to attack in column, but the brigadier had refused. We always attack in line, man. Don't be a fool. The brigadier, knowing Leroy to be an American, wondered if he was touched in the head. Attack in column, indeed. Leroy put his tinderbox away and spurred past the colours. Captain Dallin, board. Sir, form on us. The South Essex was now protected from the field guns by the houses in the village. Still, the French did not fire. The light companies scrambled to their place on the left of the battalion. They marched forward. Leroy frowned. He knew what would happen when the defenders fired. He feared it. 
The South Essex was still under strength, and the next few moments could destroy his command. He muttered at the enemy under his breath, begging them to fire too soon, begging them to give his men a chance. But the French waited. They waited till every shot could count. And when the fire order was given, Leroy almost flinched from the sound and from the destruction. The heavy musket bullets tore at the British line, jerking and twisting men, chopping them down, spinning them, and then new men took over at the loopholes, and more bullets came tearing into the red-jacketed attack, and it seemed to Leroy that the air was filled with the noise of muskets and bullets, as he shouted into the wind of fire to keep his men going forward. Forward! the officers shouted, but they could not go forward. The musketry from the village had jarred the South Essex backwards. Men fired their muskets in reply and wasted the bullets against the stone walls and barricades. The colours fell, the ensigns shot by French marksmen. Forward! Come on! Leroy spurred ahead of the line. Forward! His horse, reared, screaming, was struck by another bullet, and Leroy cursed as his right boot would not leave the stirrup. His cigar fell, he flailed for balance, then his right foot was free, and he slid clumsily over the rump of his falling, dying horse. He climbed to his feet, drew his sword, and shouted the men on. The meadow was laced with smoke. Men crawled backwards, blood staining their tracks. Men cried for God or their mothers. Officers, horses, wounded, died in the wheat or stampeded towards the rear. Some men, seeing a chance to escape the carnage, helped the wounded towards the bandsmen and the surgeons. Other men reloaded and aimed at the loopholes, and still the French fired at them, and still the enemy bullets twitched the thickening musket smoke and made the meadow a place of death and screams and wounded. Forward! Leroy shouted. He wondered when new battalions would be sent up to help his men, and he felt a rage that a battalion under his command might need help. Forward! The colours were lifted up by new men. They went into the fire, and the king's colour fell again, was lifted again, and it twitched like a live thing as the bullets plucked at it. The smoke was spoiling the French aim. From the village they could see a mist that surrounded their positions, and at the far side of the mist the dim shapes of men who came forward were thrown back, and still the French fired, thickening the mist, sending their bullets to pluck at the British line that had wrapped itself about the village but could not break in. The regimental colour fell, this time a sergeant picked it up, but the movement in the mist attracted a dozen French marksmen, and the sergeant was hurled back, and the flag was down again. Forward! Leroy ran, sword in hand, and he heard the shot plucking at the grass and thrumming in the air, and he heard the cheer behind, and knew the companies were coming with him, and the wall ahead of him flickered with flame. Someone screamed behind him, and suddenly Leroy was at the village, safe between two loopholes in a barn wall and more men joined him, crouching beneath loopholes, feverishly reloading their muskets. Leroy grinned at them. We've got to go for a barricade. Yes, sir. He wondered again for the hundredth, hundredth time why these men, reckoned by their country to be the dregs of society, fought so well, so willingly, so bravely. Leroy recognized a lieutenant from three company. Where's Captain Butler? Dead, sir. A French musket sounded deafening beside Leroy. He ignored it. They were safe here, hard against the wall, though he glanced up to make sure that no Frenchmen were on the barn roof. To his right he could see a farm wagon on its side. If enough men could drag it out of the way, then he could lead a party into the alley. He organized a firing party, their job to fire over the barricade while the other men pulled at it. Then, with fixed bayonets, the rest of the company would follow Leroy into the alley. He grinned at them. Are you ready, lads? Yes, sir. They looked nervously at him. The battle for them had become ten yards of murderous wall, nothing more. Lieutenant Colonel Leroy, who had no intention of being defeated in his first battle as battalion commander, wiped his hand on his breeches and re-gripped his sword. First man in gets a guinea! He listened to their cheer, knew they were ready and straightened up. Come on! He ran to the barricade. Behind him the men came, cheering, but a single bullet planted in Leroy's brain, finished the attack before it began. The company, demoralized by his death, huddled back against the wall and wondered if they dared run back through the smoke before the victorious French, sallying from the village, slaughtered them with bayonets. Gamara Meyer was being held. Ten yards from the alley, his scarred face spattered with blood, Thomas Leroy lay dead. His watch, ticking in his pocket, gave the time as ten past one. "'You're staying here.' Sharp said to Angel. No. If I die, no one else knows about the goddamn treaty. You stay here and make sure the letter reaches Hogan. Sharp saw Angel nod reluctantly. 
The band sergeant was staring at Sharp with a white face. Mr. Sharp? You make sure this boy doesn't move, sergeant. Yes, sir. The sergeant was shaking. It, 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 it is you, Mr. Sharp? Of course it's me. Sharp was watching the village, seeing a battalion broken. You two, he pointed at two unwounded men who helped a comrade back. Sir, you're not bloody wounded. Get back, sergeant. Sir. The band sergeant was staring at Sharp in utter disbelief. Shoot the next unwounded bastard who comes back here. Oh, yes, Mr. Sharp. Sharp drew the sword. He went forward into the wheat that was trampled and blood-stained, littered with broken bodies, and the scene of disaster. He had come back. Captain Dallenborn never knew who first shouted for the line to retreat. The panic seemed to spread from the centre of the line. He heard an officer shout for the men to stand, to fire, to attack again. But the shouting was no good. The smoke isolated the men. They could not see the colours. Then came the news that the colonel was dead, and suddenly the South Essex was running back through the smoke, and the French cheered and sent them on their way with another volley of bullets. Dallenborn ran with them out of the smoke, running across the village meadow and into the wheat field, he knew this was wrong. He knew that he should form the men into a skirmish line or into close order. And he saw Harper bellowing at the light company, and he knew he should do the same. Then suddenly another voice was shouting on the battlefield, a voice forged long ago on forgotten parade grounds, and Dallenborn, looking left in the tangling smoke, saw a ghost. A ghost who swore at them, who threatened them with his sword, who bellowed at officers and promised to cut down the next man who went backwards. They stared at him in shock. The big black horse carried a dead man among them, an unshaven ghost they thought dead and buried, a ghost whose anger was livid, whose voice flayed them into ranks and made them lie down so that the French bullets went high. Captain Dallenborn, sir, skirmish line forward, edge of the smoke, lie down, keep the bastards busy, move. Sharp saw the shock on Dallenborn's face. I said move. He turned back to the other companies. He would form them into a column. He would attack in the French manner. God alone knew why they had not attacked in column in the first place. He shouted the orders, ignoring the bullets that flickered out of the smoke. Patrick Harper had tears in his eyes. If anyone had dared ask him why, he would have said that the musket smoke was irritating him. He had known, he had always known, but he had not truly believed that Sharp was alive. Sergeant Major! McLeod gaped at Sharp, then managed to speak. Sir, where's the colonel? Dead, sir. Christ. Sharp stared at the staring RSM. Then the flutter of a bullet snapped him to his duty. Take six men from two companies. Stay at the back. You shoot any man who falls out. Talion, move. Colors to me. To his right, Sharp could see that the other two battalions were checked at the village's edge. They formed a ragged line about the houses, a line held by the French follies. But a line would not pierce defences like this. It would take a column, and the column must go like a battering ram at the village, must take its losses at its head and then carry the bayonets into the streets. He formed them into a column of four ranks. Some men were laughing like madmen. Others simply stared at a man come back from the grave. Collett, the quartermaster, was shaking with fear. The bullets still plucked about them, but Sharp had formed the column a hundred yards from the village, far enough to take the sting from the French marksmen. He rode down the column, telling them what to do, and he suddenly had to shout because the fools were cheering him, and he had to turn his face away and pretend to stare at the other two battalions. He knew he should stop them cheering, but he could not. He thought how stupid it was to cheer a man who would lead them back to death, and how splendid it was, and he laughed because the battalion was suddenly cheering in unison, and he knew the cheer would carry them to victory. The Grenadier Company was at the front. Sharp picked ten men whose job was to fire a volley at point-blank range when they reached the barricade. He would lead them, following a track of beaten earth that disappeared in the smoke, but which he knew must lead to one of the barricaded alleys. Raise the collars! There was a cheer as the flags were hoisted by two sergeants. Sharp stood in his stirrups. He would dismount for the attack, but for this moment, as the French bullets hummed about his ears, he wanted the South Essex to see him. He raised the sword. There was silence, and he could see that they were straining to get the attack done. He smiled villainously. You're going to fight the bastards. What are you going to do? Fight. What are you going to do? Fight. He beckoned at a man and ordered to him to hold carbine till the fight was done. Then Sharp dismounted, turned and stared at the village. It was time to go, time to fight. And he thought suddenly of the golden-haired woman who waited beyond the enemy lines. And he knew there was only one way that he would ever reach her. He hefted his sword and gave the command. Forward! Chapter 23 
It was odd, Sharp thought, but at that moment, as he led the battalion forward, he wished La Marquesa could see him. He was not in love with her. He might be jealous of her, he might seek her company, but he did not love her. He had said so on that morning when he thought he went to death at El Matarife's hand. But he knew it was not true. He wanted her. He flickered about her as a moth flew about a bright flame, but to love someone was to know them. And he did not know her. He wondered if anyone knew her. She had said she loved him, but he knew she did not. She had wanted him to break his honor for her, and she had thought the word love would make him do it. She would use him and discard him, but nevertheless he now walked, sword in hand, towards the waiting muskets, and he did it for her. The sword felt heavy in his hand. He wondered why every new battle was harder than the last. Luck had to stop somewhere, he supposed. And why not here, where the French had already broken one attack and waited for the next? He thought, as he shouted the column forward, that he lived on borrowed time. He wondered, if he died, whether Hélène would hear that he had lived a few more days for her, and that he had died in the stupid, vain, selfish hope of seeing her again. His boots swished in the meadow grass. Bees were busy at the clover. He saw a snail with a black and white shell that had been crushed by an infantryman's boot. The grass was littered with cartridges, spent musket balls, discarded ramrods, and fallen shakos. He looked up at the village. The light company was provoking the musket fire, keeping the acrid smoke thick. Behind him, the column marched in good, tight order. He took a deep breath. Dalian! Double! The bullets plucked the air about him. He heard a scream behind him, a curse, and he was running fast now, the village close, and through the smoke he could at last see the alley's mouth. It was blocked with a cart, with furniture, and flames stabbed from the barricade, and he shouted for the firing party to break to one side. He heard their volley. He saw a Frenchman go backwards from the barricade's top, and then there were only a few yards to go. More bullets flamed from the village, but instead of a thin line attacking, it was a column thick enough to soak up the French fire. Sharp gathered himself for the jump. He would not wait to pull the barricade down. Jump! The air was filled with the hammering of muskets. Sharp jumped onto the cart, swept down with his sword at a stabbing bayonet, while about him the British were clawing up the barricade, dragging the furniture down, trying to scramble over the heaped timber and screaming at the enemy. A musket fired beside his ear, deafening him. A bayonet tore at his sleeve as more men pushed behind, forcing him over, and he fell, flailing with the sword, rolling down the French side of the barricade as the enemy bayonets reached for him. He twisted sideways, and suddenly men of the South Essex were jumping over him, driving the French back, and he scrambled up, went on, and shouted at the men to watch the rooftops. No one heard him. They were mad with the battle lust of fear, wanting to kill before they were killed, and it was that spirit that had driven them over the barricade and which drove them them now into the tight, small streets of Camara Mayor. A door opened in a house, a man stabbed with a bayonet and sharp, lunged, twisted, and he could feel the warm blood on his hand as his sword found the enemy's neck. He dragged the blade clear of the falling body. Kill the bastards! The alley was thick with men, pushing, shouting, swearing, stabbing, screaming. Men were trampled when they were wounded. The front rank clawed at the enemy. The close alley wall seemed to magnify every shout and shot. There was a volley of muskets from the alley's far end, and a French counterattack, readied against just such a breakthrough, came towards them. Fire! The few men still loaded, fired. Two Frenchmen fell. The rest came on, sharp took his sword forward and swept it like a scythe at the leading bayonets. He was shouting the war shout, letting the anger frighten the enemy, and he felt a blade sear his thigh. But the sword flicked up into the man's face. There was a scream, and it was British bayonets that went forward, twisted, stabbed, tore the enemy counterattack into shreds. Sharp was treading on bodies now. He did not notice. He watched the rooftops, the windows, and always shouted at his men to follow him to keep moving forward. The bayonets went forward. The British were shouting like madmen, like men who know that the best way to get rid of terror is to get the damned job done. They were clawing at their enemy, trampling them, screaming and lunging, cutting, slashing, driving them back. Into the houses! Into the houses! There was no point in piercing the village's centre, there to be surrounded by the enemy. This first alley had to be cleared. The houses emptied of the French, and Sharp kicked a door open and ducked under the lintel. He was in an empty room. Men crammed in behind him, bayonets red. Opposite them was a closed door. Sharp looked round. Who's loaded? 
Three men nodded at him. Their eyes were bright in the darkness. Their faces, stained by powder burns, were drawn back in permanent scowls. Sharp dared not let these men catch their breath or feel safe here. He had to keep them moving. Fire through that door. On my order. They lined up. They leveled their muskets. Fire. Go, go, go. He was still shouting as he kicked the door and led the way through the musket smoke. He had to stop himself from flinching as he went through the door. So strong was his certainty that a volley waited for him on the far side. He found a French soldier sprawled, twitching and bleeding in a small yard that was strewn with straw. Other Frenchmen were backing into the yard, defending an alley at the far side that must have been penetrated by other men of the South Essex. Sharp bellowed a triumphant shout. The sword struck again while, either side of him, his men went forward with bayonets, and the Frenchmen were shouting for quarter, dropping their muskets, and Sharp was yelling at his men to hold their fire and to take prisoners. A thatched roof had caught fire across the alley. Beneath it, men were running, driving the French back, and Sharp joined them, all control of the battalion gone. They were hunting the defenders out of the houses, blasting closed doors with musket fire, kicking the shattered doors open and searching the small rooms. They did it savagely and quickly, avenging the dead American who had wanted this victory. A trumpet sounded, and Sharp, turning, saw through the smoke in the village street the flag of another battalion. The rest of the division was coming through, and he shouted at his own men to take cover to clear the alleys. Let other men carry on. He picked up some straw in a farmyard and scoured at the blood on his sword blade. Two prisoners watched him. All about him the village echoed to muskets and screams. The French garrison, prized from the houses, ran back over the bridge. A sergeant watched Sharp. It is you, sir. Sharp tried to remember the man's name and company. Sergeant Barrett, isn't it? Yes, sir. The man smiled, pleased at being remembered. Men of his company gaped at Sharp. It is me, Sharp grinned. My bloody young, you, sir. This army can't do anything right, Sergeant. The men laughed as he'd meant them to. Barrett offered him some water that Sharp took gratefully. Burning wisps of straw blown from the thatch threatened to start more fires. Sharp ordered them to find rakes and get the prisoners to pull the burning thatch down. Then he set off to look at the village he had captured. Marshal Jourdain could only fear and wait. The news from Camara Mayor said that the British had taken the village, but had failed to cross the river. He sent a messenger to say that the bridge had to be held at whatever cost. He felt the frustration of being outmaneuvered, of trying to double-guess the hook-nosed, blue-eyed general who opposed him. Jourdain had glimpsed Wellington once, glimpsed him through a ragged hole in the smoke curtain, and he had watched his opponent calmly dressing the line of a British battalion. A general had no business doing that, Jourdain thought, and what made it worse was that the battalion had then thrown the French from the southern flank of the Arinette Hill. Marshal Jourdain, his great guns outflanked and his infantry defeated, had been thrown back on his second line. If the new line, and if the troops across the river from Camara Mayor both held, then all was not lost. Indeed, a victory could still be his. But he had the horrid sensation of control slipping from his hands. He shouted for information, demanding to know where General Gazan's troops were, and no one could tell him. He sent aides galloping into the smoke, and they did not come back. Or if they did, they had no news. And Jourdain felt a shrinking horror that the second line was not complete, and what there was of it was suffering terribly from the enemy guns. Suffering because Wellington had done what Wellington was reputed never to do. He had taken a leaf from the Emperor's book and concentrated his artillery, and now the British, Portuguese, and Spanish guns were pounding from Anarineth Hill, pounding and pounding, stopping a man thinking and carving great furrows of blood through the waiting French infantry. King Joseph, his horse nervous, came close to Jourdain. Jean-Baptiste! Jourdain frowned. He hated his Christian names. He hated the familiarity that he knew was being used to disguise fear. Sir! Should we advance? Christ on his bloody cross! Jourdain almost snarled at his monarch, but bit the blasphemy back. He forced himself to look calm, knowing that the eyes of the staff were on him. We shall let our guns gnaw at him a bit, sir. Jesus wept. Advance? Jourdain spurred his horse away from the king, noting wryly that the royal coach was ready for flight. Coachmen aloft, and postilions mounted on horses. The truth was that Wellington conducted the music of battle now. God damned Wellington, and Jourdain was praying that his men would hold on long enough to let him dream up a response. 
troops. He needed fresh troops. Moreau! Moreau! He called for an aide. There must be reserve somewhere. There must be. The afternoon had come, and it had brought an artillery duel on the plain. Jourdain shouted for more troops, but he knew his enemy, behind the curtain of smoke, was regrouping for a new attack. He demanded news, always news, and he asked for reassurance from staff officers who could not give it. Panic was beginning to infect the French command, while behind their guns the British prepared a new attack. The infantry were in their ranks, fresh cartridges issued, an army readying itself for victory. On the walls of the city the ladies watched. They frowned when the carts brought the bloodied wounded back from the battle, but they believed the handsome cavalry officers who came to give them news. Jourdain, the cavalry officer said, had merely pulled his line back to give the guns more room. There was nothing to be worried about, nothing. One woman asked what happened to the north, and an officer reassured her that it was merely a few enemy who had come to the river and were learning the power of French guns. The officers caught the flowers tossed to them by the women, gallantly fixed the blooms to shining plumed helmets, and trotted away through Vittoria's suburbs, leaving the women's hearts fluttering. Captain Somia knew that marshals of France did not yield ground to give the guns space. Are you packed, my lady? His voice was low. Packed? In case we have to retreat. La Marquesa stared at the ugly man. You're serious? I am, my lady. She knew defeat. If Sharp had still lived, she thought, she would have been tempted to stay in Vittoria in the sure knowledge that Sharp would dare to do what General Verini dared not, snatch her wagons back from the Inquisitor. But Sharp was dead, and she dared not stay. She consoled herself that in her coach, prudently concealed beneath the driver's bench, there were jewels enough to save her from utter poverty in France. She shrugged. There's still time, surely? I hope so, my lady. She smiled sadly. You still think Wellington can't attack, Captain? He frowned, not at her question, but at her face. She had turned from him and now stared in horror and puzzlement at the crowd who stood at the foot of the tiered seats. Somia touched her arm. My lady? She took her arm away. It's nothing, Captain. Yet she could have sworn for one instant that she'd seen a bearded face, a face so covered in beard as to resemble a beast, a face that had stared at her, turned away, and which she had seen on a cold morning in the mountains. The slaughter man. She told herself she imagined it, for no partisan would dare show himself in the heart of the French army, and she looked back to the plain where the battle still thundered, and where that army fought for its existence. Regimental Sergeant Major McLeod reported that the burning thatch was now extinguished. And we've got forty-one prisoners, sir. Half the buggers are wounded badly. Where's the surgeon? Outside the village, sir. Lieutenant Andrews? Sir. The lieutenant still did not seem to believe that Sharp was alive. My respects to Mr. Ellis. Tell him there's work in the village and I want him here now. Yes, sir. The South Essex had been ordered to rest while other battalions streamed through the village to attack the bridge. Sharp thought of the guns just up the slope. His hopes of reaching Victoria seemed slim so long as the French battery was unmolested. Mr. Collip? Sir? I want an ammunition check on all companies. We've lost the limber, sir. Then goddamn find it! And if you see my horse, send it here. A horse, sir? Black. Undocked tail. Sharp had taken over a house in the village plaza. Its furniture had all gone to the barricades. He listened to the French guns open fire again, and knew that the attackers would be dying as they struggled to cross the bridge. Paddock! The battalion clerk grinned from the kitchen door. He had been speechless when he saw Sharp, and he still grinned like a madman. Sir? Someone must have some bloody tea. Uh, yes, sir. Sharp ducked out into the street. A dog ran past with a cut of meat in its mouth. He preferred not to wonder what kind of meat it was. The smoke of the French cannons drifted over the village roofs, low enough to touch the belfry. Once or twice the bell would clang as a fragment of canister bounced from the bridge to strike the instrument. Sir! Sir!
Sharp looked left. Harry Price was running towards him. Mr. Sharp! Harry! Sharp grinned. Lieutenant Price, formality forgotten, thumped Sharp on the back. He had been Sharp's lieutenant in the light company. Christ, I thought the buggers had hanged you! This army can't do anything right, Harry! It was the twentieth time he'd said it. Price was beaming. What in hell's name happened? Long story. Here. Price thrust a bottle of brandy at Sharp. Found it in their headquarters. Sharp smiled. Later, Harry. There might be more to do. God, I hope not. I want to live to be thirty. Price tipped the bottle to his mouth. I suppose you're the commanding officer now? You suppose right. Leroy's body had been brought into the village. His death had at least been quick. Leroy would have known nothing. The other consolation was that he had left no family, no letters that needed to be written or widow to console. The guns still fired at the bridge. Sharp frowned. Why in hell haven't we got guns? I heard they got lost. Price grinned. This bloody army never does anything right. Jesus, it's good to see you, sir. And, oddly to Sharp, it seemed the whole battalion thought the same. The officers wanted to shake his hand, the men wanted to look at him as if to prove to themselves that he still lived, and he grinned shyly at their pleasure. Angel, who had come into the village with Sharp's horse, basked in their reflected glory. Dozens of bottles were thrust at Sharp, dozens of times he claimed that the army couldn't hang a curtain if they tried. He knew he was smiling idiotically, but he could not help it. He shook Harry Price off by ordering him to set up pickets at the village's northern edge and took refuge from embarrassment in his temporary headquarters, where someone else found him. Sir? The doorway was shadowed by a huge man who was festooned with weapons. Sharp felt the smile coming again. Patrick? Christ! The sergeant ducked under the lintel. There were tears in his eyes. I knew you'd be back. Couldn't let you bastards fight a war without me. No. Harper grinned. There was an odd silence which both men broke together. Sharp waved at the Irishman. Go on. No, sir. You. Just that it's good to be back. Aye. Harper stared at him. What happened? Long story, Patrick. It would be. There was silence again. Sharp felt an immense relief that the sergeant was alive and well. He knew he should say something to that effect, but it would be too embarrassing. Instead, he waved at the window ledge. Paddock made some tea. Grand. Is Isabella well? Oh, she's just grand, sir. Harper tipped the cup up and drained it. Mr. Leroy gave us permission to get married. That's wonderful. I, well, Harper shrugged. There's a wee one on the way, sir. I think Mr. Leroy thought it would be best. Probably. Harper smiled. I had a bet with Mr. Dallenbord that you'd be back, sir. Sharp laughed. You'll need money if you're going to marry, Patrick. Aye, that's true. Nothing like a woman for spending a man's money, eh? So when's the wedding? As soon as I can find a priest. She's got herself a dress, so she has. It's got frills. He said it gloomily. You'll let me know. Of course. Harper was embarrassed. You know what women are like, sir? Mm, I've seen one or two, Patrick. Aye, uh, well, they like marrying, so they do. He shrugged. Especially when they're pregnant, yes? Harper laughed. There was silence again. The huge sergeant put the cup down. "'Tis grand to see you, sir. You won your bet, eh? Only a bloody pound. You had that much faith in me, eh? They laughed again. A horse's hooves were loud outside. A voice shouted, "'South Essex! In here!' Sharp shouted back, glad suddenly of the distraction from the emotion he felt. A staff officer dismounted and ducked under the lintel. Colonel Leroy, he straightened up. It was Lieutenant Michael Trumper Jones, in his hand a folded order for the battalion. He stared at Sharp, his mouth dropped open, and his head slowly shaking and his eyes widening, he fell backwards in a dead faint. 
His scabbard chains clinked as he slumped on the floor. Sharp nodded at the prostrate body. That's the bugger who defended me. Harper laughed, then cocked his head. Listen. The French guns had stopped. The bridge must have fallen, and suddenly Sharp knew what he wanted to do. Angel? Senor? Horses? Patrick? Sir? Grab that fool's horse. He pointed at Trumper Jones. We're going hunting. For what? Harper was already moving. Wedding presents? And a woman. Sharp followed Harper into the street, looked around and spotted a captain of the South Essex. Mr. Mahoney? Sir, you'll find orders in that house. Obey them. I'll be back. He gave the mystified Mahoney the letter for Hogan, swung onto Carbine's saddle and rode towards the bridge. To the north of Gamara Mayor, at a village called Durana, Spanish troops cut the great road. The defenders at Durana had been the Spanish regiments loyal to France. Countrymen fought countrymen, the bitterest clash, and Wellington's Spaniards, faithful to Spain, won the bridge at five o'clock. The great road to France was cut. The Spanish troops had climbed barricades of the dead. They had fought till their musket barrels were almost red hot, till they had savaged the defenders and won a great victory. They had blocked the great road. The French could still have broken through. They could have screened themselves to the west and thrown their great columns at the tired, blood-soaked Spaniards. But in the confusion of a smoke-filled plain, no one knew how few men had broken through in the rear. And all the time, minute by minute, the British battalions were coming from the west, while the great guns, massed wheel to wheel by Wellington, tore huge gaps in the French lines. The French broke. King Joseph's army, that had started the day with a confidence not seen by a French army in Spain for six years, collapsed. It happened desperately fast, and it happened in pieces. One brigade would fight, standing fast and firing at their enemies, while another would crumble and run at the first British volley. The French guns fell silent one by one, were limbered up and taken back towards the city. Generals lost touch with their troops. They shouted for information, shouted for men to stand. But the French line was being shredded by the regular staccato volleys of the British battalions, while overhead the British shells cracked apart in smoke and shrapnel, and the French troops edged backwards, and then came the rumour that the great road was cut, and that the enemy came from the north. In truth, the French guns still held the British at Gamara Mayor, and the Spaniards further north were too tired and too few to attack south. But the rumour finally broke the French army. It ran. It was early evening, the time when the trout were rising to feed in the river that flowed beneath the now unguarded bridge at Gamara Mayor. The French who had guarded the bridge so well had seen their comrades run. They joined the flight. The men who watched from the western hills or from the Puebla Heights were given a view of magnificence, a view granted to few men, an eagle's view of victory. The smoke cleared slowly from the plain to show an army marching forward, not in parade order, but in a more glorious order. From the mountains to the river, across two miles of burned and bloodied country, the Allied regiments were spread. They marched beneath their colours, and the sun lanced between the smoke to touch the ragged flags, red, white, blue, gold, and red again where the blood had soaked them. The land was heavy with the men who marched, regiment after regiment, brigade after brigade, climbing the low hills that had been the French second line. Their shadows went before them as they marched towards the city of Golden Spires, and in the city the women saw the French army break, saw the troops come running, saw the cavalry heading the panicked flight. The tiered seats emptied. Through the city, from house to house, the news spread, and the camp followers and families and lovers of the French began their own headlong flight from Vittoria. They were spurred on their way by Marshal Jourdain's last orders in Vittoria, orders brought by harried cavalrymen who shouted at the French to make for Salvatierra. The great road was cut, and the only road left for retreat was a narrow, damp track 
that wound its way towards Salvatierra and from there to Pamplona. From Pamplona, by tortuous paths, the army might struggle back to France through the high Pyrenees. The chaos began. Civilians, coaches, wagons and horses blocked the narrow streets while, to the west, beneath a sun hazed by the smoke of battle, the victorious battalions marched in their great line towards the city. The victors darkened the plain, and their colours were high. While to the south three horsemen crossed Gamara Mayor's bridge, they had to pick their way through the corpses, which were already thick with flies, onto the Zadora's northern bank. Sharp touched his heels to Carbine's flank. He had his victory, and now, with Harper and Angel beside him, he would ride into the chaos of defeat to search for the Marquesa. Chapter 24 the road to Pamplona was wide enough for a single wagon or gun. The verges and fields either side of the road were too softened by the rain to take either. On to that road the whole of the French army, with more than 20,000 camp followers, 3,000 wagons and over 150 guns and limbers, was trying to reach safety. All day the baggage park had listened to the thunder and watched the smoke over the spires of the cathedral. Now came the orders to retreat not up the great road, but directly east towards Salvatierra and Pamplona. Whips cracked. Oxen protested the iron-shod poles that prodded them into motion. And from a half-dozen field tracks, and from the crowded city streets, the vehicle started towards the single, narrow road. Into the confusion came the guns, thundering from the battlefield and adding their weight to the press of baggage and animals. The first wagon stuck just a hundred yards beyond the place where the field tracks converged on the road. A carriage, trying to go round it on the soft verge, overturned. A gun swerved, skidded, and the two tons of metal slammed into the carriage, horses screaming, gunners falling beneath the metal, and the road was blocked. Oxen, horses, carriages, wagons, carts, cannon, howitzers, portable forges, ambulances and limbers, all were trapped between the roadblock and the British. The wagons swarmed with people, soldiers fleeing the city, drivers, camp followers, all ran through the wagon park. Some began to slip the tarpaulins and drag boxes from the loads. Muskets fired as guards tried to protect the emperor's property, and then the guards realized that the emperor had lost this property and whoever took it now might keep it. They joined the looters. Thousands of French troops were streaming past the blocked wagons, trampling the crops and running eastwards. Generals rode with the cavalry, rehearsing the excuses they would make, while other men swerved into the wagons and searched desperately for wives and children. King Joseph was in his carriage, fleeing towards the roadblock, and then there was the thunder of hooves, the sight of lifted sabres, and the first British cavalry sent around the city descended on the panicked, fleeing mob. The king escaped only by abandoning his carriage. He scrambled from the right-hand door as the British cavalry wrenched open the left. He abandoned his belongings and ran with his erstwhile subjects. Women and children screamed. They did not know where their men were, only that the army had dissolved into a mob and they must run. Hundreds stayed in the baggage park, tearing the wagon loads down, not caring that the British cavalry were coming. Better to be rich for just a few minutes than eternally poor. From the city came the Spaniards, many with long knives ready for the slaughter. Captain Saumier heard the shout for the army to go to Salvatierra, and guessed that the city's single eastern gate would already be cramming with desperate people. He shouted at the coachman to go for the north gate. It was a sensible move. The narrow eastern streets were filled with carriages and wagons, with men shouting and women screaming in fear. Sommier would take La Marquesa through the northern gate and then turn east. The wheels bounced on the cobbles, skidded at one corner, but the driver held the balance and cracked the long whip over the horses' heads. Sommier, his one good hand holding a pistol, leaned from the window and saw the city gate ahead. Go on! Go on! His voice was loud over the harsh sound of the wheels and hooves, over the crack of the whip, 
and the shouts of other fugitives. General Varigny had told Captain Saumier to protect this woman, and Saumier, who thought her more beautiful than any woman he had ever seen, hoped that his protection would merit a reward. The carriage slowed to pass the narrow gate. A soldier tried to jump onto the step, and Saumier hit the man with the brass butt of his pistol. The man fell under the wheel, screaming. The carriage leaped into the air, jarred down, and then it was through the archway and rattling down the street of houses that lay outside the wall. The coachman turned the horses eastwards at a crossroads, shouted at them, cracked the whip again, and the carriage picked up speed as Saumier leaned back on the upholstered cushions and pushed his pistol into his belt. La Marquesa, her maid, nervous beside her, looked at him. Where are we going? Wherever we can, dear lady. Saumier was nervous. He could see the men running from the battle and could hear the heavy noise of the gun wheels coming from the plain. As the coach cleared the last houses of the northern suburb, he leaned again from the window and was appalled by the chaos he saw. It was as if a whole army ran a panicked race. Then he heard the brake shoes slap on the wheels. He lurched as the carriage slowed, and he looked ahead to see the massive jam of wagons, guns, and carriages that blocked the eastern road. Go round! Go round! The coachman pulled on the reins, bumping the carriage off the road and onto the verge. He shouted at the horses, cracking the whip above their ears, and the carriage seemed to surge and heave its way over the wet ground. Yet, whipped the horses as he could, the coachman knew the carriage was slowing. The rear of the coach dipped, and Saumier, opening the door to lean out, saw people clinging to the baggage rack. He threatened them with his pistol, but their weight had slowed the carriage too much. The wheels were already sinking into the morass. And slowly, finally, it stopped. Saumier swore. A dozen people were running towards the horses, knives drawn to cut the traces and use the animals for their own escape. He reached for La Marquesa, politeness forgotten, and pulled her out of the coach. Come on! The maid was hunched into a corner, refusing to go out into the panic mass of people. La Marquesa, made of sterner stuff, jumped onto the wet ground. Saumier saw she had a pistol. Stop them! A man was hacking at the silver trace chains of the horses. La Marquesa aimed at him. Her teeth gritted, pulled the trigger, and the man screamed, blood spurting from his neck. And Captain Saumier, his own pistol thrust into his sling, finished the man's work by hacking down with his sabre. He led the horse from the harness. My lady! Wait! She had climbed onto the driver's seat, lifted the coachman's bench, and now dragged a leather sack from the compartment beneath. She gestured Saumier to lead his horse closer. Then, modesty gone and not caring who saw her legs, she slithered across from the driving perch onto the horse's back. Saumier climbed up behind La Marquesa and shook the long driving rein with his good hand. Behind them, sabres raised, the British cavalry swept towards the roadblock. The coachman had taken another horse and galloped eastwards. Saumier kicked back with his heels, and the horse, frightened and lively, went into a gallop that took them past the stuck wagons. La Marquesa, mourning the fact that she'd been forced to abandon all her belongings and her wealth, saw the soldiers and their women scattering silver dollars on the ground and scrambling at the wagons for more plunder. There were riches to be made here this day, but the British were coming fast from the west, and she would ride eastwards to safety. Saumier, the bandage on his eye flecked with mud thrown up by the hooves, took her to the north of the road and galloped onwards. Pierre Ducot, in the stables of the French headquarters, had kept a swift English horse taken from a captured officer. He had mounted it when disaster struck, had taken his precious papers, and was already a mile beyond the blockage on the road. He paused where the road climbed a small rise, and looked behind. A rabble swarmed towards him. Soldiers, bloody soldiers, trust the soldiers to lose a country which could have been kept by politics and guile. He smiled thinly. He did not feel any desperate sadness at defeat. He had become used to military defeats while in Spain. Wellington against the Emperor, he thought, that would be a battle worth seeing, like ice meeting fire, or intelligence meeting genius. He turned east again. He had planned for defeat, and now France would find its salvation in his plans. The fine, intricate machine he had wrought, the Treaty of Valencay, would be needed after all.
He smiled thinly, spurred his horse, and rode towards the greatness he had so long planned. Somia had chosen to go north of the road, well clear of the panic, but he had chosen wrong. A great ditch faced him, full of dirty water, but without a saddle and with the horse double ridden, he knew he could not jump it. He slid from the horse's back. Stay there, my lady. I'd not planned on leaving you, Captain. Sommier gripped the long driving reins with the fingers of his injured arm and walked to the ditch's edge. He plumbed it with his sabre and found that it was shallow, but with a soft, treacherous bottom. Sit tight, my lady. Hold on to the collar. The horse was nervous, so Sommier would have to lead it through the ditch. He stepped into the water and felt his boot sucked into the slimy mud. He slipped, held his balance, then tugged on the reins. The horse nervously came forward. It put its head down, and La Marchese gripped the mane. Sommier smiled at her with his yellow teeth. Don't frighten it, my lady. Gently now. Gently. The horse stepped into the water. Come on. Come on. A horseman took the ditch in one stride a few yards to Sommier's left. The Frenchman looked up, fearing a British cavalryman. But the man wore no uniform. Sommier tugged on the reins again. Come on, boy, come on! La Marchesa screamed, and Sommier looked up at her, ready to chide her for frightening the horse. Then he saw why she had shouted in fear. The horseman had stopped beyond the ditch. The man grinned at Sommier. More horsemen were behind La Marchesa. One of them was a huge man with a beard that seemed to grow from every part of his face. The bearded man came forward and smiled. From his belt he drew a pistol. Sommier let go of the reins. He had his sabre drawn, but his boots were stuck in the filth of the ditch's bottom. El Matarife still smiled. He had followed the carriage from the city, and now he had found the woman he had been ordered to capture. She was to be taken to a nunnery. Those were his brother's orders. But El Matarife planned to give her one taste of the joys she would miss in the close confinement of a convent. He glanced at her, and she was more beautiful than a man could wish for, even screaming in horror at the sight of his face. The man in the ditch dropped his saber and fumbled for the pistol in his holster. El Matarife pulled his trigger. Captain Sommier jerked backwards, hands flying up and pistol falling. He splashed into the ditch, his boots slowly sucking up from the bubbling mud. He floated. His blood drifted in the dirty water, spreading as he died, choking on ditch water and blood. El Matarife smiled at La Marchesa, at the woman whose golden hair had been like a beacon in the havoc. My lady, he said. He began to laugh, the laugh getting louder and louder until it blotted out the screams of the chaos. My lady... My dear lady. He reached for her, dragged her belly downwards over his saddle. She screamed, and he slapped her rump to keep her quiet, then headed back towards the wagons. As he had followed her carriage here, he had seen the gold and silver scattered like leaves upon the ground. There would be time, he knew, to take some for himself, before he delivered the golden whore to her new prison. He went into the chaos with his prisoner. Chapter 25 God save Ireland! Patrick Harper's favourite oath, saved only for the things that truly astonish him, was hardly sufficient to describe what he saw as he crossed the shallow crest where the grass was still scorched from the French guns that had made the slaughter on the bridge. He tried another. God save England, too! Sharp laughed. The sight for a few seconds had taken his mind from La Marquesa. Angel stared open-mouthed. An army was running a race. Thousands and thousands of Frenchmen, all order gone, ran between the river and the city, streaming eastwards, abandoning muskets, packs, anything that would slow them. From Sharp's right, cavalry approached, British cavalry who stared and laughed at the tide of panicked men. Their major came towards Sharp and grinned. It's cruel to charge them. Sharp smiled. Do you have a glass, Major? The cavalryman offered Sharp a small spyglass. The rifleman opened it, trained it, and saw what he thought he had seen with his naked eye. The road was blocked. 
There were hundreds, perhaps thousands of wagons that were stuck in the fields east of Vitoria. He could see carriages there, their windows red from the setting sun. There was a woman there and a treasure there. He closed the glass and gave it back to the cavalryman. You see those wagons, Major? Yes. There's a goddamn fortune there, the gold of a bloody empire. The cavalryman stared at Sharp as if he was mad, then slowly smiled. You're sure? I'm sure. It's a king's ransom. The cavalryman looked at Angel, ragged on his stolen horse, then at Harper, huge on his. You think you can keep up with us? Think you can keep up with us? Sharp smiled. In truth, he needed these hussars to help cut through the panicked mass of fugitives who still streamed between them and the city. The Major grinned, brushed at his moustaches, and turned to look at his men. Troop! The trumpeter challenged the sky. The troopers drew their sabres and walked the horses forward. The men were in ranks of ten, knee to knee. The Major drew his sabre and looked at Sharp. This is going to be better than a strong scent on a fine day. He looked at his trumpeter and nodded. The trumpet sounded the gallop. There was no other way to go through the flood of fugitives, and the hussars shouted, raised their sabres, and plunged into the fleeing army. If Sharp had not been so concerned for the fate of La Marquesa, he would have remembered that ride forever. The hussars cut into the French retreat like men going into a dark river, and just as in a river the current took them downstream. The French, seeing their enemy coming, parted before the horses, and only those who could not move fast enough were cut down by the curved blades. They went like steeple chasers. They crossed a small stream, hooves shattering water silver in the air, scrambled up a field bank, jumped a stone wall, and the men whooped like maniacs and the French split before them. The hooves hurled mud higher than the guidon that was held aloft by the standard bearer. There were guns everywhere, abandoned field guns with blackened muzzles, their wheels mired in the soft earth. The cavalry rode in the middle of their enemies, and not a hand was lifted against them. There were carts overturned, mules running free, wounded men crawling eastwards, and everywhere there were women. They called for their men, for their husbands or lovers, and their voices were forlorn and hopeless. The Major, breaking free of the French route, cut his men towards the wagons. Sharp shouted at Harper and Angel, pulled left, and reined Carbine in. He had stopped by a dark blue carriage, its wheels sunk into soft turf, its varnished panels spattered with mud. He stared at the coat of arms that was painted on the carriage door. He knew it. He had seen it first on another carriage in Salamanca's splendid square. It was La Marquesa's carriage, and it was empty. The upholstery had been split open and the horses led away. One window was broken. He peered inside and saw no blood on the torn cushions of the seats. One silver trace chain was left in the mud. He stared into the havoc of wagons and carriages. She could be anywhere in that chaos of shouting and theft, of musket shots and screams. Or she could be gone. Harper looked at the carriage and frowned. Sir? Patrick. Would that be her ladyship's? Yes. Is that why we're here? Yes. I want to find her. God knows how. The Irishman stared at the baggage park. You say there's treasure here? A goddamn fortune. Seems a good place to start looking, sir. Sharp urged his horse towards the wagons. He was looking for the great mane of golden hair amidst the chaos that had once been King Joseph's baggage train. Alain! A box of fine porcelain was spilt ahead of him. The plate smashed into a thousand gilded shards. A woman, blood streaming from her scalp, hurled a second dinner service out of its packing cases, looking for gold. A French soldier lay dying, his throat half cut by a Spaniard, who ripped with his knife at the man's pockets. He found a watch, a stolen masterpiece made by Breguet in Paris. He put it to his ear, heard no tick, and furiously smashed the crystal with the hilt of his knife. Alain! Sharp's horse trampled on leather-bound books, books that had been made before the printing press had been invented, books made by patient men over months of work, with exquisitely painted capitals that were now ground into the mire. 
a tapestry that had been made in Flanders when Queen Elizabeth was a child, was torn by two women to make blankets. Another woman, wine bottle in hand, danced between the wagons with the gilded coat of a royal chamberlain on her shoulders. She wore nothing else. A French soldier, drunk on brandy, plucked the coat from her and tore at the gilt braid. The naked woman hit him with her bottle and snatched the coat back. Alain! Silver Spanish dollars, each worth five English shillings, were strewn like pebbles between the wagons. No one wanted silver when there was so much gold. Alain! Two men bent, twisted, and hacked apart a golden candelabra, one of a set of four that had been given to King Philip II by Queen Mary of England when she'd married the Spanish king. Alain! Two French women, abandoning their army and their children for the sake of a box of jewels, prized the stones from a reliquary that contained the shin bone of John the Baptist. The jewels were glass, replacements for the real stones that had been stolen three centuries before. They dropped the shin bone into the mud, where it was snapped up by a dog. One man shot another to get a wooden box that the victim had been dragging away. The murderer took it beneath a wagon, reloaded his musket, and blew the lock off. It contained horseshoes and nails. Alain! It was hopeless. The wagons seethed with people. He could see nothing. Sharp swore. A four-year-old child, abandoned by its mother, was trampled by a rush of men towards an untouched wagon. The child cried, unheard and unseen, its ribs broken. Alain! A Frenchman ran at Sharp, musket held like a club, and tried to knock the rifleman from his horse. Sharp snarled, chopped down with the sword, knocked the musket aside, and chopped again. The man screamed, the sword cut into his neck, shearing his ear off, and then Harper's gun butt slammed into the other side of his head. The man fell, golden francs spilling from his pockets, and in an instant he was set on by a score of people who slashed with knives and scrambled in the mud for gold. There were acres of wagons, hundreds of them, many as the plunderers were. There were still scores of untouched wagons. Alain! He galloped down between a row of wagons, turned into the next row and galloped back. Silver dollars were beneath carbine's hooves. A woman tossed and unrolled a bolt of silk, scarlet in the failing sunlight, silk that arched and fell into the mud. A man threw crates of silver cutlery off a wagon, spilling them into the mud, searching for gold. Alain! A woman staggered towards Sharp, blood flowing in a dozen rivulets down her head and matting her hair. She had found her box of gold, but a man had taken it from her. She cried, not from the pain, but from loss. She picked up some silver forks and thrust them into her dress. Alain! A man, trousers at his knees, was on top of a woman by an overturned coach. Sharp hit him with the flat of the sword, trying to see the woman's face. She had none. It was just blood from a cut throat. The man tried to scramble away, but Sharp sliced the sword in a backswing and cut the man's throat, as he had cut his victims. A pretty girl, incongruously dressed in tight French cavalry uniform, danced on top of a wagon and whirled a rope of pearls. A British cavalryman laughed with her, protecting her, and then bent to scoop more pearls from a box. A horde of people, seeing the treasure, scrambled like rats up to the wagon's top. Alain! Sharp put his heels back, shouting at the plunderers to clear the way. A drunk, a bottle of priceless wine in each hand, staggered in Carbine's path, and a horse threw the man down. Sharp held his balance, urged the horse on, and never noticed the painting that the hooves trampled. Van Dyke had worked long on the canvas which was pulled out of the mud by a man who needed a tarpaulin to cover a mule load of plunder. Alain! A box of Légion d'Honneur medals was tossed to the crowd. The Spaniards, laughing, attached the medals to hang beneath their horses' tails. Angel caught one and laughed at the trophy. A British cavalryman ripped a tarpaulin from a wagon to find pictures beneath. They'd been cut from their frames. He pulled a Rubens from the top of the pile to see if it concealed gold. It did not, and he rode on looking for better plunder. 
a golden clock made in Augsburg 300 years before that showed the houses of the zodiac, the phases of the moon, as well as the time, was hacked apart by men with bayonets for the sake of its golden case. One of them, piercing his palm with the clock's dragon hand, smashed at it with the butt of his musket. The brass and iron clockwork that had been cared for over centuries was scattered in the mud. Its jeweled astrolabe was carried off by a British sergeant. Elaine! They searched row after row of wagons until Sharp felt the hopelessness rise in him. He reined in and looked at Harper. It's no good. The Irishman shrugged. He looked eastwards into the valley of the Pamplona Road that was thick with fugitives. She'd have been foolish to stay around here, sir. That had been his private opinion ever since they began this frantic, useless galloping amongst the stranded wagons. He wondered just what had happened to Sharp in the last weeks. Somehow he was not surprised that the golden-haired woman was involved. Sharp always had been a fool for women. Sharp swore. He wiped his sword on his leg and sheathed it. A barefooted British infantry captain walked past. He carried his boots carefully. Both boots filled to the top with gold twenty-franc pieces. Three of his men cheerfully guarded him. Another woman dressed in French cavalry uniform called to Sharp for protection. Sharp ignored her. He was staring about him, watching the plunderers tear at wagons. He tried to see La Marquesa's golden hair. A British infantryman, one of the many who now swarmed into the baggage, grabbed the woman's hand. She clung to him and went happily enough with her new guardian. Harper edged his horse close to the nearest wagon. If Major Sharp wanted to look for a woman, Harper might as well look for a marriage settlement. The wagon had words stenciled on its backboard. Domaine extérieur de S.M. L'Empereur. He wondered what they meant, then drew his knife, slashed the tarpaulin, and started working at the first box. Sharp watched the British infantry come like children into this wonderland of treasure. He thought of La Marquesa's wagons and wondered if they too were being stripped, and if she was trying to protect them from the muskets and bayonets. He stood in his stirrups. God damn it! Her carriage was here. She must be close by. And then he supposed that she must have fled eastwards and abandoned her wealth. Or perhaps Ducot had taken her. He swore again. He wished he would meet Ducot in this chaos for one brief moment, a moment long enough to use the heavy sword. God in his Irish heaven, Jesus, Mary, Mother of God, would you be looking at this? God save Ireland! Sharp turned. Harper held up a diamond necklace. The Irishman looked at Sharp with pure delight. Open your haversack, sir. Patrick? For Christ's sake, open your haversack. Sharp frowned. He was thinking of La Marquesa. Mr. Sharp, sir! What? He snapped the word, still trying to see the golden mane of hair in the failing light. Give us your bloody haversack! Harper shouted it, as if he was addressing a particularly stupid recruit. Give it to me! Sharp obeyed, hardly knowing what he was doing. Harper called to Angel to help him. They tethered their horses to the wagon and stood on the load to leave her open the locked chests. Harper was emptying the first chest of small leather boxes, each lined with white silk. He tossed the leather boxes away, keeping the jewels that they contained. He worked fast, knowing as a soldier to take swift advantage of good luck. He opened leather box after leather box, taking out necklaces, tiaras, bracelets, earrings, drops, brooches, scabbard furniture, enameled decorations studded with stones. Enough pieces for Sharp's haversack, his own, and Angel's pockets. He buckled Sharp's haversack and tossed it to his officer. A welcome home present, sir. Sharp slung the haversack on his shoulder. Where the hell is she? Jesus knows. Harper wrenched open another box and swore. The box had velvet napkins folded carefully between tissues. Harper spilt it onto the ground and worked his knife beneath a new lid. God in his heaven! The box had gold altar furniture in it, ewers, cups, candlesticks, a jeweled monstrance, and a great golden crucifix. He took the smaller items. Angel had found a set of dueling pistols, their butts chased with gold. He pushed them into his belt. Patrick! Sharp's voice was urgent. Sir, follow me! 
Sharp had put Carbine into a gallop, disappearing into the chaos. Harper had caught a glimpse of his officer's face, and he thought that never had he seen Sharp look so grim and savage. The Irishman looked at Angel. Come on, lad! Harper mounted his horse. He had made himself rich beyond the wildest dreams of the wildest Irishman that ever marched to war, and, like a true friend, he had made Sharp rich too. Of course, the Englishman had not noticed, but that was Mr. Sharp. Mr. Sharp was thinking of someone else, of another treasure. Harper looked into the seething mass of plunderers. Where the hell is he? Sharp had disappeared. Harper stood in his stirrups and stared about the seething mass of people who swarmed around the half stripped wagons. The setting sun bathed the whole scene in a vivid blood red light. There was laughter and tears all about him. Where the hell is he? There, senor. Angel was still standing on the wagon. He pointed south. El Matarife. What? The boy was pointing at a band of horsemen. In their lead was a man who looked half beast, a hulking brute with a face of thick hair, a man who had a woman held on her belly over his saddle. The woman, Harper saw, had hair the color of fine gold. Harper urged his horse through the crowd. He saw how many armed men were with the bearded man. He saw, too, that Sharp was riding alone towards them, and he knew that Sharp, in this savage mood, would think nothing of taking on all those horsemen with his sword. Only one thing puzzled Harper, and that was the presence, in Sharp's left hand, of a great length of silver chain. Harper cocked his seven barreled gun and rode, a rich man, to the fight. Chapter 26 The Last Chapter Sharp had seen El Matarife. The partisan with a group of his men was stripping one of the French wagons that had brought the defeated army's arrears of pay. Some of his men unloaded the gold twenty franc pieces. The rest kept other looters away. El Matarife had La Marquesa over his saddle. Sharp knew he could not defeat all of them. There were twenty muskets there that would snatch him from the saddle and leave her to the mercy of the bearded man. Yet El Matarife, Sharp knew, would not be able to resist a challenge to his manhood. There was one way, and one way only, that this fight must be fought. He swerved carbine towards La Marquesa's abandoned carriage. He drew his sword, and reaching the vehicle, he leaned down, grasped the last trace chain, and hacked with his sword at the leather strap which held it to the splinter bar. He looped the chain in his left hand and turned towards his enemy. Weeks before, he thought, he had been foolish enough to accept a challenge to a duel. Now he would issue the challenge. He rode towards the wagon, and the men who ripped at the chest stopped when they saw him coming. They called to their leader, and El Matarife, who had been told that this man was dead, crossed himself and stared at the tall rifleman who came out of the scarlet-lit chaos. Shoot him! But no one moved. The rifleman had tossed a silver chain onto the ground into the mud that was thick with unwanted silver dollars, and he stared with savage loathing at the bearded man. Are you a coward, Matarife? Do you only fight women? Still, none of them moved. Those who had been scooping handfuls of gold from the broken chests stared at the tall Englishman who slowly, his eyes on El Matarife, dismounted. Sharp unbuckled his sword. He laid it with his haversack beside the wheel of the wagon. El Matarife looked down at the chain, then back to Sharp as the rifleman looped the silver links about his upper left arm. Sharp left a length of the chain to swing free from his arm. Are you a coward, Matarife? El Matarife's answer was to swing himself from his saddle. He dragged La Marquesa down and pushed her towards his men, shouting at them to hold her and keep her. She cried out as she stumbled, as a man reached down and seized her golden hair and held her against the flank of his horse. And as she turned and saw Sharp standing in the wheel churned mud and silver, Richard! Her eyes were huge, staring in disbelief. Like her captor, in a half-forgotten gesture from her past, she touched her face, her belly, and her breasts in the sign of the cross. Richard? Helene. He smiled at her, seeing her fear, her astonishment, her beauty. Even here the sight of that unfair loveliness struck into his soul like a dagger. Behind Sharp, Harper curbed his horse. He took Carbine's rein, then leaned down and retrieved Sharp's sword and haversack. Behind you, sir, 
Watch the bastards, Patrick. Put a bullet into them if they take her away. Sharp had spoken in Spanish, a language that Harper had learned from Isabella. Consider it done, sir. The partisans were awed by the huge man who sat on his horse with his two guns, one of them larger than any gun they'd ever seen held by a man. Beside Harper was Angel with his rifle in his practiced hands. Angel was staring at the woman he thought more beautiful than lust. The sky was darkening towards night. The west reddened with the sun's setting. Skeins of smoke, dark blue-gray against the cloudless sky, stretched above the field of plunder in delicate rills. They were the guns detritus, the drifting remnants of the battle that had been and gone on Vittoria's plain. El Matarife shrugged off his heavy cloak. You can ride away, Englishman. You will live. Sharp laughed. I shall count the ways of your death, coward. El Matarife stooped, picked up the chain and knotted it about his upper arm. He drew his knife and, with a patronizing smile on his wet lips that showed through the thick hair of his face, threw it to Sharp. It turned in the air, catching the dying sun, and landed at Sharp's feet. It was bone-handled, with a blade as long as a bayonet's. The blade looked delicate. It was thin, needle-pointed, and its two edges were feathered where it had been sharpened on the stone. This weapon, Sharp knew, would draw blood at the lightest stroke. In El Matarife's comfortable grip, taken from one of his lieutenants, was a similar blade, as bright, as sharp, as deadly. El Matarife stepped backwards and the silver chain slowly lifted from the mud. The links clinked softly. The partisan smiled. You're a dead man, Englishman. Sharp remembered the terrible skill with which his enemy had taken the eyes from the French prisoner. He waited. El Matarife's men were silent. From the city came the jangling of church bells announcing that the French were gone and that the first Allied troops were in the narrow streets. The chain tightened. The sun reddened its links. The slaughter man smiled. His pole-axe was stuck into the ground at the edge of the circle made by his men. He pulled against sharp strength until the silver links were as taut as a bar of steel, and the only evidence of the huge strengths that opposed each other were the scraps of mud that fell from the tight links. Sharp felt the pressure on his arm. El Matarife was pulling with extraordinary force. Sharp pulled back and saw the slaughter man's eyes judging him. The slaughter man jerked. Sharp's arm came up, he jerked back, and the slaughter man was grunting and pulling, and Sharp was jarred forward. He pulled back, knowing he did not have the same brute strength as his enemy, but when he saw the slaughter man smile and gather his strength for a massive pull, Sharp jumped forward to throw the man off balance. The slaughter man was ready, he had expected it, invited it, and he closed the ten-foot gap with lightning speed and his knife slashed up towards Sharp, bright in the dusk light. The rifleman swerved, not bothering to reply, backed away, and his left hand caught the chain for greater leverage, and he pulled on it with all his power, and the slaughter man did not move. El Matarife looked at Sharp's gritted teeth and laughed. <laughs> Your death will be slow, Englishman. The crowd, swollen by people from the city, shouted an abrupt, brief shout in appreciation of the slaughterman's skill. El Matarife acknowledged the cheer with a wave of his knife and then hooked his left hand over the chain. He stepped back, tightening it. The power came. It pulled sharp forward. He could not resist it, and he saw the slaughterman smile with the ease of the task. Sharp braced his feet but his boots slid in the mire, and he was being dragged towards his opponent. Then the jerking began, the vicious hard jerks that pulled him off balance, and he tripped, fell, and the chain was pulling his arm from his socket, and when the pressure stopped, he rolled to one side, knowing the knife was slicing down, only to hear the slaughter man laughing. <laughs> the Englishman is frightened. Sharp stood up. His jacket and overalls were smeared with mud. The crowd was catcalling, jeering him. The slaughter man had simply made a fool of him to demonstrate his strength. 
El Matarife was smiling now, smiling with relief and triumph. He had made this kind of fighting his speciality, and he would play with Sharp as Sharp had watched him play with the French prisoner. El Matarife beckoned Sharp forward. Come, Englishman, come. Come on. Come to your death. Sharp dropped his left arm and flexed it. He went forward. El Matarife waited. He was crouching, the knife low. He began to shake the chain, trying to loop it about Sharp's blade, but Sharp simply held his left arm out, and the chain went away from him. Come, Englishman. They were close now, four feet from each other, both men staring into the other's eyes, both knives held low. Neither moved. The crowd was silent. When El Matarife moved, it was as fast as a scorpion's strike. But Sharp had fought all his life, and his own speed matched that of the Spaniard. Sharp stepped back, and the blade hissed past his face. Sharp smiled. El Matarife bellowed at him, trying to frighten him, and then looped the chain high so it would fall over Sharp's head. Sharp caught the loop as it came, jerked on it, and sliced up with his knife as the Spaniard's guard was lifted. And Sharp saw the sudden fear on the beast's face as El Matarife realized Sharp's speed and as the rifleman's knife whipped upwards. Oh no! El Matarife's right forearm was bleeding. The crowd was silent. Sharp had gone back as fast as he had moved forward. The Spaniard growled. He had underestimated the Englishman, even let him live as a boast to the crowd. But now El Matarife planned Sharp's death. He stepped back, tightening the chain, and began again to try and tug Sharp off balance, jerking the silver chain with massive strength. But this time Sharp stepped into the pool, letting himself be dragged forward. And the slaughter man had to step back and keep stepping back until he was at the edge of the fighting space with nowhere to go. And Sharp laughed at him. You're a traitor, Spaniard, and your mother whored with swine. El Matarife roared and leaped forward. The knife seared high, coming at Sharp's eyes, dropped and slashed upwards. Oh, no! El Matarife was shouting it in triumph, and the crowd shouted with him. Sharp would have waking nightmares about that moment forever. The knife was within a half inch of slicing his belly open, slicing from his groin to his ribs and spilling his guts onto the silvered mud. And he would never know how his body moved so fast, or how his right hand, seeing the opening, slashed in to chop at the Spaniard's passing arm. He shouted as he jumped back, Dos! La Marquesa had cried out and hidden her eyes with her hands. The crowd breathed out a great sigh. The Englishman was not touched. El Matarife was panting, his great chest heaving beneath his black leather coat. Both his forearms were cut. Harper breathed a huge sigh of relief. God save Ireland! Will he win? Angel asked. I don't know, lad. I tell you one thing. What? I'll shoot that fat bastard through the gut before I kills Mr. Sharp. Angel hefted his rifle. I kill him. I'm Spanish. The chain tightened as Sharp stepped back. In his left hand, he held a loose end of the chain. He watched El Matarife's eyes, saw the moment when the partisan would challenge the pressure of the chain, and Sharp went suddenly forward. He lunged with the knife, going low, still watching the eyes between their mats of hair, and as the slaughterman brought up his knife arm to spear the point into Sharp's face, the rifleman whiplashed the silver chain. The end struck the bestial face, slashing across his eyes to sting and momentarily blind him. And Sharp turned, kicked, and his right boot heel was going where he'd wanted it to go, thumping into El Matarife's left knee with sickening force, tearing down and away, grinding kneecap and flesh. And the slaughter man's eyes widened in pain as his knife came desperately down in defense. Sharp was falling. He saw the blade come, felt it razor into his skin, slicing through his leather boot as if it was cotton. And then he was scrambling away from the huge man, and the roar of the crowd was like thunder among the wagons. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! El Matarife jumped forward, and Sharp heard the cry of pain as his weight went onto the wounded knee. The pain gave Sharp time to roll to his feet, and the crowd, that had been noisy with anticipation, fell into uneasy silence. Harper, who had seen the boot heel slam into the knee, smiled to himself. El Matarife had not shouted the number with the crowd. His knee was on fire, the pains shooting up to his groin and down to his ankle. He had never faced a man this fast. Sharp laughed. 
You're slow, Matarife. God damn you, Englishman. El Matarife leapt at Sharp, knife going to the Englishman's groin, but his knee crumpled on him. He stumbled forward, and Sharp stepped back. Patrick Harper laughed. El Matarife tried to stand. Sharp jerked back, pulling him forward. The Spaniard tried again, and again the chain jangled as Sharp tugged it, and again the slaughter man was pulled forward into the maddened coins. El Matarife tried again, and again the rifleman wrenched him down. And this time Sharp jumped forward, and his foot was on the slaughter man's right wrist, pinning the knife into the mud. The slaughter man looked up at his enemy, seeing death. Sharp stared at the man. You let me live a moment ago, Matarife. I'll return you the favor. He stepped away. He let the Spaniard stand. Then pulled again, pulling all the huge man's weight onto the knee so that the bestial face screwed in pain and the great leather clad body fell once more to the mud. The crowd was silent. The slaughter man was on his hands and knees, staring up at Sharp, and as the rifleman came close, the partisan lunged again with his knife at Sharp's groin. But Sharp had moved faster. The loose end of the chain, whipped and curled about the slaughter man's hand, was jerked back, and El Matarife cried out as the chain crushed his fingers and snatched the knife from his grip. Sharp kicked it under the half plundered wagon. The rifleman went behind his enemy. He gripped the slaughter man's hair and jerked his head up. The crowd watched in silence. Sharp raised his voice. You hear me, Matarife? I hear you. Sharp spoke even louder. You and your brother work for the French. No. But the blade was at the side of El Matarife's neck. You work for the French, slaughter man. You whore for the French. No. And the big bearded man tried to seize Sharp's wrist. But the blade moved away, and Sharp's hand jerked back on the thick, greasy hair, and his knee ground into the slaughter man's spine so that the huge beard jutted out above his throat. Who killed the Marquess? There was silence. Sharp did not know what answer he expected, but the lack of any answer seemed to suggest that the question was not foolish. He pulled on the hair and let the blade rest on the skin of El Matarife's neck. Who killed the Marquess? The slaughter man suddenly wrenched forward and his hands reached for Sharp's wrist, but Sharp hauled back and flicked the knife sideways to slash the reaching hands of his enemy. Who killed him? I did! It came out as a scream. His hands were soaked in blood. Sharp almost let him go, so surprised was he by the answer. He had expected to be told that the Inquisitor had done it. But it made sense that this man, the brother of the clever, ruthless priest, would be the killer. He put the knife back on the neck. He spoke lower now, so that only the slaughter man could hear him. The partisans were watching Sharp, and Harper was watching the partisans. Sharp bent down. You killed that girl to fool me, Matarife. There was no answer. Sharp remembered the hanging, turning, blooded body. He remembered the prisoner blinded. He paused, then struck. The knife was as sharp as a razor, honed to a wicked, feather bladed edge, and, tough as a man's throat is, with its gristle and tubes and muscle and skin, the knife cut the throat as easily as silk. There was a gasp as the blood gushed out, as it splashed once. Twice, and then the heart had nothing left to pump. And Sharp let go of the black hair. The slaughter man fell forward, and his bearded, brutal face fell into the mess of blood, mud, and silver. There was silence from all who watched. Sharp turned and walked towards La Marquesa. His eyes were on the man who held her, and in his eyes was a message of death. Slowly, his head shaking, the man let go of her. Sharp dropped the knife. She ran towards him, stumbling in the mud and silver coins, and his left arm was about her, and she pressed herself against his mud smeared chest. I thought you were dead. The first stars were visible above the plunder of an empire. He held the woman for whom he had ridden across Spain, for whom he had ridden the field of jewels and gold, of silk and diamonds.
She could never be his. He knew that. He had known that even when she had said that she loved him. Yet he would ride the fields of silver and pearls again for her. He would cross hell for her. He turned from El Matarife's men, and Harper threw down his sword and haversack. Sharp wondered why the bag was so heavy. He buckled the sword and knew he would have to go into the city and find the Inquisitor. There were questions to be put to that Inquisitor, and Sharp would be as delicate as the Inquisition in his search for the answers. He would go into Vittoria, and he would take the answers to the mystery that Hogan had asked him to solve. But that, he knew, was not the reason that he had come to this place. Not for victory, and not for gold. But for the woman who would cheat him, lie to him, never love him, but who was the whore of gold, and for this one night at least, Sharp's woman. Epilogue the army had gone, following the French towards the Pyrenees, and Vittoria was left to the Spanish battalions. Of the British, only a few staff officers and the South Essex were left. The South Essex to guard the French prisoners who would soon start their journey to Dartmoor, or the prison hulks. On a warm night, brilliant with starlight, Sharp was in the hotel where so many British officers, on the night of the battle, had enjoyed a free meal. He was in a vast room with windows that looked towards the cathedral on its hill. What is it? Open it. Hélène smiled at him. She was dressed in cream silk that was cut so low that one deep breath he was sure would tip her breasts over the lace-trimmed collar. She had given him a box. It was made from rosewood, polished to a deep shine, and it was locked with two golden clasps that he pushed aside. Go on, she said. Open it. He lifted the lid. The box was lined with red taffeta. Lying in a trough that ran the length of the box was a telescope. God, it's beautiful. Isn't it? She said with satisfaction. He lifted it. Its barrel was of ivory, its trimmings of gold, and it slid apart with extraordinary smoothness. There was a plate engraved and inset into the ivory. What does it say? She smiled, took the glass from him, and tipped it to the candlelight. To Joseph, King of Spain and the Indies, from his brother, Napoleon, Emperor of France. She laughed. A king's telescope for you. I bought it off one of your cavalrymen. It's wonderful. He took it from her, drew the tubes fully out, and stared with it at the sickle moon that hung over the northern hills. His last telescope, destroyed by Ducot, had been good, but it had been nothing compared with this instrument. It's wonderful, he said again. Of course, it's French, she smiled. My thank you to you for nothing. He put the telescope into its box, and she laughed at him. For nothing, then. Just for my wagons, my life. Little things like that. Nothing. He frowned, clasping the box shut. You'll take nothing from me. You are a fool, Richard Sharp. She walked to the window, raised her bare arms to the curtains, and paused as she stared into the night. Then abruptly she pulled the curtains closed and turned to him. You keep those diamonds. They have made you rich, and don't give them away. Not to me, not to anyone. Keep them. He smiled. Yes, ma'am. Because, Richard... And she touched his face with her finger. This war will not last forever, and when peace comes, you will need money. Yes, ma'am. There was a thump on the door, a hearty, loud hammering of a thump, and Sharp raised his voice. Oh, is it? Officer of the day, sir. It was Captain Dallambor's voice. What is it? I need you, sir. La Marquesa smiled. Go on, I'll wait. Sharp unlocked the door. I only just got here, Peter. The tall, elegant captain, who was more than a little drunk, bowed lavishly to Sharp. Your presence is demanded, sir. You'll forgive me, ma'am. They stopped at the stairs' head. Half the battalion were in the dining room that was littered with broken plates and discarded cutlery. Sharp doubted whether three-quarters of these men had ever eaten in such style. 
Someone had discovered, in a locked chest, a French trickler that was being paraded noisily about the room. Most of the men were drunk. Some were asleep. Only at the head table was there a hint of decorum, and even there not much. Sergeant Patrick Harper presided. Next to him, resplendent in white, with a veil of lace that had been taken from the French baggage park, sat Isabella. About her throat was a necklace of diamonds. Sharp doubted whether her husband would let her wear it again, at least not till they were safely away from the thieves of the British Army. Sharp had never seen a man so frightened as Harper. He had shaken in the cathedral. Sharp had given his sergeant two big glasses of whisky, but even they had not stopped his fear. It's ridiculous, sir. Getting married. Women like it, Patrick. Why do they need us? Why don't they just do it and tell us afterwards? Oh, Christ. Are you sure you want to go through with it? And let her down. Of course I'll do it. He was indignant. I just don't have to enjoy doing it. He was enjoying himself now. He was drunk, better fed than a soldier had a right to be, and with a pretty, pregnant, dark-eyed girl beside him. It's astonishing, Captain Dallambour observed, how she keeps him in order. Sharp smiled. He was a major again, reinstated to his rank, and in temporary command of the South Essex. The command would only be temporary. He had not served long enough as a major to be given the next rank, and so he must wait with these men to see who replaced Lieutenant Colonel Leroy. Wellington, furious almost beyond words at the looting of the baggage park, had spared praise for Sharp. The Inquisitor, his bruises explained as a tumble down his stairs, had provided the Generalissimo with a list of those men who had offered support to a peace with France. Already those men were being visited, were listening to quiet arguments that were not quite threats, but which were unmistakable just the same. The Inquisitor had offered another explanation of the Marquesa's death, an explanation listened to in silence by those Spanish officers brought to hear it. They had looked at Sharp, at Wellington, and a few, seeing the jest inherent in what they saw, had laughed. La Marquesa, who had provoked a smile from Wellington's anger, had taken her fortune from the Inquisitor's house. She had been promised safe conduct as soon as the roads to the frontier were cleared of the last French garrisons. Wellington, as ever susceptible to a pretty face, had listened to her account of the treaty and rewarded her treachery by restoring her wealth. She would go home, and Sharp was back where he belonged, with his men. He had eaten with them this night, made an embarrassing speech to them and laughed when they'd cheered the Marquesa, and, because of her dress, shouted at her to jump up and down. Now, standing at the stairs' head with Captain D'Alembourg, he felt a surge of affection for these soldiers whose life was so hard, and whose pleasures so few, and who knew how to take both hardship and pleasure in their stride. He looked at Captain D'Alembourg. Why did you need me? We just thought you'd gone to bed early, sir. Thought you might like to drink another toast. Sharp laughed. He went down the stairs and listened to the cheers and laughter of his men, saw the worried hotel proprietor who winced every time another plate or glass broke, and he walked up to the head table, reached for a bottle of champagne, smiled at Angel, who had been given the place of honour, then turned back to the stairs. "'Where are you going, sir?' a voice shouted. He did not reply. Instead, he waved the champagne, took the stairs two at a time, and the cheers, jeers, and whistles wafted him up to the landing, and the suggestions were thick about him as he turned at the top, raised the bottle, and bowed to them. He motioned for silence that was a long time coming, but finally the faces stared up at him, flushed with drink, and grinning broadly at the Major who had come back from the dead to lead them to victory. He wondered what he should say. Wellington, in his rage at the men who had plundered the baggage park, had called his army the scum of the earth. Sharp laughed aloud. He was proud of them. Talion! He paused. They waited. Morning parade at seven o'clock. Married men included. Good night. He turned, laughed, and their insults followed him to the door of his room. He went inside. The first thing he saw was a pair of shoes lying on their side. 
Beyond the shoes was a cream dress fallen on the floor. She was in bed. She smiled at the champagne, then at him, and Richard Sharp, leaning on the locked door, thought that this was what had driven him across Spain to this city. This woman, treacherous as sin, who would love and betray him in the same moment. She was as faithful as a morning mist, as hard as a sword bayonet, and that, he thought, made her a suitable reward for a soldier. He unbuckled his sword, dropped it on a chair, and sat on the bed. The Marchesa pulled his face to hers, kissed him, and put her hands to the buttons of his jacket. She was the whore of gold. She was the enemy. And she had known that this man, in the cause of her greed, would give to her his sword, his strength, and even his life. He would give her all that he had, all but for the one small thing that she had wanted. The one small thing she could not take. Sharp's Honour. A historical note. The material captured, wrote Charles Oman in his great history of the Peninsula War, was such as no European army had ever laid hands on, since Alexander's Macedonians plundered the camp of the Persian king after the Battle of Issus. Many of our men, wrote Commissary Sharman, and particularly those who found diamonds, became rich people that day. Edward Costello, a rifleman, reckoned that he made about a thousand pounds on the evening of the battle, helped by a few whacks of my rifle. The plunder of Vittoria was truly spectacular. In military terms, it was stunning. All the French guns, save two, 151 in all. And of the two guns the French did manage to salvage, one was lost during the retreat. But it was not the guns that the soldiers were interested in acquiring. No one truly knows the value of the plunder. I suspect the figure of five million pounds is a low estimate, and it could well have been seven million. In today's money, that translates to something like 154 million pounds, or 234 million dollars. Much of it was in such non-negotiable items as paintings by Rubens, though even those had their uses as tarpaulins. Eventually the paintings were recovered, and some of them, presented to Wellington by the restored King Ferdinand VII, can be seen at Stratford Say, or Apsley House in London. One object that was never recovered was the Crown of Spain. Some of the plunder was extremely negotiable, and not just the gold. Schaumann, a German officer in Wellington's army, who was one of the men who enjoyed the victory feast in the hotel, particularly noted the number of captured women, many of them dressed in specially tailored cavalry uniforms. Schaumann, who had a particular and discriminating eye for women during the campaign, noted how, in the plunder, the French women instinctively found one enemy soldier to whom, in exchange for protection, they offered their allegiance. Those who like the Marquesa, wanted to return to France with their belongings, were given safe conduct and an escort. The words, We are a walking brothel, were spoken to Wellington by a captured French officer. Wellington himself reckons that the British soldiers took one million pounds worth of gold coin, and they were third into the baggage park after the fleeing French and the citizens of Vittoria. While he, for the military chest, received only one hundred thousand silver dollars. Among the other trophies were King Joseph's silver chamber pot, still used, though for drinking purposes, by the cavalry regiment that captured it, and also Marshal Jourdain's baton, which Wellington sent to the Prince Regent. The Prince returned the compliment. You have sent me the staff of a French marshal, and I send you in return that of England except that no such English staff existed. One had to be designed. And thus Wellington became a field marshal. An extremely unhappy field marshal after his victory, he was furious with the men for plundering the baggage, describing them in a phrase for which he has been attacked ever since. The scum of the earth. Many of his soldiers doubtless were, but by no means all. And those people who cite the phrase as evidence that Wellington despised the men who fought for him, usually forget that he was fond of adding, But it is wonderful what fine fellows we have made of them. Wellington had cause to be angry. He was hoping to use the French treasure to pay for the campaign. 
But in defence of the scum, it is very hard to see how any soldier paid a shilling a day could resist the field of gold that waited for them to the east of Vittoria. Yet many did. Some regiments kept their order and marched straight through it, so I have no excuses to offer for Sharp and Harper. The Inquisition was banned by the Spanish Junta and reinstated by King Ferdinand in 1814. I have no evidence that the Inquisition was involved in the politics that accompanied the restoration of Ferdinand, but it seemed a fitting idea. The Spanish Inquisition was finally dissolved in 1834. The thought that a restored Ferdinand VII might make peace with France and expel the British is not fiction. It formed the basis of the Treaty of Valenciennes, signed by Ferdinand and Napoleon, and there was support for it among those Spaniards who wished to restore their empire and defeat the new liberals. In the end, the treaty was never fulfilled. Napoleon kept his side of the bargain by restoring Ferdinand and releasing all Spanish prisoners, but Ferdinand VII was prevented, by public opinion as much as anything else, from making the peace with France that would have expelled Wellington's army and allowed his own to reconquer the Spanish Empire abroad. The Battle of Vittoria was not the largest battle fought in the peninsula, but it had the most far-reaching consequences. At a time when the fortunes of Napoleon seemed to be rising after his huge defeat in Russia, the battle encouraged the northern allies to continue the fight, leading to the great northern victory at Leipzig in the following year. The battle also ejected the French from Spain, except for the garrisons of three fortresses. Eight thousand Frenchmen and five thousand of Wellington's men were casualties. The plundering of the baggage and the night of drink that followed the battle effectively stopped any pursuit by the British. And so the remnant of Joseph's army managed to reach France, struggling up the steep tracks of the Pyrenees north of Pamplona. Burgos Castle is still in ruins. It was mined for destruction, and the mines, as described in the novel, went off prematurely, though no one knows why. Vittoria is now a much enlarged industrial city, though the central hill, with the narrow streets circling about the cathedral, looks much today as it did in 1813. The battlefield is still recognisable, at least to the west of the town. The river follows the same course, the bridges are there, and the Arinet Hill provides a superb viewpoint. The area of Gamara Mayor, where the fighting was among the heaviest, the British lost 500 casualties in taking the village and trying to cross the bridge, is sadly much changed. One happy circumstance to note is that Vittoria, rare among cities in Spain, marks the contribution Wellington's army made to the liberation with a quite magnificent statue that shows Wellington with his men. It is a truly fantastic confection, appreciated by an army of pigeons, and also by the citizens of Victoria, who are fond of it in the same way that Londoners like the Albert Memorial. In most cities in Spain, where Wellington's men died for that country's freedom, you look in vain for any memorial that acknowledges the gratitude that Victoria so lavishly bestows. It was a great victory. Wellington, when he started the campaign, had turned at the border of Portugal, raised his hat, and prophetically said goodbye to a country. I will never see you again. Now, as a result of the Battle of Vittoria, he is threatening a different country. France itself. So, Sharp and Harper will march again. This concludes the reading of Sharp's Honour by Bernard Cornwell. This book was read by Frederick Davidson.